for whatever the customer needs, even when, especially when the items are rare. So true. Could you give us an example, Irving? We help millions of customers all over the world. Come on, just one example? Well, there was NASA. NASA? NASA. What's the big deal? We have for everyone, big and small. So what did NASA need? A unique Hasselblad lens for a space mission. I guess no one else had it, but we did. But we often have what others don't. Love it. What else can you tell us about this story? That is the story. Copy that, Irving. And thank you for sharing. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. Can I go back to work now? This is a real B&H customer story. Steph Mandis came to B&H to take her photography to the next level. She's an artist by choice, pizza maker by birth, and B&H customer for life. Am I missing anything here? Teacher, entrepreneur, product designer, and a photographer. And a restaurateur, I forgot that part. <laughs> Impressive. Steph, I gotta be honest, I don't know where to look first. Is that a microscope? Yeah, that's my uh, trinocular Axio Lab, and that's what I use to make bioart. Bioart? What's that? Bioart is where science and art meet. Uh, amazing. So what came first, the camera or the microscope? So first came the microscope, then the camera, and thankfully that's where B&H stepped in. When I first went to B&H trying to find a camera for my microscope, I thought it was a little oddball request, but turns out they've done this before and they knew exactly what I was looking for. What's great about working with people at B&H is that they use the gear that they're selling you. So what are you looking at now? Cheese, sauce, peppers, onions, olives, pizza toppings. Hmm, I'm sensing a theme here. Uh, yeah, my family started a pizza restaurant in 1960. Whoa, 60 years of pizza, what's the secret? We use cheddar cheese. Huh, okay. So what's next for you, Steph? I wanna take this tiny thing that I've been looking at and blow it up using projectors. I just have to figure out what equipment I need. I like where this is going. So B and H, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna talk again. Steph, we're always here when you need us. And be sure to save me a slice. For your next project, head to the experts at bnh.com. Oh yeah, I've definitely put him under the microscope. <laughs> Cat fur looks crazy. <laughs> This morning we're at Grindle Island and it's the most amazing forest and a perfect place to really try out our photographic skills. We've been looking at the dappled light and how to cope with that in the forest, but also zooming in and getting those amazing macro shots of the ferns and the growth of the ferns. You also have these trees here, the sicker spruce, the hemlock, which has this incredible patterns and allows you to be able to get almost abstract photography out of the rainforest. So we've been learning about how to shoot with this dappled light. A couple of different techniques we've been learning around. HDR, which allows you to be able to cope with the bright light as well as the dark light. We've also been looking at just the angle of the light. Where is the light coming from? And focusing on taking photographs into the shadows so that you don't get that big contrast, as well as trying to look for rays of sunshine to light up the forest. This is a real B&H customer story. Jack and Barbara, professional wildlife photographers and B&H customers for 30 years, live in remote Alaska. Hey, what's the population there? About 50 to 52 people and bears. We're definitely not New York anymore. It's just quiet here, it's beautiful. The wildlife photography out here is amazing. 
While they could order equipment from any number of sites, they don't. Anytime we need anything, B&H is our go-to. We can send an email. We have used the chat feature and, of course, the phone if our phones are working. If the phones are working. Hi, Jack. What can I help you with? I needed a tripod, and it had to be light. It had to be sturdy. So I talked with somebody at B&H. I think his name is Charles, and he pointed me toward a certain tripod and liked it so much that I bought a second one. Nice one, Charles. When it comes to getting gear, things were shipped quickly, packed well, made it through the harrowing journey, going from plane to smaller plane to somebody's hand thrown to somebody else, put in the back of a truck, and arrives unscathed. That's quite the schlep. It must be incredible when it gets there. Oh, it's, it's like Christmas. I mean, honestly, it's better than Christmas. Yeah, it's I, my birthday. B&H has everything that we need. I mean, when have we ever looked for something and it wasn't available? Well, there was bananas. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> bananas indeed. Wherever you live, B&H is ready to help. Chat, email, and if your phones are working, give us a call. On this eclipse, the sun is going to rise above the horizon, and it'll be like a big smile looking at you because it'll be a crescent sun. The whole thing about eclipse chasing links so many feel-good opportunities, friends, environment, location, and an eclipse itself. The moon is always casting a shadow out in the solar system, but periodically that shadow passes over the Earth if we happen to have them lined up in the right positions. And when that happens, we want to be underneath that shadow. When we're looking forward to see what's coming in eclipses, you spot one that's particularly interesting to you. And one beside and over Antarctica is the cream on top of the milk because it's such an exotic location. The total solar eclipse is such a beautiful thing because it brings everybody together. And for one minute, Everybody's gonna be looking up and enjoying just the same moments. And so I'm really excited to take some photos, but then also set the camera down and just enjoy it. That one moment when at the totality, the moon and the sun and the corona, I can't believe it. I can't believe what kind of magic we witnessed. And <laughs> Introducing the new Paybu credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your Paybu credit card. So you wanna save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The B&H Paybu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over six or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new Paybu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either Paybu Savings or Special Financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved Paybu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new Paybu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today. Okay.
been going on. Following the Lord. All right. Look, video's over. That's it. We're ready to rock. It should be exactly on time, 940. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I do. I do. I'm not hopping. Keep my mic going. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good morning, class. <laughs> How are we doing today? Great. Woo! All right. So thank you so much for coming, and welcome to Optic West. It is an amazing honor to be here. We've been planning this for many years. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were supposed to be in San Francisco on March 22nd and 23rd of 2020. And I remember it was around March 5th, sitting in my director's office, and we're like, what's going on? I don't think it's going to happen. So we, uh, we, we closed down V&H. We had that stupid pandemic happen, and we turned around and we did virtual events. So if I show of hands, who here was watching our virtual events, virtual optics? Okay. I bet you appreciated that probably in those, those dark days. It certainly was great to work on those presentations and those during those days because it kept us focused. So I'm really thrilled to say that uh, it's about two and a half years, almost three years later, and here we are in California. So let's just give a, a round of applause just to, the, to what, what's allowed us to be here, which is pretty amazing. And, you know, we shifted from San Francisco to Monterey, and that... I think it was a good idea. That was Franz Bonting that actually really suggested Monterey. He's a Santa Cruz guy, so he figured it would work out really well. And he also told me that this is hallowed ground, the Monterey Conference Center, that the, the first tech conference happened here, and it really broke open uh, so much technology that comes out of this region. So just a, a, a quick shout out. I want to give thanks to Carol and Lou, Who've been, who've been coming to B&H Photo for many years. I used to run the event space program in the store. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the videos that we produced out of the event space, but Carol and Lou were regulars at the event space, and you guys followed us out all the way over here. Did you take the Staten Island Ferry to get here? Was that a, so, so that's pretty amazing stuff. Um, okay, so uh, just want to, a couple of questions here. I, when I said Monterey, a lot of claps. How many people are from Monterey? And I'm going to say Carmel and Monterey will kind of combine it. How, how many people came here from San Francisco? All right, pretty good. How many people came from outside of California? How many people came from outside of North America? Okay, okay. In New York, we get, we get uh, New York Optic, we do get some uh, out-of-country people coming in. But we'll, we'll work on that. And uh, all right, so um, by the way, I'm David Brommer. Pleased to meet you all. <laughs> Say who I am. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you, how many people have been to B&H Photo in New York City? Ah, wow. That's a well-traveled crowd. Okay. All right. Uh, so for those of you that aren't so familiar from B&H, I'm going to play a, a short video for you guys, give you a little bit of the history of B&H. B&H is turning 50 years old next year. Pretty, pretty good. Uh, I'm happy to say that I just had on Halloween my 25-year anniversary, so I'm going to be turning 55 and have been at B&H half the time that they've been open. I just waited for them to start up before I joined the company, get the, get the momentum going a little bit. So here is our beautiful video about B&H. We have audio? Okay, hold on a second. Um, my first time working with this production company out here. So click in here, do we? Wait a minute. You guys give me a thumbs up on that. Okay. All right, so first practical glitch. Um, you guys got my confusing emails this morning? Okay. I really don't know how that happened. I, really, I truly don't. But uh, I got my first email from someone saying, that's going to Optic in June, not Optic West. So thanks for bearing with us. And, and <laughs> 
over. All right, we're back in line. Thank you, gents. Okay, so let's start this over. We're on four. Can I get a countdown? Three. Yeah. Let me cancel that. This is a brief history. Okay, one more time. Let's do the countdown. Six. Five. This is a brief history of B&H, okay. everyone's favorite photo and video store. The year was 1973. The Mets went to the World Series. The first cell phone call was made. And Bleamy and Herman opened a specialty photography shop at 17 Warren Street, New York City. They had a simple philosophy. Be honest, treat people right, and they will come back. Thanks, Irving. Also, free candy, and it worked. Over the next 20 years, we expanded and moved to West 17th Street, then 34th Street and 9th Avenue, and added more products. Lighting, binoculars, telescopes, audio, video, tripods, computers, printers, mobile, televisions, projectors, drones, and even more free candy. Now it's three stories and over 400,000 products and over 1,000 employees. We take millions of orders online and ship to 179 countries and counting. You can talk to us in person, on the phone, BNH, how can I help you? or online. Check out our checkout baskets. Also check out our checkout numbers. Also check out the flare on Marais' vest. And everyone's favorite part, our conveyor belt. The benefit of the conveyor belt is you don't have to worry about the product or schlep it around anymore until checkout. Nice. These are the owners. They still come to work every day. They're around here somewhere. Anyway, this is Jeanette. Oh, sorry, she's busy. This is our warehouse. This is Yakov and Levy fighting over lighting kits. b &H is not a chain. b &H is open every day, except Saturdays, of course. Now you know almost the whole story. We are b &H. So uh, Jeanette was at the check-in. When you see Jeanette, ask her if she's busy. <laughs> she, Jeanette is, a, is an amazing coworker. I, I work with the best people in the world. I really do. And uh, B&H is really a big family, as you get from that. So if B&H is a big family, you all are my second cousins. <laughs> but uh, say hi to Jeanette. She, uh, she organizes so much and keeps us going. So what are we doing here? What is this, what is this optic thing? So it was 20 team, and uh, I was aboard the Limblad Expedition's National Geographic Seabird, along with Ralph Lee Hopkins, Carolyn Delmonico, and Gabriel Biederman. Matter of fact, we got Ralph right there in the back. He's holding up his, he's got the blue shirt, he's got the hat on, and that's, that's Ralph, National Geographic's Director of Photography Program. And we're in the lounge, and we were having an amazing time shooting and, and doing this land and sea expedition in the Baja of California, in the Sea of Cortez. And we said, boy, you know what the world needs is a conference dedicated to the great outdoors and adventure, expedition photography. And it sort of morphed a little bit into fine art photography. We've really been growing it. But that's the seabird, and that's where we uh, conceived of this idea. And uh, what we said is that we're going to make a conference that celebrates the great outdoors. It inspires photographers to travel and implores conversation and ecology and the importance of technology and photography. So between Limblad Expeditions and B&H Photo, we got that all covered. We got the technology, we have the knowledge, we've got Limblad Expedition brings us to the amazing places. So quick show of hands, who here has been on a Limblad Expedition trip? All right, we gotta work on that. So Ralph is on the table, and it is actually life-changing to be on a Limblad Expeditions trip. Uh, I'm still that Galapagos, who, who's been to the Galapagos here? I know I'm asking a lot of questions. Did the Galapagos change you? Like, right, it, when you come back from there, you're just swimming in, in thoughts, and it's pretty amazing. So we came up with OPTIC, OPTIC being the Outdoor Photography Travel Imaging Conference. And we did our first one in 2015. And now it's 2022, and we've slipped at an OPTIC All-Stars in between. We've expanded to OPTIC West. Who knows if we'll do an OPTIC Central? But uh, it, it's been a great ride. And this was a, a shot from our, our first OPTIC and that's Art Wolf in 2015 at the New Yorker Hotel around the corner from B&H Photo. And we always tried to push things. Like the time that we flew a brand new DJI inspired drone indoors. Now this was rough. And let me tell you, that, that drone kind of got a mind of its own and flew around a little bit. But uh, that's kind of how we roll. You'll see in the back, uh, that is uh, Ralph Lee Hopkins without a hat on. I think he left it up hotel room, you're in the back, and 
and there's Art Wolf. Uh, and then we decided that, uh, you know what, a Limblad expedition takes place on ships, so we would emulate that in New York Harbor, and how cool is that? In New York City, we have a Colossus. We've got the Statue of Liberty. So when we brought Optic West out here, we figured you didn't have a statue, but you guys did have whales. So tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., we're going on a whale watching mini expedition. Now, I know a lot of you folks wanted to jump on that trip, and it's going to be loaded with gear from Canon, Nikon, Sony, and Sigma. And we're going to have Flip Nicklin, who's actually right there in the back next to teaching us how to, how to do the, uh, the whale photography. We're also going to have Scott Kelby aboard a boat. Um, I'm going to quote Jaws. We're going to need a bigger boat. So we got two boats. So we got plenty of boats for everybody. It's going to be amazing. You go to the B&H booth and spend 50 bucks on anything you want. It's really easy to do because you've all gotten the specials book. And the specials book has discounts and really cool stuff on everything. And give you a pro tip, if you don't need anything right now, which I can't imagine, you can always get a $50 gift card and redeem that whenever you want. So we ask you all to, to join us in the whale mini expedition tomorrow. Do we have any land lovers here? OK, for land lovers, we have a, a sunrise photo walk going on with Mark Silver. And uh, that's going to meet just in front of where the, uh, the old fisherman's wharf is. That'll be meeting at the uh, Pacific House. You'll see all the photographers. So we got you covered, land and sea. Uh, you don't have to do the $50 gift card for the photo walk. That's a little bit more impromptu. But we do ask the $50 uh, purchase be made or a ticket for the, for the boat ride. That's just to make sure that you take the ticket to actually come. <laughs> All right, so the coolest part about these, all these optics was our keynote speakers, and it was really it was a, a great honor to be able to bring people like Art Wolf, uh, Paul Capenegro, lead by his son, John Paul Capenegro, Michael Kenna, uh, Franz Lanting, who's our, our keynote speaker, again, second time, Scott Kelby, second time. You guys all know Scott Kelby, right? He's that Photoshop guy. <laughs> He's a pretty Lightroom guy. Uh, Brooks Jensen, who's a big influence of mine, uh, he's the editor magazine, uh, and, uh, and of course, we brought him out to, brought him out to, uh, to New York, uh, uh, photographer, and one of the first, and my audio kicking out, yeah. Yeah. okay, so I'm going to talk about There's about 80 different photographers that we speak at the B and A Limbla. Okay. All right. I think we're working now. Okay, so that's kind of the keynote speakers and our speakers, and uh, we went off into the sunset, and here we are now in beautiful Monterey. Uh, now, this couldn't be done without the help of uh, some some staff. So I want to play a video. And this video is going to introduce you to the uh, amazing staff of B&H. And when you see Irving Fisher, he's the guy that hired me 25 years ago. He's an amazing guy. All right. This is a story about a magical place where everything's amazing, especially the people. We can tell you everything there is to know about over 400,000 different pieces of gear. Tell them, Lenny. And we have a 17 millimeter, 24 millimeter, 45 millimeter. He does this all day. We'll help you find the right thing, which is often not the most expensive. The A9 is great, but I think the 6500 is better for what you need. That's pretty rare. And just like you, we love to explore and share our passion because we're creators as well. Israel and Jake like to make videos for the web. Oh, I love it when he does this. Oh, by the way, if you can't meet us in person, you can always chat with us online. Think of us as collaborators, production partners, problem solvers. This is Greg. He's made five gold records. You can play your voice high. And here's Jay, the king of the candidates. Wait, 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 I'm not ready, Jay. Sometimes we geek out and help each other, but mostly we're here to help you. Like Lenny, who's still going, because there's a lot to say when you're making some pretty important decisions. So now you've met 16 of over 1,000 employees. 16 reasons our customers like to do business with people, not algorithms. We are B&H. All right, let's hear it for our staff. Uh, thank you so much, my coworkers, for putting this together. 
I've saved a very important mascot for last. This is Eisenhower. He's been at Optics since 2017. See everybody, Ike? They're all waiting for you. So this is little Eisenhower. He, he's, he's my emotional support animal and keeps me going. So I wanna, I wanna thank Ike for coming out to all these shows. We did the 2017 one. We did a piece on the reintroduction of wolves in Yosemite. And he was a, he was a little puppy and the wolves were howling and it was amazing. He was like, wait a minute, is this what I'm supposed to do? But this is a non-howling chihuahua. So what, thanks Ike, thanks for being here. And uh, what I, also this is Eisenhower's mother, Barbara. <laughs> Barbara Brommer, my wife. We met at B&H Photo at station number seven in the store uh, 23 years ago, 24 years ago? 24 years ago. So we have a saying at B&H, you go to B&H, cameras, your video cameras, your lighting, your computers, your drones, and your wife or husband can be found. So we're not the only marriage story that's come out of B&H as well. Okay, so we talked about the history of B&H, we talked about the staff, we talked about the birth of Optic, we talked about the amazing partnership with Limblad, but what really brings this all together is our sponsors. So right on the other side of that wall, we've got about 28 sponsors that have come all the way out here to show you the latest and the greatest equipment. So let's make some noise for our sponsors, everybody. Let's bring it up so they can really hear it, okay? All right. So I'm gonna play a quick game here. Who, who shoots with Sony? Let's have some applause for Sony. Okay. They've got the new say, A7 Mark V out there for you guys to play with. Who shoots with Nikon here? Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. All right, Canon? Okay, I, I, I think Canon's got it. On the, uh, now we've also got Fuji, we've got Leica here, we've got a, a, a number, we've got all the big, great camera. Who's a Leica shooter here? All right, pretty good, pretty good. Pretty good, awesome. Okay, you know, you could be polycamerous. You could shoot with Nikon, Canon, Sony, and Leica. You know, it's, it's, there is no perfect camera. There's only everything together. Okay, so, uh, so our sponsors, thank you so much. Um, you guys may know me from the event space, and I did a popular program called, uh, it was called Better Photographic, Better Photographic, wait, it was called Better, what was it called? It was called Beyond the Rule of Thirds, Better Photographic Composition. And uh, it was a really popular program, and on YouTube, it has over a million views, which is pretty insane. So before you guys learn all the incredible things from our speakers, I just wanna go over a couple of quick things with you, some basics. So we're gonna cover the rule of thirds, we're gonna cover positive and negative space, we're gonna cover gesture, light and shadow, vanishing points, and we're gonna talk about color. So the rule of thirds, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but let's just rehash it. The rule of thirds is like tic-tac-toe for photographs. Your subject should be at the intersection of the horizontal and vertical lines. Very simple. So put your subjects in that spot. Don't put your subject smack dab in the middle of the photo. That doesn't make for a good composition. Giotto from the 14th century would say, no. <laughs> Another thing I'd like to ask everybody is that don't cut your horizons in half. Make sure your horizons happen in the top third or the lower third. This is about Paris and a view of Montmartre looking up into Montmartre. So another big one, and this was taught to me by George Bates, my high school art teacher, is positive and negative space. The negative space in this picture is the sky, and of course the, uh, the tombs and the tombstones are the positive space. So creating an intersection of negative and positive space creates a dance, and your eyes, when you look at the photograph, will kind of bounce around a little bit. Anytime your eye looks at a photograph and it stops at one point and it doesn't look anymore, we're not doing a good job. Your eye should dance around the photograph and inspect it. That's a, a shot from a, a square format uh, Hazelblad of Cimitero Munamali in Milan. Now positive and negative space comes in different ways. It's not always just about sky. In this uh, photograph from, uh, from Mexico, the negative space envelops the subjects in the positive space. And it's kind of nice, I like that little tip in the top that kind of brings you in and spins you around the photograph. So that's your positive and negative space, super important. Always try to incorporate that in your pictures. And this is a tough one, this is getting gesture. This is the Porchetta Maestro from Camuccia in Italy. His name is Stefano Camori, and if you ever visit Tuscany, you gotta go to Cortona and go to Camuccia on a Thursday morning and get the Porchetta. Of course, if you're keeping kosher, stay away from that Porchetta. But otherwise, it's pretty amazing stuff. He puts on a show while he cuts the porchetta from everyone. That's his daughter and his wife, and he always does a show about 
he's going to kill his wife. <laughs> um, if you are in desperate need for gesture, photograph drag queens. <laughs> this, was, this was during a gay pride parade, and uh, gesture really forms itself in hand movements, that positive and negative space, and it really imbues life into the photograph. Now, what is the photograph? Photographs are light and shadow. Try to find the light and shadow. Try to source that out where you see bright highlights, dark shadows, and everything in between. And that's the zone system. Um, fog is pretty amazing. And we were out uh, Big Sur this, uh, yesterday morning, and you guys got a lot of fog here. <laughs> it's funny. Although I was told that the fog is actually called a marine layer, and in San Francisco, the fog is called coral. You guys are very complicated here. In New York, we just say it's freaking foggy. <laughs> the last point is the vanishing point. The vanishing point happens way in the back of your photograph, and that draws the eye out to the horizon. So always try to be conscious of the vanishing point. This is when the, uh, the Giants were in the Super Bowl in New York City, and this is 6th Avenue. Uh, they really changed the city for that big, uh, that, big, uh, that big game. That was versus the Seahawks, I believe. And I, I think the Seahawks won. I'm not too sure. I'm not, I'm not a jock. I'm, a, I'm an artist. OK, uh, this is uh, Dog Green Sector uh, at Omaha Beach in Normandy. And you can see where the cliffs meet the final horizon in the background. That's the vanishing point. Shot with an 8x10 camera about five days around June 11, five days after the actual Normandy landing at around 5.45 AM in the morning. Um, I love photography. Don't you guys love photography? I mean, standing there where, this, where the, the Normandy invasion happened with a camera documenting it, I mean, that's what it's all about. But you may say, that's some good black and white work, David. OK, thank you very much. What about color? Well, color. When color explodes in front of you, get your camera out and take pictures of it. Explore color. Always look for very vibrant color. Always be attracted and point your camera towards where the color is. Or point your drone straight down. And you see this. Um, I was thrilled when I saw this through the, through the little uh, iPhone that was capturing what, the, what my Mavic Mini was showing. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but you, there's a heart in there, right? You see that heart? That's because we love all you guys. All right. Now, there is one last lesson that I didn't mention before. And uh, this is a, a pretty big one. And it's how to save the tax. Now, what's your tax here in California? OK, so let's do a little bit of math here. If you spend, if you buy, let's say, what I call the holy troika of lenses, maybe a 10 to 20, a 24 to 70, a 70 to 200, 2.8, and a full frame body, you're going to be spending around eight to $10,000. Do you want to give $900 to the state no, you want to save the tax. And we've got something really incredible at B&H Photo, and it's called the PayBoo card. And the PayBoo card actually calculates what the tax is and then activates it as a discount afterwards. You can actually use the PayBoo card two ways. You can do it where you can do a, a delayed payment, or you can just save the tax. How many people here are PayBoo or using PayBoo? OK, good, a lot of people. See that, Jeffrey? That's pretty, pretty good. We're, we're doing good with that. Um, on a personal note, and I'll tell you just a funny story about Peibu. Uh, you see Gabe Biederman, um, we got into watches. And we were buying these expensive watches. And we just had money to burn. We got tired of buying cameras, so we bought watches. And it was killing me to pay 8.25% tax when you're buying an expensive watch. And I lamented, and I told the Torno Buchler dealer, I was like, you guys need to hook up with Peibu. We had to send our watches all the way to Oregon and New Hampshire to, to not to avoid paying the tax. Uh, that's really a bummer. Get a Peibu card. And if you sign up today, if you're a new customer, we'll give you a $50 gift card as well into the, the pay booth. So you'll get to save the tax, and you'll, you'll do it backwards. And if you really want to think about it, this is a card that basically has a 9.25% uh, payback to you, which is pretty amazing. So let's hear it for pay booth, guys. Come on. <laughs> all right. So um, Optic is all about our keynote speakers and our speakers. And we have a very special speaker of the first day of Optic. West, his name is Franz Lanting. And Franz, I don't know where you are. You're going to come out to the stage. Where are you, Franz? Up, oh, he's here. OK. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Franz Lanting, who's going to present to you guys his Bay of Life series. And uh, Franz, welcome to Optic West. Hey, Franz, it's a pretty good idea to come out here. Backwards. Backwards. 
know it. Thank you, David. Yes, thank you, thank All right. you. Well, once again, guy, come on, Franz Lanten. Good morning. I'm Franz Lanting, and it's my pleasure to lead off the Optic West Conference and to welcome all of you to Monterey Bay, which is a very special place because of the people, because of its nature, and also because of its connections to photography. And that's what I'm going to talk about with you. But before we do that, I'd like to get a better sense of who's sitting here in front of me. And also, I would like to welcome everyone else who's tuning in from the rest of the world. But I'm curious, how many of you are actually living and working here but in Monterey Bay? That's a good percentage. How many of you are from other parts of California? How many of you have come from other states of the country? Anyone from outside the United States? A handful. Well, for those of you, I have a surprise because you know, we're going to make a free copy of our new book available to the person who's traveled the farthest to get here. <laughs> so just kind of show your qualifications. After the show, we have a table where we sell these books and then talk with Talia and she will determine who's come the farthest and you can walk away with a copy of this book. We have a big version of the book as well for our partners and our sponsors, but you'd have to have come from Mars or thereabouts to <laughs> walk away with one of those. No, seriously, uh, if you want to make a contribution to our project, you can walk away with one of these books as well. Monterey Bay. This is a really finicky clicker. Something may go wrong in the course of the show. Um, I've lived here for more than 40 years, and I consider it a real privilege. This is what makes Monterey Bay so special. Whales lunch feeding with gulls hovering overhead, fish spilling out of the mouths of the whales, and sea lions to try and grab some fish on the go. Everything is there, and this is all happening within sight of the shoreline. Not many places in the world where you can see this. Flip Nicklin may experience it in his front yard in Alaska, but not many places where you can experience this. And when you come out with us tomorrow morning, you may have a chance to see this for yourself. We're gonna learn a lot about f-stops and shutter speeds and ISO settings in the course of this conference, but I'm going to focus my talk on something else. These f-stops are important, no doubt. But I'm going to show you in the course of my talk how you can connect your work with the rest of the world. I'm going to talk with you about how I use photography to establish a sense of place, apply a sense of purpose, and how you can make your photography a step towards becoming part of a community. I never thought, when I was growing up, spending my student days in this gritty, working-class neighborhood in Rotterdam, that I would be so lucky to stand here today, that I would be so lucky to experience these whales lunch feeding. It was a different world. I've always had a passion for nature. And I would escape from these dense neighborhoods in the city of Rotterdam to the beaches along the North Sea, and that's where I began to practice photography, way back when. I'm self-taught as a photographer. I made all my own mistakes, and believe me, there have been quite a few. And I started playing with black and white photography, developing film, doing prints. I like this really grainy aspect of this landscape. And that is where I had my first encounters with wildlife. Now, I had no clue how you would practice wildlife photography back then. There were no books, there were no, was no internet, so everything was trial and error. Dead gulls were much easier to get close to. <laughs> and this image was my tribute, my way of expressing empathy with a creature that had passed on. 
a big step from that dead gull on that beach in the Netherlands to this. I like to get eye to eye with the animals that I photograph, both physically and mentally. I want to show their point of view, and I want to give viewers a sense of the world that they're part of. In this case, it's a wandering albatross with wingspan of up to 11 feet, and he is trying to impress a female who's saying, big deal, I got these same wings. <laughs> I learned a lot about the craft of visual storytelling from the lady behind this massive desk. Her name is Mary Smith. She was a legendary photo editor at National Geographic, and that visitor chair was the place where she received all the greats of our time, Jacques Cousteau, Louis Leakey, Jane Goodall, and so on. And I ended up in that same visitor chair, more than a little bit intimidated, as you can imagine. Mary taught me so much, and along with her other colleagues at the Geographic, I learned how to start using photography for visual storytelling. And that led to a whole string of stories in the magazine, lots of covers, and you probably have seen quite a few of these over the years. A heroic lifestyle, it's a dream job, right? To go off for months at a time, to spend time with emperor penguins on sea ice, but let me tell you, it's cold. <laughs> and it's tough. And you'd better come back with the results because the director of photography at National Geographic was fond of saying things like, we publish pictures, not excuses. <laughs> and there was a sign on his door that said, please wipe your knees before entering. <laughs> now, that was a joke. But when you first arrived there for your first appointment, it didn't seem so humorous. Months at a time in the field, how do you keep track of what you're doing? I developed a Polaroid back extension of one of my cameras, and then periodically I interrupted what I was doing to shoot a Polaroid, and I would laboriously write down the settings on the back of that piece of Polaroid. Meanwhile, the, ship, the film would be shipped off, and it would be weeks before I would hear anything back. Now, for those of you who grew up with digital photography, this seems awfully primitive, right? But those were the tools of the day. Things changed for me after I met Christine Ekstrom at National Geographic, where she'd been a staff writer in the books division for a number of years. After we became a team in life and work, things changed. Chris is sitting here in the front row, and um, normally you know, we present together on stage, but today it's just me because this is a photography occasion. But if you want to hear us speak together, consider coming to Stanford next Wednesday or join us next Saturday in Santa Cruz where we're doing a big program. Just go to our Instagram or our website and you'll find more details. But back to what changed. Chris started off as a writer, I started off as a photographer, but then we started teaching each other. I learned more about writing, I taught her visual skills, she became a videographer, and these days, of course, we finish each other's sentences, in life as well as in work, because we do the writing together. It's a really unusual process. We help each other over the bumps, in all respects. And in the course of that teamwork, we began to do things differently. We began to do things more independently. We started producing books, which gave us a chance to develop longer narratives with a more personal point of view than stories that were assigned by National Geographic magazine. I've seen a lot of change in the natural world since those early days on that beach in the Netherlands. I captured this image of bulls standing by a waterhole in Botswana with an October moon rising as a tribute to the timeless quality of elephants in Africa. Small detail, I stood up to this far in muddy water with elephants behind me and off to the sides. 
because I was after that perfect reflection. This is perfection beyond belief. But these days, the world of elephants is shrinking. No more freedom to roam. Elephants need to roam between dry season areas, wet season areas, but there's all these obstacles in the way. People, their infrastructure. When this safari lodge in Zambia decided to add an extension to their buildings, they cut off the approach route for elephants to reach a favorite mango tree in the courtyard. The elephant said, no problem, we'll just walk through the lobby <laughs> without a reservation. So it may seem funny, but it is actually quite poignant. And of course, this is happening not just to elephants in Africa. This is happening to wildlife habitat around the world. In Borneo, where Chris and I worked, when I was making this image, we could hear the bulldozers in the background. We all love to connect with nature. I think it's something really deep inside us. Professor E.O. Wilson wrote a whole book about it called Biophilia. You know, we want to connect with the beauty, the harmony, and the completeness of nature on a very visceral level. And I think that is what drives many nature photographers to pursue that, to capture that, and then to share it. And that's what I've done for many years as well. Emperor penguin chicks on sea ice off Antarctica. Hard to think of anything more adorable, but it isn't like that anymore. The last time we went back to Antarctica, the ice is giving way to mud, and the snow is giving way to rain. These are not emperors, these are chinstrap penguins, but the changes still amount to the same catastrophe in the making. Just two weeks ago, the US Fish and Wildlife Service finally declared emperor penguins an endangered species, and we actually contributed to the information that was presented to the US Fish and Wildlife Service in my photographs. So we hope it's a good thing, but now they're qualified to be recognized as part of new policies that the US has to follow when it comes to climate change. I'll come back to climate change later on. But I'd like to switch to Monterey Bay, because that is what we're here for. At least I hope you do. So I forgot to ask, how many of you are happy to be here today? OK. Can I see a show of hands? Thank you. Monterey Bay, very special place. Chris and I have been coming back from assignments abroad year after year, and then we have a chance to compare what we have here with what we experienced elsewhere. Now, this is not a pristine ecosystem like the Okavango Delta is. A lot of people live here, but you can see in this image that shoreline that ends up at the Monterey Peninsula. Are we lose? The sound is back. You can see where we are. It's that peninsula on the north and then the coastline disappears in the upper right, and that's where Big Sur begins. But you see, there's a lot of human activity. There's a lot of agriculture, urban development, and so on. But at the same time, it is a grandiose place where land and sea connect in a way that we know no equivalent of elsewhere on the planet. And we've talked with a lot of experts, and nobody's been able to point to another place where land and sea meet in quite the same way. This is the Big Sur coast, by the way, on a morning when all the ingredients came together for an atmospheric photograph like this. The density of marine wildlife in Monterey Bay is unparalleled. This is extraordinary. This is a beach with sea lions and elephant seals at the northern tip of Monterey Bay at a place called Año Nuevo. You'd have to go to the edge of Antarctica, to a place like South Georgia Island to find anything equivalent. How many of you have been to South Georgia? Lucky few. So you know what I'm talking about. The density is unparalleled. 
the number of species of seals and sea lions and whales, and the sheer numbers. And they congregate here because of the same reason they congregate at South George Island, because the water is so cold and it is so nutrient rich. But onshore, it is just as intricate. This is an aerial view on the northern end of Monterey Bay, and you can see all these valleys and meadows and woodlands. There are all these ecological niches that support rare and endangered species. We have coastal streams that start in the hills and they're vital arteries that connect land and sea. And they support migratory fish like coho salmon, the southernmost salmon in the world spawn here in Monterey Bay, along with their close relatives, the steelheads. I made this image using a split, cam a split view camera, an underwater camera adapted for showing things both underwater and above water. And I use a specialized macro wide angle lens to make this image of a very large salamander. But using that lens made it look even bigger. This is a unique species known as the Santa Cruz giant black salamander. Occurs only in a few spots. We started this project about Monterey Bay applying all these techniques that I had learned from working abroad and it was a real pleasure, but it was also a special challenge to reveal these creatures that exist here. I applied camera traps. One of them was adapted for capturing infrared black and white. I set it up at a trail where I knew animals would come and go. Nice scenic background, and one day, this was captured. A young bobcat mother with a kitten strolling along in midday, dappled sunlight and the big cats too, the mountain lions. I could show you a whole gallery with the pigs, the deer, the birds, and so on. This is where we are, Monterey Bay. Now, different people will define it different ways, but the simplest way for us to recognize Monterey Bay is not just as a place name on the map offshore, we draw a circle around it, a 50-mile circle, with Moss Landing at the center, and then you see it touches Big Sur in the north, Half Moon Bay, sorry, Big Sur in the south, Half Moon Bay in the north. We go all the way inland to the Diablo Range and offshore, we include that amazing phenomenon known as the Marine Canyon of Monterey Bay. Two and a half miles deep. It's deeper than the Grand Canyon. And you don't have to go very far offshore to go straight down and a long way down before you hit the seafloor. And that is one of the reasons why this place is so special. But look at all these mountain ranges running parallel to the coast. I could talk about this map for quite a while, but we have to move on. But here you see the lay of the land. Let me tell you about the seasons. David talked about the fog. I'll explain the fog in a bit. Our seasonality is different here. It really confuses people who arrive from elsewhere. There's no weather, people say. The weather is always the same. And other people say, no, we have four seasons every single day. <laughs> you always layer, no matter where you go. Our spring comes with poppies blooming but they get blown apart by the spring wind. That spring wind is so strong that it blows grooves. It sculpts the, vegetation, the vegetation along our coastline, as you can see here. And it is that wind that is the engine that drives the whole system. It's the wind that brings the whales. That's why we chose that as the subtitle for our book. When that wind begins to blow, it stimulates cold water to rise up from the deep. It blows away the surface layers. Upwellings begin, full of nutrient-rich water, and when they're exposed to sunlight, the food chain begins. Plankton, explosion, and that fuels everything from krill to blue whales. 
and is also responsible for the fog. When that cold water ends up at the surface of the ocean where it touches the shoreline, blankets of fog begin to form. And when that fog moves inland because it gets really hot in the interior in the Salinas Valley, you get this, blankets of fog. It's like a horizontal, slow-moving rain. And it moisturizes everything from the redwoods to the agricultural fields to our cities to the skin of our women. Monterey Bay attracts migrants from all over the world. Hundreds of thousands of migratory seabirds arrive here every summer from New Zealand. They're called sooty shearwaters. They fly from New Zealand to Japan to Alaska and they arrive here to fatten up before they fly back to New Zealand again. Sea turtles swim to Monterey Bay from Indonesia to eat jellyfish here during the summer. Monarch butterflies flutter in from all over the American West because the winters are benign. It doesn't freeze so much. But unfortunately, because of habitat loss and pesticide use farther inland, their population has plummeted by 95% in the last 30 years. They're now officially an endangered species. I never thought we'd see that in our time. I love doing this. I love being in the moment, intersecting myself with birds on the move, a flock of sanderlings on their way from the Arctic to Patagonia, here today, gone tomorrow. But being in the moment, even though it's exciting and it is what wildlife photography's appeal is, it's just one dimension of practicing photography here in Monterey Bay. I wanna talk with you about influences. Who has influenced me? This, for starters. How many of you are familiar with this book? Not Man Apart. Only a handful. So I'm glad I included it in the show because this was a landmark photo book about the California coastline. Photos of the Big Sur Coast. Poetry by Robinson Jeffers. But look who's on the title page. Ansel Adams. Wynne Bullock, Elliot Porter, Edward Weston, Philip Hyde, Bill Garnett, and so on. <coughs> a who's who in early environmental photography, all pulled together by David Brower. Who remembers David Brower? Only a handful. David was a man with a passion for nature and he had a vision about what he wanted to achieve. And he came up with the idea to use photography in the service of conservation. And he simply put, came up with the concept of coffee table books celebrating nature for environmental campaigns. That seems commonplace now, but it was a brilliant innovation when David started doing that and Not Man Apart was one of the first books. So I welcome you to look up David Brower and the books he's published. It influenced me greatly when I first saw this book. And that gave me the idea that maybe one day I could start doing similar things. Ansel Adams, one of the greats who lived in Workia. He lived south of Point Lobos for many years. This is one of his images of the Point Lobos coast. Wynne Bullock, not quite as well known as Ansel Adams, but they were peers. <coughs> Wynn, among many things, was known for portraying the grandeur of the coast and the redwoods and then posing models, young and old. One of Wynn's images, one that I'm not showing here, was responsible for influencing me to make this image of retreating tides on a coastal reef, mixing the early light of pre before dawn with the first warm light, and then you get this lovely mixing blue to purple to yellow and orange. Thank you, Wynne. My tribute to our redwood forest. What do you think's going on here? Cross lighting. 
I could not have made this image if I hadn't known about this painting. Albert Bierstadt is a celebrated landscape painter from the 19th century. And from him, I learned about the significance of cross lighting. It creates depth. Look back at this one. I had to use six assistants hiding behind the trees with lights to create a similar effect. <laughs> Foreground, middle ground, background. Thank you, Albert. Opposite effect, not creating depth, flattening things out using a longer lens. Everything is in the same plane. This is not about depth, this is about light and color. Thank you, Georges Seurat. Pointillist. Read up on what Seurat and his colleagues found out about the use of these kind of pointillist effects to represent light and color. Painters have been way ahead of us photographers with their insights in nature. I created this abstraction of a piece of local geology with this in mind. Starry night. Thank you, Vincent. To the north of Monterey Bay, there's a famous surf break. We have lots of good waves here in Monterey Bay. We have lots of surfers too. But this one is very special, Mavericks at Half Moon Bay. Only the bravest of surfers dare to ride it. Most photographers stay on the other side, but I wanted to get this view. I wanted to capture the luminosity of the wave. The skipper of that raft was not that happy with that decision. <laughs> because it's kind of shallow, there's lots of rocks. He says, how long do you want to stay here? I said, well, anyway, it did work out. <laughs> High shutter speed, because I wanted to render motion the way Hokusai had done, the most famous wave in art history. When the tide goes out, all these wonders become revealed at the tide line around Monterey Bay. Tide pool in Point Lobos. I'm not gonna talk to you about the limpets and everything else in there, but what I heard in my head was John Steinbeck. It is advisable to look from the tide pool to the stars and then back to the tide pool again. It is John's way of making the connections between the universe and what exists at your feet. Steinbeck was influenced by the man he's paying tribute here. Knowing Ed Ricketts was instant. After the first moment I knew him, I knew him better than I knew anyone. Those two struck up a friendship that became really significant. Ed Ricketts comes through in the pages of Steinbeck's writing. Ed Ricketts was a visionary. An ecologist before his time, a marine biologist who had a lab on Cannery Row. That lab is still there. It's this old wooden building. If any of you go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium while you're here, which I strongly recommend you try and do, you'll pass by this building. It's still there. The doors are closed. The lab's still there the way Ed left it. Without Ed Ricketts, I'm not sure there would be a Monterey Bay Aquarium today because it was the marine biologist who clustered together and gathered with the Packard family. He came up with this vision for a new aquarium that would be based on the riches of Monterey Bay. Thank you, Ed. I'm talking about collaborative creativity here today. Each of us starts off alone but if you start thinking of the connections you can make with other artists and with activists and with scientists, you can do way more than you can do if you're just looking at the shutter speed and the apertures on your camera. When Brett Weston made this photograph, another one that influenced me deeply, there were very few photographers here. He was a pioneer in the way he saw the way he celebrated the Big Sur coast at Garapada Beach. And I've stood there myself to commune with nature. This grandiose way 
of land connecting with ocean. And you can feel like a hero there when you're by yourself on an early morning. But these days, photography is all about sharing the experience. Thanks to digital photography, we can capture and share images instantly. And it's the reason you all are here. Because you're not just soloists, you have become members of a community. I love teaching photography. I love passing on life lessons and lessons I've learned from holding cameras in my hands for decades. And I love inspiring people to grow and making them do things that they've never thought of doing before, whether it is to think of other combinations of settings or artistic concepts. So we teach workshops here periodically around the Monterey Peninsula. And at the end of this conference on Tuesday, we're doing a one day intensive session. And I welcome any of you, well, not all of you, <laughs> but come to the table outside the auditorium if you're interested to know more. One day experience. And you can see there's a lot of happy people. I'm gonna share a couple of images from the most recent session. Peter Joseph did this in the same beach where Brett Weston stood with a camera that can do so much more. And here you see the secret settings. Try to keep that ISO low and extend the shutter speed. And Peter is actually in the audience. I didn't even know that. Peter, where are you? There you are. Great image, man. <laughs> Meng Ying, same place, totally different composition. Used color instead of black and white conversion. Settings are good. ISO 4000, she forgot to reset that. Uh, the image would have been a little bit more detailed if she'd brought it down to, to 100. Ravi said, ocean, who needs ocean? I like the plants. Jay Mizell once said, if you think things look good in front of you, look over your shoulder, look behind you. Wisdom. Intricate plant life, great setting, F29, extended depth of field, everything was done right. And then I noticed in that same direction, this guy, he was a volunteer for state parks, eradicating exotic plants, the ice plant that looks good in spring, but it really smothers all of our native plants. So we need volunteers like David to do that. There's always a new point of view. You can be really intimidated by all the tripod holes that Ansel Adams and Wynne and Edward and Brett left here along the coast. And I'm not even talking about others, all of you. There's always a new point of view. Every time I take people out, it is amazing what Julie did. I had not seen that before. Thank you, Julie. In our Bay of Life project, we're embracing the work of other photographers because it makes the project more complete. It expands the range. And by the way, I'm from Holland, so I'm a little bit leery to go underwater too much. <laughs> Patrick Webster is a master at lighting, and here he captured the resurgence of a kelp forest. Chase Decker is a specialist in capturing marine mammals in motion. This is not easy. You could go out a hundred times and not see this happen, let alone that you're there with the right settings to do this when the dolphins surface. So thank you, Chase, amazing image. And these two previous images are included in our book, by the way. I don't know the settings here, but I think it's about a thousand. And tomorrow when we go out on this whale watching trip, how many of you are gonna join? Quite a few. The rest of you are landlubbers or deep sleepers. Okay. By the way, it's going to be friggin' cold. <laughs> Bring all the layers you can and then some. And keep that shutter speed fast. When you go farther down, life becomes surreal. Scientists from Ambari, the research institute affiliated with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, have pioneered technology of robotic submersibles that go way, way down. And they see things like this vampire squid, which is neither a vampire nor a squid, but that's one of these deeper stories. And then at the bottom, 
at the bottom of Monterey Bay, things like this. A dead whale had sunk to the seafloor, and then it became a banquet, a feast that's been going on for years, attracting deep sea octopi and weird fish and bone-eating worms. Amazing. Yet another one of these fantastic stories. I could talk with you for hours about Monterey Bay. You get the idea? But we need to move on from the natural history to the environmental history. People have lived here for more than 10,000 years. 10,000 years. They were tending the bay. The biodiversity that we praise today around Monterey Bay was a mosaic of foodscapes for people who made their living off the land and the sea. And they left their imprints in places like this, the secluded cave deep in the Big Sur wilderness, painted handprints that were solidifying initiation ceremonies about which we really do not know much because their culture was completely disrupted after Spanish colonizers arrived in the 1770s forced indigenous people to cluster around the missions. They died from disease. It was a horrible period. And a culture that had coexisted with nature here came to an end in a matter of two generations. But it's not the end of the story. Native Americans are refining their way back into Monterey Bay, are reestablishing themselves and putting new footprints on the landscape. A year ago, Chris and I were honored to be invited by the Yamamutsun people to document a ceremony that had not been performed in 250 years. Every year around this time, when the first rains come and the streams begin to rush towards the ocean again, the salmon start gathering offshore. They want to swim upstream. It's their nature. And onshore, people like the Amamutsun would gather to sing them upstream, to welcome them back. Had not been done in more than two centuries. But because a dam had been removed on a coastal creek and new habitat was restored, the Amamutsun were invited to sing the salmon. Linda Yamani, who lives not far from here, has revived the language of her ancestors, which very few people knew how to speak anymore. She's from the Rumson tribe, and she's also single-handedly revived the fine art of basket weaving. She literally had to go buy small pictures, JPEGs, from museums in Russia because there's only a handful of these original baskets left. She took us to her favorite spot where the plants grow that make the finest baskets. Talk about a sense of place. Things changed when white people arrived here. A period of plunder began. For a couple of decades, the main commerce along this part of the coast consisted of slaughtering marine mammals, whales and seals and everything else. Well-heeled citizens from Monterey are witnessing the flensing of a humpback whale. In two generations, all these animals disappeared. Two generations. Same thing happened with the sardines. The sardines that gave rise to Cannery Row and all these enterprises. Ed Ricketts was warning them, this is not sustainable. And nobody paid attention because the profits were too big. Redwoods, after the gold rush, everybody needed construction wood. And in a matter of two generations, the original redwood forests in the Santa Cruz Mountains were cut into pieces. Add another wave after the earthquake and the fire in 1906. And then the turnaround began. 
activists from the San Francisco Bay Area banded together and established the Semper Virens Fund. In the nick of time, they managed to save the last big redwood standing in Big Basin. It became the first state park in California. Hallelujah. They look very well healed, but they were the original tree huggers. Sorry. Here we go again. And thanks to them and many others, we have ancient redwoods standing within a one hour drive of millions of urban residents in the San Francisco Bay Area. But it's not just the tree huggers that are part of this story as we're presenting it. We need the wisdom and the practical knowledge of people who are making a living off the land and the sea the people with dirt under their fingernails. They have their own wisdom. Bud and Lud McCrary established a logging company after the big trees were long gone and people thought they were crazy. And yet they managed to find a way to harvest redwood trees sustainably. And they became radicals who taught the California Department of Forestry that their standards were too lax. Tighten up. This is a better way to do it. Thanks, Lud and Bud. We need people like this guy, Dave Straub, supporting steelhead. Isn't that a magnificent fish? Okay. At a hatchery north of Santa Cruz. Elephant seals slaughtered. There was almost none left 100 years ago. And then they were given protection first by Mexico. And then 50 years ago, 50 years ago this year, the Marine Mammal Protection Act was established in Washington, D.C. And then the Endangered Species Act. And thanks to that, elephant seals have made a comeback. And they're coming ashore as we speak for their winter rituals. Peregrine falcons, the fastest birds on Earth, could not escape their fate because of the effects of DDT. Thin their eggshells, crush their chicks. But in 1973, DDT was banned, thanks to Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, published eight years prior to that. California condors went down the same path, close to extinction, in part because of lead poisoning, lead shot, animals killed, they feed on the carcasses, gone. They've been rewilded. Now there's more than 100 flying free along the Big Sur coast. And it all adds up to a success story that is pretty unique. But it didn't happen automatically. It didn't just happen naturally. And with an election coming up in a few days, it's really worth keeping in mind that, yes, Politicians can make a huge difference. If we elect the right people, we can do this again. Because of the right decisions made 50 years ago, we are benefiting from the results every day here. It's improved our quality of life hugely, and it's enabled creatures like these to bounce back, including mountain lions. Given protection while Ronald Reagan was governor in the state of California due to lobbying. But mountain lions have a hard time dealing with our human infrastructure, especially roads. This one tried to cross Highway 17, was killed by a car, taken to a lab for forensic analysis. Chris and I are very proud that we convened the first meeting of stakeholders to explore what could be done. Was there a place where an underpass could be created to enable lions to traverse from the northern part of the Santa Cruz Mountains to the southern part of the Santa Cruz Mountains? <coughs> a few weeks ago, there was this ceremony. It's finally happening. It takes a long time to bend things around. 
It took the land trust of Santa Cruz County many years of lobbying and financial campaigns. And it took the efforts by Senator John Laird and other politicians in Sacramento to twist the arm of Caltrans. But now they really like what they're doing there. And this is becoming a template for other parts of California. And we're gonna see a lot more of these underpasses and overpasses to heal the landscapes. The Land Trust of Santa Cruz County just purchased this property to create more connectivity between the Santa Cruz Mountains in the north and the Gabalan Range to the south. And we have other partners we're working with. Watsonville Wetland Watch is creating trails along an urban wetland, important for birds, migratory birds, but also hugely important for people who live in densely packed cities. And most of the population there is Hispanic. So we're working with them on their next initiative to regreen Watsonville. The ugly word, the scary term, climate change. I never thought that we would see this happen so fast, so close to home. Chris and I are educated. We work with lots of environmental organizations, but the effects of climate change turn from an intellectual concept into a scary reality when the CZU fire hit us two years ago. It burned down to the beach. Nobody thought that that would happen. The Santa Cruz Mountains were thought to be impervious to fire. Foresters called it the asbestos forest. Nope, it burned. All the big basin burned. A few months earlier, we stood there at the top of these hills that were burning in that previous image with ecologist Gray Hayes because the place is full of endangered and unusual plants. And of course, I never thought that this image would become part of history because it'll never look the same, certainly not within our lifetime. Here's a short video clip that we made when we went back into the burned area of its state parks. There had not been a forest fire in Big Basin in hundreds of years of this extent, extent because of fire suppression. Native Americans used to burn all the time. It was part of their way of managing the landscapes. But after they were kicked off the land, that practice, that knowledge was stopped, and we need to bring it back. After I made that image, Chris and I rushed back because we thought we might lose our home, and we panicked and tried to do what we could. The sheriff showed up and said, you got to get out. The fire is coming. Scared everyone, and then we talked with neighbors, and we decided to stay. We were not so sure authorities would have our backs once we would leave our properties. And we have a strong neighborhood, and we have capable people. So we created our self-defense, and we fought the fire. And we managed to save our neighborhood. But many people were not so lucky. A thousand families lost their homes in that CZU fire in 2022, including our friends Matt and Ann Rowley in Swanton, lost everything they had. They faced the daunting prospect of rebuilding, like so many other families, so many hoops to jump through, insurance companies, new regulations, and it's a really sorry statistic to share with you that two years after the fire, from the 1,000 fire victims, less than 50 have started to rebuild. Many won't do it at all. They can't face the reality of it. Matt and Ann are now climate refugees. They've moved north. And that's one of the big stories of our time. Nature's turning against us because we're turning against nature. No matter whether you get hit by a hurricane or by a flood or by a fire, it's an expression of nature being out of balance with us or we being out of balance with nature. And we need to resolve that. 
fires turning into fire storms. We need these winter storms to come off the ocean every year. In fact, we're dangerously dependent on a handful of winter storms here to replenish our water supplies. It's totally unpredictable. Depends on obscure weather patterns in the middle of the Pacific, and then they come ashore. Giant waves, Peter Mel, local surfing hero, loves them. But can we count on these waves? Can we count on these storms to continue as we need them? That's the big question here. We need the rain. We need the fog to keep the forest green. And I'm glad to experience these first rains. It may not be what you had in mind when you came here. You might have been thinking about sun, but thank God we have some initial rain. <laughs> this is how I captured it on our meadow. We live in Bonnie Dune at the northern end of Santa Cruz. And the longer shutter speed that visual life. The rain is a very difficult thing to express in photographs. And we need the fog. The fog is our air conditioner. Without fog, farmers would be in serious trouble here. It's an unpaid ecosystem service. So Chris and I have been exploring Monterey Bay the way we've done it elsewhere. And after a couple of years, we suffered from the same syndrome that scientists and technocrats suffer from. We had all the facts and figures. But how do you turn that into a story? Joseph Campbell, another friend of Ed Ricketts, and John Steinbeck, who also lived here in Monterey, put it this way. He said, people forget about facts. They remember stories. And that's a takeaway for all of us. So we tried to do this, simplify the complexities, and we created this. And if I can remember this, no, I can't quite. I should know this by heart now. But here's the most simple way to express what Monterey Bay is all about. The Bay of Life is a unique confluence of land and sea, energized by the sun here in the middle, shaped by the forces of fog and fire, and influenced by the actions of people. That's the story. We started playing with these ideas the way we always do. Yeah, we don't agree about everything, but gradually something takes shape, and it's just the two of us. We try things out, ask friends to comment, but it's just nurtured very close to our hearts. And now it's a real thing. We've published a book. Yeah, we're doing presentations like this one here. Thank you for attending. But now the rubber needs to meet the road. It's no longer just the two of us. We need all of our partners to become part of the story. So I'm really glad that b &H has given me the opportunity to evangelize about Monterey Bay here. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone else. And we say thanks to all these other organizations and companies. We're really thrilled that the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, which manages our school system, is embracing the book and turning it into a new curriculum for students across the county. In English and Spanish, I should say. We also have, we have plans to publish the book in Spanish. And the organizations go on. So I'd like to end the presentation by sharing a short video clip with you, because of course we're also producing video. And this is just a few clips here and there that we're weaving into the exhibitions and other presentations. So, and I'll explain a few more things about what we're trying to do while you see these lunch feeding whales gulp the fish in front of you. We really want to make a difference with this project. It's for people of the region. We want to start from the ground up, educate our kids, and share with them how special this place is, how it was pulled apart 
and how it's been brought back and how there's a coexistence here of sorts. Here's the famous peregrine falcon. This is not just a story for people here in Monterey Bay because there's no more pristine nature on the planet, as I mentioned earlier. We need to start healing our planet place by place. And if Monterey Bay can be healed, then we hope that this is a story of hope for people elsewhere. Here's Matt Rowley still working with the fish even after he lost his home. And we need these stories of hope because there's a lot of bad news every single day. We're at the beginning of a new climate change conference in Egypt. Don't despair. Don't despair. There are people who are really trying to make things happen in Egypt, and we can all do our part. The big redwoods in Big Basin, scorched by the fire. The flames went 200 feet up in the air. And we thought these redwoods were gone. No, they came back. And State Parks is now proactively applying fire the way Native Americans did, with prescribed burns. The people who are running cattle in the uplands are providing habitats. That's corridor for wildlife. That's a little bit too close for comfort, I would say. <laughs> and then, as the best expression of this grandiose meeting of land and sea, the big waves, and a surfer paying tribute. She's just watching. Happy to be there, like we all are. So you can see a lot more on bayoflife.net. Check it out. You'll see more of our partners' work and more of the events, bayoflife.net. You can get copies of the book there as well if you don't want to carry them home from here. One more image. After that fire in Big Basin, we went in It was tough to watch. And then the redwoods came back. They started resprouting from their base, from their crowns, even from their trunks. That's resilient. They were prepared for the fire. Are we? Are we able to cope with changes that are happening in our lifetime? I'm not so sure about that yet. Well, let's take our cue from the world of nature and apply it to our own lifestyles so that we can achieve a better balance and practice what you preach with your photography and how you apply it. Work with others. Apply a sense of purpose. Establish a sense of place. Develop your sense of community. We're stronger together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franz. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. OK, ladies and gentlemen, once again, Franz Lanting. I'll be, I'll be at the table outside to sign books and answer any questions may, we may have. Do we have time for questions, or have we run we're, out of we're time? We're going to bring him out outside. So right. you can ask questions to Franz outside. He'll be in the, uh, in the gallery of his images that's brought here by Bay Photo. Uh, up next, we have Aaron Babnik, a Canon Explorer of Light. We could roll that Canon commercial.
Okay, let me give everyone a, a second to move around. We're going to start our next presentation in about 30 seconds. Uh, we do have speaker meet and greets going on if you exit the uh, expo floor to the left. And that's a, there's a schedule on some TVs. You can see that going on. Uh, we turn our presentations very fast here at Optic. How are you guys doing down there? Nice. No. Okay. I always count on you for a good shot. <laughs> okay, camera company that's very dear to my heart is Canon. My first serious camera was a, a Canon camera. It was a Canon T90. I don't know if anyone remembers the T90. Did anyone shoot with Canon FD lenses back in the day? All right. Well, a couple of people. Those were the old manual focus Canons. Um, yeah, I'm old. <laughs> so, uh, Aaron Babnick is a three-time veteran of OPTIC. Uh, I really have to say, Aaron's presentations, uh, pay close attention. She is laser focused and delivers some amazing information. She's going to talk today about locations versus landscapes, which is an interesting play on topics. So let's give a warm OPTIC welcome for Aaron Babnick. Thank you. All right. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm super excited to be able to present to you today this topic, which enables me to pull together strands of many themes that are near and dear to me, and also to share with you some um, great ideas for moving forward, not only with your own photography, um, but also with helping the planet to stay beautiful for generations to come. But before I get started on this, I would just like to thank Canon for bringing me out here to speak to you all today. So thanks, Canon. So landscape photography is a term that seems deceivingly simple. If we try to break that down into two words, the term seems as though it should describe itself. But in fact, it's actually a very uh, slippery combination of terms that are indeed difficult to pin down. A landscape, that's the first part of the word, obviously should have something to do with land. And of course, most people do think of landscapes in that way. A landscape might be something like this one, where you have a sense for where the photographer is standing, you have a sense for the context, you have a sense for what attracted the photographer to that location, and you have a sense for what sort of environment this is and, and, and uh, how special this moment may be in that place. So land can encompass all of these things. Landscape, as we'll see, actually, is a much bigger concept than any of that. But let's, um, let's move on to the second part of landscape photography. That's the photography part. That, too, actually, is not that de easy to define. For some people, uh, back in the day, photography, once we first went to digital, uh, that didn't count. Right? A photograph was something that was printed on a piece of paper, and that was it. And these definitions have had to change as time has gone on. Photography now involves this incredibly sophisticated equipment, if you can get it. And it really is an absolute uh, just miracle of human achievement that we're able to take this sort of equipment out into nature and work with it and produce what we can with it because 
a whole lot of collaboration goes on in order for that to happen, not only between you and nature, but also between you and those engineers who actually came up with all of that stuff. So this is, this is my gear that you're seeing here, my Canon gear. I use quite a lot of different lenses. Got a pair of R5s. Um, so the photography part of the equation for me looks like this at the very essence of it. But of course, those two ingredients in landscape photography, the land, the landscape, and the photography, um, only get us part of the way there. And what I would like to impress upon you today is actually that third ingredient which is really so important and often gets left out of the equations when we are in discussions of what's going on. And that is the photographer and the role that you play in any photograph that you make. A landscape is so much more than just the land. And it's so much more than just all of that amazing technology that you can throw at it. When you produce a landscape, you're producing a part of yourself. Whether you like it or not, you're putting something of yourself into that, that image. And this starts all the way from when you decide where to go. There are so many creative decisions involved in landscape photography. It can be easy to forget that they are, in fact, decisions. And it can also be very easy for people to see a landscape and think, well, yeah, if I were there, I would take that image too, <laughs> right? I'd push the button, sure. <laughs> and it can be very easy to think that where the magic lies is, is in the land. And that can, that can have very negative consequences for the land, as we'll talk about in a bit. So it's not to say that this is really um, a semantic issue between you know, how do we talk about our landscapes. It's, it's also how do we think about them and what, how do we frame them and how do we encourage others to think about them and in fact, what do we do in, in response to those thoughts that we have about them. Indeed, when you go out into a landscape, you don't necessarily just get something like this. Here is a, another photograph from exactly the same location. Okay, it's the same place, different dune around the corner from the other one. All right, and I've, I've overlaid um, a pseudo focus point grid here <laughs> just to give you a sense of the fact that so many decisions go into creating a landscape, even just choosing which focus point sometimes can have a big effect on how your image ends up looking. So you could have something like this. You still have that beautiful San Verbena blooming in the desert, and you still have those beautiful dunes, and you still have that beautiful evening light. Um, but what you have here is only a little bit of the photographer, just a little bit. What happens when you put more of the photographer into it, when you put more of yourself, is you end up with something else. And I feel as though we need to give ourselves credit for that part of the equation, and in fact, allow ourselves to speak about landscape photographs as a collaboration between nature and photographer. In this case, there's a whole lot of me going into this image. It represents a lot of my interests, my compositional interests, my post-processing interests. Speaking of post-processing, a lot of people think that that's you know, back in the day especially, that has nothing whatever to do with darkroom work and there's this major di division between everything that happens before you press the shutter and everything that happens after. I don't happen to be in that camp. I, I embrace all of the tools that I have at my disposal, in including Photoshop. So my images do probably express that love of playing with the tones and the colors to help tell the story that I want to tell. In this case, the, the story of this incredible, incredibly beautiful, delicate flowers toughing it out in an environment where they seem like they should have no business thriving, and yet they do. That's where they want to be, in this windswept, harsh desert environment, and there they are. For some people, however, Photoshop is just 
That's what happens when all else fails. It's a verb de describing that process. <laughs> For me, um, it's a wonderful creative space that can help to bring out more of what you feel and see and experience and more of what your relationship really encompasses with a landscape. And yes, it's actually, this place is pretty crazy. There's actually less Photoshop in this one than, than you might think. So before we get into unpacking all that I've just said, comparing the difference between what is a location and what is a landscape, um, let's, just, let's just talk about the idea of looking beyond locations and why that might even be important. Why, why bother? I've already given you a hint about that, but locations essentially are a place where they, they, it's a place that stands between coordinates, essentially. And what we have in, in the world is the ability to go to those coordinates and produce something these days that is pretty close to something that someone else has produced. That's one option. But we also have an option to consider all that we bring to a place ourselves and to let that factor in as well. We can go to a place and we can think about how much we love locations because what landscape photographer doesn't? In fact, locations have come to define the genre to, to a great extent. Up until 10 years ago, most landscape photographers titled their photographs just after where it was, Mesa Arch at Sunrise, or something like that, right? Um, I tend not to do that, and I'll talk more about that later on, because I would like to, at least to get nudge people into considering that third part of the equation, which is the photographer, and that relationship that I bring to the whole equation. But yeah, we love locations, right? We, re we create location books. We might create location galleries. We have location bucket lists. Uh, if we didn't have the locations, we wouldn't have the photography. They are important, no doubt, and indeed, even just straightforward documentation of locations is of extreme value, especially in a day when so many of them are disappearing, either because of uh, climate change or because of things that happen because of human visitation. But I'm not saying that there's a zero-sum game here between, under, between focusing on locations and focusing on landscapes, but it is an important distinction, and it helps for all of us to make that distinction loom large in what we're doing. For example, when I'm out in the desert photographing a space, I don't necessarily have to photograph that especially famous view next to me, but I might. If I don't, though, if I go to a place and I think in terms of only uh, the location that it is, that might cut off avenues of exploration and avenues of consideration because if my goal is to document the location purely and not put something of myself into it, I may think that certain decisions need to follow. I may go there and, and, and I may be closed off to seeing anything that I didn't know already existed there. For example, in this place, I'm standing right next to a very iconic view, way off to my left. Uh, it just wasn't what was of interest to me at the moment. Instead, I saw this wonderful undulating light working its way across the desert in the background at 400 millimeters. So just exploring with the telephoto lens, I didn't even need to move my feet. I was able to come away with something where I had something to say, and I could infuse a little bit more of myself into it. Exact same location as that iconic composition. Now, it's not to say that those iconic compositions aren't important and indeed in some cases even necessary. We, we definitely need people to document the wonderful world as well. But if you move beyond that, if you look beyond locations, there's a world, the whole world is your oyster and there's so much out there uh, that you can do. For example, this is an image from the French Alps. It's a place that um, is pretty high up in, in the mountains, and it's not a place that just anyone <laughs> tends to go, but those who do go um, are usually very enthralled by a set of cascades that are the first thing you see when you get up onto this high plane. 
And in fact, when I told a friend of mine who had been there that I was going, um, he said, oh, you, you, don't, you know about the Cascades, don't you? I didn't actually. He said, oh, you gotta, you gotta shoot the Cascades. They're the coolest thing, they're right up at the front. Uh, and so then I looked up a few images and I wasn't able to find many, because believe me, this isn't the place that a lot of people go. But the few that I did find, indeed, they included those Cascades. Uh, but when I went up there, I, you know, I just wanted to look at what else was there. Now, like I said, it's not easy to get to this place. It's close to 4,000 feet in elevation gain. It's a very rugged environment, very rocky. Uh, you have to really be willing to get up there, get out there, and hoof it for a while. Uh, but it's an incredible place, and indeed, the water is really impressive. If you go beyond those cascades, there's loads of it. This area has a lot of glacial melt coming down, and I spent the first day, I went up there twice, two days in a row, and spent the first day just exploring the water beyond the Cascades. I thought that was pretty marvelous. And, and that, was, that was definitely an interesting process of thinking through the water and being attracted to all of that. But then my own instincts started to kick in. I found this tiny little patch of flowers, and here I am doing a little focus stack of them. And those really charmed me the most. As much as I enjoyed the water, and I did work some photographs of it, it was sitting there with those, that little patch of flowers um, that, that really, really did it for me because I saw a story there. Now, I could have come away with just something from the water, and it would still be that location, just right to the side of where I'm standing is, is water. Right, so here's an image again with that, that overlay of the focus points just to remind you that the magic doesn't lie only in the location. There's a little bit of the photographer in this image, but just a little bit. This is me walking around just sort of taking sort of record shots and trying to just sort out what, what all interests me, get, get it out of my system that there's water there, play with it. But what happens when the photographer pours more of themselves into the image? You eventually find that story, that connection that comes from your relationship with the land. And in this case, the way that those rocks embrace those flowers really reminds me of what I was talking about with the flowers in the desert. That somehow that's where these flowers want to live, and they thrive there. In this crazy, rugged environment, and, and there aren't a ton of them, as you saw in the video, just little patches. But there they are. I called this one the walled garden. That was my name for it. So now I could have photographed just the mountain in a million different ways. And that is an important, beautiful mountain. A mountain with that kind of a pyramidal structure, um, you know, it's ex exceedingly attractive. So it's not like I just didn't photograph the mountain. Like I said, with that earlier image where the, there was an iconic view off to my left. Well, in this case, I photographed what was the most big and amazing thing that I could have, right? Um, but in a way that spoke to me and that, that told a story about that area. So what happens, though, if we put too much emphasis on just the location, if we're telling people, I photographed this place, and we have nothing more to say about it, or if we're telling people, if you want a great shot, go to this place. You'll, this is what you can do there. Or and if we leave out that part of the equation that is you, the photographer, what happens? What is lost? What is at stake? And I think it's really important to talk about that part of it for conservation purposes. Because what happens when places get too much visitation? when you direct people too much to a place because they think that's where the magic lies, you end up with loss, right? The lights go out on that place eventually. Imagine if in 1930, Edward Weston produced Pepper Number 30, and he put that on Instagram, <clears throat> and everybody said, oh man, I need to find this pepper field because that pepper is where the magic lies. And so they all go running to the pepper field, wielding cameras, and completely trample it. <laughs> but I mean, it's kind of, I laugh, but it is kind of what's happening these days. There are entire areas now where wildflowers no longer grow because they have been trampled. It, it really is a problem. So is, is the answer to 
to close off these places so no one could, could go there? I'd like to think not, right? I'd like to think that going to these areas and being able to explore them for yourself should be part of our discourse, part of our conversations with ourselves and with everyone else who we talk to and who, with everyone who sees our images. We photographers are the, one who've create, are the ones who've created the problem, really. You know, we're the ones who are perpetuating that problem, not because we don't mean well, we do, we love our locations. And we care about them, we want to celebrate them, and we want to talk about them. But we need to be mindful, I think, of what role we play in actually producing the and give ourselves some credit for that. So now that I've said all of that, now I've said what are locations and what is at stake in this, this creation of a landscape photograph, let's, let's, just, let's just unpack that term, landscape a little bit more. What is a landscape, anyway? Now, it might seem like it's pretty straightforward, as I said, but actually, a landscape, all right, that's different than, than just land, and it's different than just a set of coordinates. Landscape is essentially a mental construct. It's a mental construct built up of traditions, of stories, of mythologies, of all of the experiences that people have had going to other places that might remind them of this one or experiences that they've had in that place. You can't unexperience a place. You can't unexperience your concept of land. Even if you've even just seen it in a movie, you're probably coming away with ideas about areas, about biomes. And it's helpful to appreciate that what people get out of seeing your images is so much more than just going to that location and appreciating that it needs to be protected. That's one thing. They also can see your images and they can, they can dream a little, right? And, and a, land, a landscape brings with it so much, so much that you put into it if you've, if you've if you've done, done that, but also so much that they bring to it, your viewer. I often say that the, the, the viewer will often see more than you ever intended. Right? They'll understand more than you had in mind. And you probably had in mind more than they'll ever understand. And that's okay, because that's how art works. That's actually one of the cool things about it, that beautiful open-endedness that is creation. Right, so um, I don't think I can put it any better than uh, a guy who went absolutely viral in 2010 in a YouTube video, perhaps you've seen this one. He's outside and there's this beautiful double rainbow forming. And you know this, this video, he's out there and the rainbow's just getting brighter and brighter and he's having a very, very intense emotional moment. A and what does he say? It's a double rainbow. Anyone know this one? A double rainbow all the way. What does it mean? You know that one, right? It, it's really, it's, you know, it's wonderful if anyone can have that kind of a response to nature. It really is. <laughs> uh, and as a landscape photographer, it's wonderful if you can bring some of that to people to give them that, that sense of, that wonder, that sense of wonder. But another thing that landscapes can do is call on all of those traditions and all of those mythologies for people and, and let them just dream a little about things that may have nothing whatever to do with specifically that land or that moment. For example, that image that I just showed you earlier of, of the desert landscape with the rainbows, wide open areas like that are not everywhere in the world. And in fact, the, here, we, here in the American West, we're very lucky to have a lot of it. And that's why landscape photography is so, um, so very popular and, and almost uh, born here. You know, there are a lot of landscape photographers all over the world, but uh, the United States certainly has a lot of those absolutely classic vistas because we just have so much of these wide open spaces. 
And, and even before the age of photography, back in the age of painting, that kind of expansiveness of the land became very wrapped up with the concept of freedom, especially for Westerners who were leaving the East and going West to obtain freedom in these wide open expanses of space. And so therefore, when we go somewhere else, this is Iceland, for example, we do tend to take those ideas with us. Those, those are parts of the mythologies that I was talking about that tend to, tend to stay with us. And depending on what you bring to landscape and your own experiences, um, they play out in your own decision making, in your own relationships with that land, and in the way that people view what you've done. Likewise, mountains. I'm, I'm largely a mountain photographer. I spent a lot of time in the mountains. Mountains are known in the mythologies of many cultures as places that are close to the gods. And it's hard not to, even, even if it's just subconsciously, it's hard not to have some kind of sense of awe of mountains on that level, regardless of what you believe, and whether or not you believe Zeus lives on Mount Olympus or not. <laughs> Um, you know, these sorts of environments do carry those mythologies and traditions with them, depending on who, who's viewing them. It's never going to be absolute, of course, but it's a thing. So having, having laid out what it is that's at stake and what is really different between pursuing a location and pursuing a landscape, what I'd like to do now is give you some sense of how you can actually put some of these ideas to work for you and how you can put a little bit more of your own good self into your landscapes. So what I've tried to do is break this down, these ideas down into five helpful habits that you can get into. And there's a little bit of overlap between these. But I think that uh, if you, go out and you think that you're having trouble moving beyond the idea that you're in this particular location, that these five habits can help you to sort of move beyond that. So I'm going to, uh, in the interest of trying to make them somewhat memorable, <laughs> keep them brief in titles here. Light before landmarks, hide and seek, embrace the unknown, connect the dots, and speak softly. You'll see what I mean about each of these in a minute. So let's talk about light before landscapes. So when you go somewhere and you know that there's something really amazing on offer, as I said earlier, it can be hard to see what you don't know is there because you're so fixated on what is. Now this, this image is one that really speaks to me. And it is not a famous mountain. And in fact, it's not even the most prominent mountain. It's probably about the 30th most prominent mountain in my view. I'm photographing it at 400 millimeters from an area where I had a 360 degree view, a view of mountains. I had a lot to choose from. <laughs> it didn't have to be this one. And in fact, there are a couple of really famous peaks nearby. And it would be very easy to go to this place and say, if you go there, you have the best possible view of this other famous mountain. So I, of course, I, I feel somehow obliged to photograph the other famous mountain. But if instead you go up there and you think, I'm just going to respond and I'm going to think about what I see and what the light is showing me, you might see this. So I just love the way that this mountain seemed to be catching light at the very most interesting part of it, almost like it's sending signals out into space or something. Uh, and it's very suggestive to me. And I love these kinds of moments of visual poetry that are much easier to find if you're just allowing yourself to. Sometimes there are areas where you can find a photograph that will never be there again. Atmosphere is great in this regard. So this is actually an image from Death Valley, where I spend a lot of time, I teach a lot of workshops there. On this particular day, when this cloud inversion was happening, none of the landmarks could have been more interesting to me. And, I, and 
fortunately, my workshop that was with me agreed. <laughs> they had so much fun really thinking through their options for this incredible expanse of uh, the, the park that was covered with this incredible atmosphere. And the telephoto lenses came out, and if you've never seen a bunch of photographers that dialed into what they're doing, you really should because it's a beauty, <laughs> beautiful thing to see. See people that are just responding so intensely to what they're seeing and, and all pointing in different directions because they're just, they're all, the point is they're seeing, right? Um, they're, not, they're not just going for the landmark. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with landmarks. I do, I do really appreciate them. As I said, I showed you, you know, sometimes I'll, I'm absolutely trying to find a way to tell a story about a landmark. But it's not the only way. Sometimes I'll be standing right next to a, a, a landmark. This is another one of those occasions. There is one of the most famous now massifs. Uh, when I first started going there, it wasn't, but uh, now it is. Uh, just to the right of me here. And this is, again, another one of these super telephoto landscapes where you wouldn't have even seen it if you hadn't had that telephoto lens out to find it. We were hunting around <laughs> and could see in the distance this incredible moment of light and the way that these two peaks seem to be kind of leaning into each other for a little dance. Uh, their charming veils fluttering behind them. These sorts of moments really get my imagination going. And it's incredibly fun to find them. Finding the light is really, really fun if, if you just allow yourself to do that. So here is a scene, forests, you know, forest scenes are I, just sort of eternally complicated. But if you go into them thinking that, maybe you'll just go look for the biggest, most famous tree. <laughs> but if you go into them thinking, where's the light? There's, there's so much that you can do. Just going to find, where, what, where is the light? How can I frame the light? How can I tell some story about the light coming into this charming, magical environment. On this moment, I was snowshoeing around for days looking for the light. <laughs> uh, and I was in an environment where I thought I knew what I'd come to photograph. When I got there, the, the light just wasn't working for that. And so I just explored further and further. And one morning, got up very early, way before dark, strapped on the snowshoes and the headlamp. All I could see was snow. In, in the light of my headlamp. And when I got up to this high plane, I could see this little crack of light on the horizon. And I had scouted that plane the day before, and I, I was so excited. I just knew what I could do up there. This is not an iconic place. It's not a place anybody <laughs> will ever think to go, except for maybe in the summertime when they're, when they're hiking. Uh, but to get these photographs, it, it really does help if you have that mentality that I'm producing a landscape. So sometimes if, it, if, if the landmark is not speaking to you, look for the light. And usually that's where you'll find something. Hide and seek. This one uh, I think is probably the one that uh, is most closely connected to my own personal style. I love atmosphere. I love finding ways to hide the context of an image. And you'll probably notice this, this uh, image is uh, on some of the posters for, for this event. Um, this, is, this is, again, a little tiny peak in an area where I had a massive, probably 180 degree view of peaks. And again, it's a, it's a sub peak to a bunch of bigger ones. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really just zoomed in on that one because there's, there's light there and there's a story to tell, but also because I don't get too much of the context. It was this window of atmosphere and this little peak showing there. And even though its big brother next door was also out showing itself, there was a lot of context and it didn't have the same sense of mystery about it. So this was an area where I could really isolate this one little peak and there's this wonderful story about it coming out surrounded by atmosphere and of course, very soon after that, it was completely engulfed. This, this peak here reminded me of, uh, I don't know, so it's, it's a passing snow squall going over the peak. And again, another really famous set of peaks nearby. And this is the little one 
generally doesn't get all the love, although it's not, it's not, it is, it is still a very impressive peak that, that some people would know well. But um, I've often had people who've taken workshops with me and then they get into the post-processing session, get something like this and they think, oh, well, we need to crank up the clarity slider. I can't see, I can't see enough of the peak. <laughs> to me, it's like, no, 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 no. That's where the magic lies. The mystery of, of hiding something in the frame adds something to the image to a great extent. If you're just thinking in terms of this is a location, this is a favorite, famous mountain, and I need to show it very clearly, I need to give a very descriptive view of this very handsome mountain, you're not going to do this. But if you think that you want to infuse a little bit of mystery, a little bit of poetry into what you're doing, you might. And this can happen anywhere. Atmosphere can be moving sand for all I care. Uh, I just love it. I love those moments that do not reveal everything. They actually conceal a whole lot. These are those moments where the, the atmosphere is giving us the story by not giving us too much context and pulling us out of the story. So some images have almost no detail at all. It would be very hard to tell where I was standing. Where are my feet? What does this place look like? This is just backlit sand at sunset, and all you're getting is a little bit of rim light off of the dunes. And to me, these dunes reminded me of ocean waves or something like that. Just a beautiful moment of light that takes you away from the fact that it's even a desert and reminds you of something that it, that it isn't even. Right? So that's moving way beyond just the landscape. These moments can be super exciting. They don't have to be these, these bigger, grander scenes. They can be very, very exciting just by removing the context yourself through cropping. Find these, these moments where things come together and the strangeness is what you're showing, not the context. Now, I could show you the top of the ridge line here and the sky above it. You'd get a greater sense of scale. I could put a person in the landscape. You'd get a greater sense of scale. We often hear that. Landscape really needs a person because that gives a sense of scale. <laughs> I, I'm of the opposite camp. I want to take the person out of there because it gives away the sense of scale, right? It gives away the game and it kind of robs the place of its mystery. I'd rather not show exactly the descriptive view of a place. I'd much rather show something that's a collaboration between me and nature. And sometimes that means just going really small, getting right down next to the ground and, and letting your imagination play with what's down there. And I, I believe that these are landscapes too, these sorts of images. In fact, uh, years ago I was speaking at a conference in England at which John Blakemore, a very celebrated British photographer, was speaking. And um, he had reached, at that point, I think he was 80. And once he had reached 70, it became harder for him to go out to the areas that he frequented the most for landscape photography. He was getting a little less mobile. And so he spent 10 years photographing his living room as a landscape. And he said to the audience at, at that event, he said, and he showed, showed these images, and they were wonderful. They were very evocative of outdoor spaces. He just couldn't go out there anymore, so he did what he could, right? And he said, should we allow these as a sort of domestic landscape? I think we should. I agreed with them, right? So what is a landscape? It, it can be very wide open, but it, and a landscape, like I said, is, is a concept. And the more that you bring to that idea, uh, the more conceptual that it gets, usually the more interesting that it gets. So I love finding areas where I see something that it's not, like surf crashing on a beach in this case. It's not, it's two layers of mud coming together. But the more that you go out there and you just work with that, those sort of concepts of landscape, the more that you have to work with. So related to this idea of hide and seek is, and, and by the way, the seek part, I've been telling you all along without really emphasizing it, so I'll do that now. You are having to seek out what it is that you're looking for. If you're 
hiding part of it, you're also seeking, right? So exploration, I walked 10 miles through knee-high water in a river canyon to find this little patch of mud. So there's a lot of seeking involved in all of this too, but uh, that's a whole other talk that I often give is on exploration. But I just want to say that that is the other half of the hide-and-seek equation. So let's talk about embracing the unknown because this is, this is where, uh, this is where you just have a lot of opportunity. If, if you are struggling to get away from that idea of the location and what is important about this place supposedly, what do they tell me is important? Just go to a place where it's never the same. So sand dunes are awesome for that. They're always changing. That stuff's moving around all the time. Uh, good luck taking exactly the same photo twice. Although the dunes tend not to move that much. They are always changing character. They're subtly changing shape. I have this one dune that I take my, uh, my workshops to in Death Valley. I call it the squiggle dune. And the squiggle dune is now becoming more of a, it was a beautiful S curve, now it's more of a Z. <laughs> and sometimes it has sort of a corduroy finish and sometimes it looks like silk. Um, and it, it's just wonderful how much dunes change. You never really know exactly what you're going to find there. So if you can just sort of embrace these sorts of areas, mud tiles are another place. If you go out into these areas where the water is able to interact with fine silt, those will tend to form mud tiles, and these are all over the southwest. This one's in the Mojave Desert. These mud tiles were so big, I could stick my, back then, uh, Canon uh, EOS Mark III, uh, 5D Mark III, down into those cracks with a, a wide angle lens on it, no problem. They were, they were huge. <laughs> so um, amazing that you find that. And then this whole playa, I was told two weeks later it was gone. So it was completely erased by nature. Another flood came in, covered it over, and that was the end of that. So now there might be something else there. It's wonderful to go out and explore and find areas where the ground itself is actually changing all the time. And even if you find just little patches of these areas, there's something that you can do with that, too. It tells a great story about the place. Lots of places have this ability. The black sand deserts of Iceland, you go out there, and you, just, you really just never know what you're going to find. This little whorl on the edge of the lake, that's not always going to be there. Right? It takes a certain set of conditions, certain water height. All, all sorts of things need to happen. The more that you go out and you just look for areas where things are likely to be changing, the more that you're going to get far away from that idea that you're doing something specific and descriptive. It's wonderful just to climb up high and look down on stuff. So here I am in Acadia National Park, just climbing up on a rock and looking down, and lo and behold, there's this crazy ring of, of undressed trees next to all of their friends showing off everything they've got. Right? Is it the circle of life, a circle of friends? These sorts of ideas really get my imagination going. And it does require just getting out in these areas where you don't know what you're going to find. It could be different. Certainly, a bunch of trees in autumn, that can change radically from one day to the next, especially as wind comes and their colors change. And so changing areas or an area where you can go and really find more than just what you expect to be there. Connect the dots. Let's talk about that. Now, what am I talking about connect, connecting the dots? Essentially, what I mean with, about that is, it, how are you going to present your images? Are you going to just present them as an expose on a specific location? Totally an option, and there are lots of good reasons why you might want to do that. Right? If you want to produce a, a documentary about why a certain area needs to be protected, it's going to be a movie about, or, or a, a book about that area, right? And you're going to have a series of images from that area. That's not necessary, um, but that, that sometimes, I should say sometimes that is necessary, but it, it isn't always. So let's just say if you're going to a place and there happen to be some sand dunes there and there happen to be some salt creeks there and you really like salt creeks <laughs> and you really like the 
the beautiful leathery textures of mud tiles. And you photograph that too, and you think that's so crazy. And oh my gosh, while I was there, there was a storm. And then there was this lingering atmosphere that just kind of hung around and played across the landscape. And it was like, there was this one little fragment that was there for three days. And it was like, it was like that visitor who comes to stay at your house and just sleeps on the couch and never leaves. And there's so many stories that you can tell there. And then, and then we went back to the dunes, and, there, and then the, on the dunes, there was this crazy correspondence between this amazing storm cloud overhead, and the way that it just, the angles of the clouds seem to echo the angles on the ground, and your compositional senses are just going crazy. And then you thought, well, there's this salt flat. There's this wonderful salt flat. And the way that the water is turning the salt into shapes that look like lace doilies. Isn't it crazy how that works? It's amazing how nature can do that. And then you went to this other larger basin, and the salt there was turning into these polka dots that people call the potholes. And they seemed to go on forever. And, and lo and behold, the sky realized that the ground forgot one, and it's bringing, it, bringing that little hole of one that hole that matches what you see on the ground. And there's a story there, isn't it? It's the missing piece. The sky is bringing it down to join the puzzle on the ground. Now, I could, have, I could, I could tell so many stories. And there's so many things that I could say about all these amazing places. And, and if I'm just putting these images in my portfolio, or if I'm just sharing them, there's so much that I can say, besides the fact that everything that I've just shown you was in Death Valley, right? OK, so maybe that's not always the most important point. That would be one way of connecting the dots. I could leave all of that out that I just said. I would say, here's a bunch of shots from Death Valley. When we do that, and there's really not any immediate need to do that, we're missing an opportunity to do other things and to remind our audience that there is much more to Death Valley than Death Valley. There is our relationship with it. There is that human element that the photographer brings to it, the decisions that the photographer makes. So another thing that might really interest you, another way of presenting your images, might be some other themes. Maybe you really like sunlit, craggy peaks. <laughs> okay, And you might find sunlit, craggy peaks in places where most people don't go because they're looking for something else, and you're just looking for sunlit, craggy peaks. <laughs> And so you're loving nature, you're loving these, these areas, right? But you don't need to direct everyone to them and tell them that if you, if this is a photo about X, and if you go to X, you can have that photo too. Different message, right? Different sunlit craggy peak, different place. I could produce a whole portfolio of images on just sunlit craggy peaks <laughs> because I do this a lot. And they could be from all over the world. And I could still tell a very nature-oriented story about these, these areas. There's, there's, just, there's always so much to say. Here we are yet again, totally different environment, totally different biome, more so like craggy peaks, in this case, sea stacks. right? And none of these are even in the same country. They're not the same environments, but they are still nature. Nature giving us these beautiful moments and the more that we get people interested in looking for something other than a location and a specific spot where those tripod, hole, tripod holes are, the more that we encourage them to think about what our contributions are to the photograph, what it is that we bring to it, which is so much more than just, just a, a, an identified place on a map. So the sunlit craggy peaks thing, it could be interesting immersive landscapes and dialogues between what's on the ground and what's in the background. I love finding those sorts of things too. Or you know, the way that the, the ground is always changing. There are so many stories you can tell about that. These environments, this crazy red lava rock in Iceland. Again, similar compositional interests. Getting low to the ground with mud tiles. I've already shown you a number of these. But in this case, I called this image moon dial because to me, there was something about the passage of time going on here, which is hard to ignore when you realize that these environments are so changeable. 
And that image that I, one of the earliest images that I showed you, on the desert with pink flowers, I called this one kindred spirits because it so reminded me of that one. So I'm cr producing a theme, uh, a companion piece on a theme of two totally different areas, right? So I'm, I'm totally appreciating the fact that these are fragile plants in fragile areas in two different areas and in an area where very few people would ever be able to find this because we were traveling out uh, in monster trucks out in the highlands of Iceland, uh, rolling around like a giant creative laboratory for nine days. Um, but it could just as well be some place where people could find it easily. And you know, there are all sorts of ramifications for directing people to those sorts of places without giving them a whole lot more to think about. So I already talked about atmosphere. I love the way that atmosphere can tell a story and give you something that isn't always there. The way that the atmosphere is just clinging on to this pyramidal peak in the background, or the way that the atmosphere here seems to get, look like an asteroid or a comet shooting through the air, or the way that the atmosphere here allows these trees all to seem to be in chorus together, moving out of the way or leaning in and waiting for the light to shine through. The way that the atmosphere rakes across a landscape and you get some sense of the way that those formations of rock actually were formed because of the interplay of the weather and the light and the forces. And I saw, sometimes see things that aren't really there, a rocket ship taking off, for example. If you're really in, and if you're really interested in, in, landscape, uh, in atmosphere like I am, you'll find it, like I said, in the strangest of places, like the deserts of California. And you'll see it in things that aren't even the atmosphere. This is just water, but to me it looks like a bunch of clouds swirling around at the bottom of a waterfall. So these, these sorts of opportunities for you to really dig in and explore and by explore, I don't just mean boots on the ground. I mean exploring ideas. They're everywhere. Maybe you're really interested in seasonal runoff. You can find some seasonal runoff in lots of places. The way that that is not always there is fascinating. I love the way the waterfalls change their force and their power depending on the season. Sometimes seasonal runoff produces streams that are not there any other time of the year. And it's just marvelous to be able to go out there. And if that's your project, and you really want, you're really interested in that, you will find it, and you will put more of yourself into that. So lastly, let's talk about this fifth idea of speaking softly. And by that, I mean there are a number of choices you can make after the photograph is done. After you've put all of yourself into it, you've processed it, and you've decided to put it out there, we all like to think that a photo should speak for itself. And in many ways, it always will. It will never say exactly what you want it to, and people, because people will understand what they see in it, what they bring to it. And as I said, that's part of the fun. But what you do say matters. And we have so many opportunities to say something about our photographs, whether that is just titling them. Now, there's nothing wrong with just putting a location name on, as your title. And in fact, it's more expedient. There's a lot less mental energy that goes into that, right? It's pretty hard to sit down and say, what are you gonna call it? They called this one Gold Rush, right? Personally, I would rather come up with a title that's trite rather than the one that seems indifferent. I'm hoping that by giving my photos that kind of a title, that it encourages people to think a little bit beyond the location. May not always work, but it's, it's worth a try. Called this one The Maw. I saw this big mouth of a monster or something in the forest, and it gives me ideas. It's not just what happens afterwards. Actually, while you're in the field, language coming into play can be very useful. What do you see, and how can you make someone else maybe see that? So what you have to say about the images can also either direct people to them or not. You might have an area like this that's incredibly fragile. And then you might want to think twice about telling people exactly where that is in your caption. Now, there's been a whole um, brouhaha over geotagging 
and I won't get into that, but I'll just say that my, my approach is it's all the same. Everything is fragile and needs to be protected, and so I'm just kind of vague about it. This is in the Mojave Desert, that's enough. Right? That's as far as I go. Um, because some places, okay, sand dunes, they're maybe not that fragile, but that way I don't have to make the call. I don't have to be the one to say how fragile is that place, how much does it need to be protected. I'd rather just assume that they all do. So there you have it, the five. Light before landmarks, hide and seek, embrace the unknown, connect the dots, and speak softly. If you are able to embrace these ideas, I think you'll go farther with understanding that photography does have that third ingredient, which is you, and that what you're doing is having a relationship with the land, and that can only lead to good things. So the next time you're out in nature with your camera, and you're looking around, ask yourself this. Is what I see here just a location, or can I find myself here too? Thank you. We don't have time for questions, right? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Thank you so much, Erin. Erin will be out at the Canon booth doing a Q&A. So if you wish to, to learn a little bit more about those landscapes and whatnot, Erin's at the, at the Canon booth. And one more time, let's give a, a round of applause for Erin when she comes out. Thank you so much. Okay, so. Before we go to lunch, we got a very special speaker up next. I would like to introduce a, a great friend of mine and also the guy who, one of the co-founders of Optic, Ralph Lee Hopkins, the uh, Director of Photography Program for Limblad Expeditions. Ralph. Everyone having a good time? Well, it's my honor to introduce Flip Nicklin. I mean, what a better name for a whale photographer than Flip. But uh, I met Flip uh, years ago at a conservation conference, and we hit it off. It was like we were brothers. And then he invited me. He did a very mean thing. He invited me to Hawaii to photograph whales. And who knew that the whales are like five minutes offshore? And I was hooked. So I started working with Flip for the Whale Trust Maui, raising money for whale research, but Flip goes back to the days when you had 36 shots in your camera to capture things underwater, and he was an underwater photographer. So he's one, when you talk about one of the pioneers of photography, Flip Nicklin is one of those people. Great man, great photographer, and a great friend. Here's Flip. Thank you very much. So, whales and cameras. I'm going to tell some stories today, but I'll tell you about a story I heard 22 years ago. It was on an expedition cruise ship in Alaska, and I was the National Geographic whale guy on board, and the naturalist, Linda Richardson, came up to me and told me a story about a friendly dolphin in southeast Alaska. It was a dolphin that was interested in people, coming up to people, so she went to see it. And when she went to see it, she saw that it looked interested, so she took her clothes off and jumped in the water, and it swam with her. I hear lots of interesting stories, being the whale guy for National Geographic, and I, I think she could see I was a little skeptical about what she was talking about, but she was prepared. She had someone with her with a camera, and she brought out the black and white prints. And there she was, stripped down to her skivvies, in 45 degree water in Haines, Alaska, swimming with the Pacific Whiteside dolphin. Two things were clear. One, it was a true story. And second, this woman was absolutely crazy. <laughs> in all the best ways, uh, we've been together ever since.
Hi, I'm Flip Nicklin, and for the last 43 years, my career has centered around swimming with whales, taking their pictures, and telling their stories. We are now well past the time when we just saw whales in museums. We head out and meet them in their world, in Hawaii, in Alaska, and around the world with whale watching. As a kid in the 50s, having whale watching being looking at a puffs of smoke in the distance off the coast of San Diego, uh, I never dreamed that whale watching would become so big and that people would be able to see them uh, face to face. And video photography and stills have become a big part of telling their story. Whales are just a great subject for photography whether it's with your phone telling the story of your day of whale watching, whether it's using whales as a subject for art, these magnificent giant animals and the, the things that they do, or in my case, trying to tell the story as an editorial photographer, mostly for National Geographic. The story has changed so much over time, but it didn't start with pictures like these. And I had no plan to do this for a career. It was all my father's fault. We didn't have very fancy cameras when I was growing up. But a friend of my father's, a business acquaintance, was Connie Limbaugh, the first diving officer at Scripps Institute. And Connie was a pioneer diver and a pioneer marine scientist. And he, was, he died in a cave diving accident in France in 1960. And his widow, Nan, gave my father two cameras, a rolling marine, two and a quarter underwater camera with a flat port and a flash attachment where you shoot flash bulbs, flat port, and a 16 millimeter Bell and Howell camera with a Samson Hall housing. And my father started trying to learn how to be a photographer. I think it was a pretty sure thing that I was going to be a diver. Uh, my mother's father and uncle uh, did underwater construction work with hard hat gear, building things like piers along the California coast. And in the 60s, my mom was even a cover girl on Skin Diver magazine. My father, Chuck, was a sport diver and champion spear fisherman. And in 1959, opened the diving locker, the second dive shop in San Diego. And my brother Terry and I grew up in a diving world that was uh, largely about spearfishing and spearfishing contests. And then in January of 1963, my father rode a whale. My dad was off of La Jolla uh, diving with friends, and they saw a whale in the distance. Uh, we saw whales all the time. Gray whales went close to the coast uh, going north and south on their migration. But this wasn't a gray whale. It was a Brutus whale, and it wasn't going anywhere because he was caught up into the anchor line of a gill net. My father got in the water with a camera and one of his buddies with the spear guns to swim up and photograph and film the whale. Uh, this was before whales were gentle giants. It was a big, powerful animal and they weren't sure what was going to happen. It was really a, a, a big adventure and, and uh, uh, thought to be fairly dangerous at the time. And after they had photographed the whale and filmed the whale, uh, the whale was very calm, and my father swam up and actually got on the whale's back and, and had his picture taken by his friend Bill DeCourt. Uh, they took their pictures to Rolla Williams, a sports editor at the San Diego Union, uh, and he was someone you'd take a picture of a big fish or a big lobster to. It was good advertising for the, the dive shop, but the pictures were really popular. They ran into the San Diego Union and, and across the country. And, and it probably would have stopped right there except they had movies. They had 16 millimeter movies, which was a big deal at the time. And there was a young man with a variety show after the late news in San Diego, a very young Regis Philbin, who had my dad on to show his, his film, to show the pictures of whales underwater on film. Uh, after the show, they took that film, they sent it to New York and to a produ production company called Goodson Todman Productions. And one of their shows was To Tell the Truth. Three people came on telling a wild story. One of them was telling the truth. My father went to New York. Uh, he was the guy on To Tell the Truth, telling the real story. And uh, 
in the audience, in the TV audience, was Bates Little Hales. He was the underwater guy for National Geographic in the 50s and 60s. Uh, he looked up my father. Uh, he'd been thinking about doing whales underwater, and my father was a whale expert. He'd seen one. Seeing that first whale uh, led to all kinds of things for my father. He became the go-to second guy on whale projects. Uh, uh, one of the first documentaries on humpback whales, Gentle Giants of the Pacific. He started working for National Geographic on a number of projects, but especially the first big uh, humpback whale story in 1979. This was the story with uh, the small record, Songs of the Humpback Whale, that sort of introduced singing humpback whales to the world. And he came to Hawaii on an IMAX film, Nomads of the Deep, the first underwater IMAX film. I tried to find a picture of my first underwater camera, but it was so old, like even on eBay I couldn't find a picture. But this is the camera I use now. It's a Nikon D850, we got a big dome, it's a CNC housing, it works all the time. And uh, I think this year I'm gonna use a 20 on it, and uh, it's, uh, boy, it's sure a lot better. It shoots about the equivalent of 150 plus rolls of 35 millimeter film without opening up the back and worrying about dripping into it when you're changing film. It was really Bates Little Hales that got me interested in photography and introduced me to the world of National Geographic and National Geographic assignment photography. When I was going out with uh, Bates and my dad, uh, usually driving small boats and pulling anchors, once in a while he'd let me borrow a camera and take a picture. And at the end, I got to, I was teaching uh, diving, scuba diving, to geographic photographers and writers in San Diego. So I was teaching uh, scuba diving and running a dive shop in San Diego when one of my students, Jonathan Blair, invited me to come for three months to the Northwest Hawaiian chain to be an assistant on a story for National Geographic. I got two pictures published in the magazine from that story, and I never came back to the diving locker. I was going to try and make a living with a camera. I took all kinds of oddball jobs, uh, photographing science in the oil industry, got a few pictures published in National Geographic, but it was about three years before things started to really make sense for me. The first proposal I sent in that was accepted by National Geographic was to do sharks and shark research. And then I met Dr. Jim Darling and a whale named Frank. The first whale picture I shot that became popular was of my father with a humpback whale as we were shooting the IMAX film Nomads of the Deep in 1979 off of Lahaina. Most of the whales we were filming were curious whales, whales that came up to us, whales we called friendlies. And then on March 10th, 1979, we were called over by Dr. Jim Darling to photograph Frank. Uh, we drifted over in slack uh, and uh, looked down and, and saw something. And sure enough, um, it was a whale. And at, at that point, we realized that, you know, oh my, oh my, you know, I mean, these singers are, are diving as if they're going to go down to the bottom, but they get, you know, 10, 30, 40 feet below the surface and just stop. And with the visibility there, you know, being double that, you could, you know, especially if it was a lighter colored singer or it had white on the flippers, you could see it from the boat. You know, you guys were in the neighborhood and were able to come over and film it. And that just changed everything. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, we weren't just recording songs and trying to understand what they were doing. Uh, when they were singing, we could actually locate and watch and film and study the individual that was doing the singing and uh, realize that we could actually learn something here. And, and that, that led to me changing my PhD from studying gray whales to uh, humpback whales and uh, just a whole bunch of other things happened. You know, was it, you know, 
both sexes with some, you know, males and females, or was it just males? And realization that we could go out and actually find these animals on a daily basis. And then, um, you know, with uh, your abilities to uh, get down there and take photographs of them, uh, you know, the objective in 1980 was simply to find as many singers as we could find and uh, uh, take as many photographs as we could of their underside and uh, determine whether they were males or females. Working that closely with the animals though led to all kinds of other uh, encounters and, and interactions with whales doing, you know, behavior, social behavior patterns and so on. And uh, all of a sudden there were a million questions to answer and we knew that we could answer them. I had some of your photographs and I showed them at this meeting and there were people there who were, who simply could not believe it, that you could both locate and get close to and photograph whales at sea, um, <laughs> like we did. They, they really couldn't grasp. I mean, I, I, people come up afterward and say, how, how did you do that? And, and these were, you know, old time sort of biologists who, you know, we we're only a few years, uh, you know, ahead of them because a few years back, we would have probably asked the same question. I was saying we were fortunate enough to be in Maui with such good conditions and it probably allowed us a bit of a head start on some of this stuff. And no, no one realized um, that these whales were actually competing with each other or fighting with each other. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't really know what they were doing. Um, and uh, I remember one day, it was Greg Silver, we were out in the, bo in the boat and uh, we were with a group and he was uh, watching what was going underwater by hanging over the boat uh, with a mask on. He came up and he was just astounded that he'd just seen one whale hit another one. And, and there was this sort of aggressive, uh, competitive type behavior going on. It was a complete revelation at the time. I mean the whole sort of nature of what was going on out there and in fact the nature of whales changed with just uh, you know one really good observation which sort of opened the doors to sort of us realizing what we've been watching for a long time. After the first few years of taking pictures sort of as an aside to recording songs, I don't know, we had three, you know, a few hundred whales. And uh, I had actually tried to give it away, <laughs> the, the, the cataloging. Uh, nobody really seemed to want it, so I carried on and it became the basis of my PhD. One of the questions which arose was we, we kept on taking pictures and counting the individuals. And uh, we found that the number of you know, whales we actually photographed was larger than some of the estimates for the number of whales in Hawaii um, overall, and of course, it was a bit of a, um, a contradiction there because we certainly weren't identifying all the animals. And we came up with a population estimate of, well, somewhere around a thousand whales, which was uh, made a lot more sense uh, at that time than the, you know, the couple hundred which uh, people were talking about. When I came to Hawaii in 1979, on the IMAX film, and my dad had just done the natural history documentary, Gentle Giants of the Pacific, that focused on how nice whales were and they wanted to be friendly and they liked people. And then I'm out with Jim and he's going, get the pictures of the bloody head knobs, they're beating the heck out of each other out here. And you go, there, there's a big move between save the whales and, and the popular support and love of whales and the, the, the mystery of the song and what science was seeing, and not that, that the first is wrong, they are curious, they're wonderful, they're beautiful, and they do all kinds of interesting stuff. And I think basically I saw my career was gonna be taking that interest, interest of whales, that love of whales, and moving it towards some of the other interesting things that science is finding out that's usually years ahead of the popular narrative and telling those stories. The idea that researchers were excited about seeing and studying new things about whales, new behavior about whales, is what got me excited about whale photography. And the timing was great. Researchers were 
really just starting to work with wild whales and learn how to study them. And I was trying to figure out how to make that a story with pictures. And about this time, the Nikona's 15 millimeter lens came out. A small camera with a wide lens, which allowed me to free dive and get closer to whales. It made a giant difference in the pictures I could take. At that point, I was shooting Kodachrome, and we could take the uh, film, and if we got it in by 3 o'clock to a Photoshop across from a Space Invader parlor in downtown Lahaina, we'd get it back at 8 o'clock the next morning, and I'd be there with the scientific crew uh, standing on the street in downtown Lahaina holding up 35-millimeter slides just to see if we got anything. Film exposure was so critical on Kodachrome that we would bracket our exposure, so even if you did everything right, only about a third of the pictures came out properly exposed. I came back to Maui in 1980 as part of the scientific crew, mostly diving under singing humpback whales and shooting pictures of their bellies. And at the end of that season, National Geographic, uh, actually Mary Smith, asked me to come back to the office in Washington and talk about a whale story. And this led me to going back in 1981, having my own place to live, driving a rental car, having my expenses covered, and being paid. And in 1982, in April, the article on a new light on the singing whales came out in National Geographic. And uh, I didn't know it, but I was on my way to being the whale guy for National Geographic. I, uh, I, I wish anybody could be as excited as I was to get my byline in the first National Geographic story and, uh, and all the things that came with it back in 1982, including secondary sales of pictures, which was a big, big deal at the time. And uh, you know there were Italian rights and Spanish rights and all these secondary rights. But the most interesting secondary sale I probably ever made was after that 1982 story. And I got a call from J. Walter Thompson, an advertising company in New York City. And they said, we've seen your story. We love your work especially this picture of the mother and calf humpback whale. We'd like to buy it. We have a client that wants that picture. He just doesn't want any whales in it. I thought he was kidding, but he wasn't. And they were ready to send me back to Hawaii to go out there and shoot the same blue water streaks without the whale in it when I found one picture in the yellow boxes in the throwaways where I'd missed the whale, and that was good enough. That picture sold for a month's assignment pay for National Geographic, and, uh, and my world had changed dramatically. I was going to cover research stories on whales and dolphins for the magazine for the next 27 years. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful job. But in my world, in the world of whale research, I wasn't the whale guy. I was doing stories about the, uh, the whale guys, the men and women who did research on uh, whales and dolphins and spent uh, years for my weeks in uh, looking and living with the animals and trying to know them better. And uh, it was a great, great group to work with. Uh, inspirational people doing what jobs that were thought to be impossible back in the 70s, learning about the lives of wild whales and dolphins. Especially memorable was work done with uh, Dr. Ken Norris after he retired from UC Santa Cruz. We did stories on dolphins and a story on belugas in the high Arctic. And uh, they were interesting, interesting people to work with. So I was a free diving photographer from San Diego and had done my first big story on whales in Hawaii. The water's nice and warm, it's a beautiful place to work. So the next assignment I got from National Geographic was to do krill in very, very cold water. Most of the animals we were working with were very, very small shrimp-like critters, and most of the work was done in southern Chile or Antarctica. So I was learning a lot. But luckily, part of the krill story was going to be in killer whale country in Vancouver Island, and it was going to be a way to get a first look and a chance to maybe shoot a killer whale story for the magazine. This led to my second whale story, The Whale's Called Killer, uh, working with uh, Mike Big and John Ford. 
and it was going to lead to my next whale story. I just didn't know it. Uh, narwhal, unicorn of the Arctic seas, and getting me a kid from the beaches of San Diego, an introduction to a whole different world. The assignment began to northern Baffin Island with a group from the Vancouver Aquarium. We went out out of Pond Inlet out to the flow edge where the ice stops and the ocean begins. This group only had a couple of days out there and then had to go back, but my guide said that was fine. I could stay there, hope to get pictures. He'd go drop them off and come right back that day. Well, he was gone for three days, and I was in a place that was really different than San Diego trying to figure things out. 24-hour uh, sun, uh, doing everything wrong at the wrong times, worrying about polar bears a lot and sleeping with that big shotgun in the background. I woke up and heard my tent moving around and uh, also the zipper got to be undone and uh, I had poked in. It was Sigluk Akiaguk, an Inuit uh, from Greece Fjord, and he looked at it and said, you have to leave. I said, no, no, I, I'm okay. I'm uh, with National Geographic. I have all the right permits. And he said, no, where you are is not going to be here tomorrow. You have to leave. And I did. With his help, we moved about 12 miles away onto solid ground. And after I, I woke up there, looked out, and the ice I'd been on had broken off and moved away. And I realized I had a lot to learn. The second trip out to the flow edge was out of Arctic Bay with Glenn Williams, a renewable resource officer from that small hamlet. And he introduced me to Oyukaluk and his grandson, Andrew Tuktu. Andrew's guiding skills and Glenn's great advice would be key to any success I was going to have in my work in the high Arctic. And we would have some great adventures over the next decade or decade and a half. And over the years, life on the flow edge became uh, almost normal. Well, normal with still plenty of adventure included. But for all I was learning, I wasn't getting any narwhal pictures. Most of the time I saw whales too far away, and almost always, just when I was figuring out what I should be doing, it was too late to do it. I, I could see the potential, but I sure wasn't going to get it this season. After three and a half months in the field, the film review I got was nothing usable yet. It was late summer during open water and towards the end of our time when John Ford, the researcher I was working with, came and got us and said, you should come and see this. There were narwhals, they were on the surface, they were fighting and their tusks were coming up. It turned out to be a uh, dying female and a couple of young males with her and other males coming in and a fight going on underwater. We were working out of two-man kayaks. The narwhals wouldn't tolerate any engine noise around them. And when things were quiet, I couldn't get in the water because the whales would just drift away. The only time I could get anywhere near them underwater was when the fight was actually going on. When I got in the water in the midst of the fight, You'd see the female floating on the surface and the young males fighting off group after group of bigger males coming in uh, wanting access to the female. Uh, the Trying to get close, one of the young males came up and put his tusk aimed right at my chest. You could feel the little sonic clicks as he was trying to figure out who I was. He was just there for a second. It's amazing how many bad things you can think about in that second. Then he went, went back on to the fight. I mean, it looked like a fight in a pool hall with everybody swinging these clubs. The animals later on, uh, when we had them out for a necropsy of the dead female, were all sliced up from tusk moves, and the female had been speared with a tusk. This fight went on for at least seven hours. It was the uh, basis for the whole National Geographic story on narwhals, uh, probably the hardest story I ever did. The story also opened the door for more than a decade's work I would have uh, with narwhals and other animals in the high Arctic. This work started in the mid-80s. There wasn't uh, a lot of interest in the communities to have people come in. There had been some bad experiences. They wanted to make sure the people that came in would respect them and their culture. And there wasn't that much interest really from, uh, from us to go north. Uh, I think there was some surprise that I kept wanting to go back, but there were so many great stories to tell. These stories really weren't 
natural history stories at their core. Uh, there are stories about research, there are stories about uh, uh, different cultural looks at whales, and that idea that uh, the same whale was looked at a number of different ways. All this largely depended on where you were and who you were with. The more time I spent in the Arctic looking for whales and other wildlife, the more stories I could see. My free diving and underwater photography is certainly what got me in the door at National Geographic in 1976. But most of these stories had that as a very small component, trying to tell the story with what I could do, not just underwater pictures. It was really whatever pictures, whatever it took to tell the story. We were giving lots of time, very little direction, and mainly we were explorers to go out there and find new things, take new pictures, and share them in National Geographic. And when you went and didn't find what you were looking for, didn't find what you expected, that that was a good thing. All was to find those things you didn't expect. And with subjects like whales and the Arctic, and whales in the Arctic, there was plenty of that. I had great adventures in the Arctic over a, a pretty long time. Uh, it was a wonderful experience, and I'll forever be grateful for the people who took care of me up there and uh, let me be a uh, pretty successful visitor. And of course, it wasn't just the Arctic. For those 27 years, I was visiting researchers, people working on whales and dolphins around the world, and uh, able to work with people doing a job that uh, they were passionate about, and it was going to get better. After 20 years of knocking around, doing stories around the world, working with all these great people, it wasn't lost on me that the first place I worked in Hawaii with whales was a pretty nice place to work. And I had a really good set of events, largely because of my longtime agent, Larry Minden. I had a chance to sell my photo collection and had some other windfalls, so I got sort of, for the really first time, sort of financially ahead enough that I went back to Jim Darling and said, let's take some of this money, go back to Hawaii and see if it's worth going back and continuing research there, which may be one of the animals we'll really get to know with the science and with photography. Jim Darling and I came back to Maui in 1996, and the first year it was two guys and a borrowed boat, thanks to Mark Robinson. Uh, the next year we were part of a BBC film, and uh, we bought a boat that never satisfied. It wasn't new, but it was ours. And by 1999, it wasn't just two guys and an old boat. We also had Megan Jones to join the operation. And in 1999, National Geographic did my second story on humpback whales, listening to humpbacks, based on new studies since our return to Maui. It became clear at that time that if we were to continue and do the things we hoped to do, we needed a more straightforward nonprofit status in the United States. And so, in 2001, uh, Jim Darling, Megan Jones, and, and Flip Nicklin, that's me, and an old boat called Never Satisfied became Whale Trust. Our funding came from a little money from BBC when they were working with us, some support from National Ge Geographic magazine, uh, quite a bit of support from National Geographic's Grosvenor Council and direct donations from Maui and, and far beyond. And sharing our story with the community and asking for their, for their support was going to become a big part of Whale Trust. We came back to Maui in the mid-90s. I was still shooting film, but, but the cameras were much better. We had uh, autofocus and auto exposure and uh, automatic bracketing, so your percentage of pictures that worked out was much, much better. And there were a lot more whales. And the star of 1998 was a whale we just called the Friendly Singer. This was a great whale. The whale would go down and sing for 20 minutes or so, then come up and hang around the boat, look at the hydrophone, 
rub at the hydrophone. At one point, had it under his pectoral, trying to drag the uh, the whole recording gear and Jim into the water. Then he'd go down to sing again for another 20 minutes, and then come back and hang around under the boat. One of the great things about this whale was that he would go down and sing for those 20 minutes in the days of film when you only had 36 exposures. So when he'd go down, I could get in the boat, change film, and sometimes even change lenses, and you get a whole different look when you switch off those ultra-wide lenses that we usually use underwater for shooting whale. But the best part of the friendly singer was that he was still hanging around the boat when he was joined by another whale. And this was another male. And what we've learned since then is singers are joined by other males and not by females, as often thought. But giant changes were coming to photography at the turn of the century with digital photography, uh, making remote photography easier, and giving a whole bunch of new tools for trying to capture images and tell the science story about whales. By 2001, we were getting used to digital photography in the form of uh, consumer video. So we had gear on board to capture special moments, special days when we saw whales do new and exciting things. Now we just had to shoot movies and figure out what to do with them. At about this time, we were introduced to a young man, Jason Sturgis, who wanted to come with us and shoot video with us. And, uh, He's been a tremendous addition to Whale Trust and now worked with us for over 20 years. I think it had been six weeks before we had a really good day with Jason and uh, he had to shoot the things he dreamed of shooting. Uh, since then, uh, in those 20 years, we've had many great days and his video really adds to our ability to tell the, to tell the story. Things were changing very quickly in underwater photography I had a different system each year for the first three years I was shooting digital, but each one was better than the last. And now I was shooting still photography and with Jason shooting video and with the cameras getting better and better, uh, photography became a more important tool to tell the story of whales and whale research with Whale Trust. In the early days, you're sort of dependent on photographers and filmmakers coming along for relatively short periods to try and tell a story of whales that hopefully included the work the research was doing. The new tools, the new cameras, uh, both still cameras and video cameras, allow research to tell their own story. And that's a big, big difference. And as the science of whales became better and better equipped, so did uh, digital photography. That first camera was six megapixels. My most recent camera is over 45 megapixels. That first camera, you could only shoot four pictures before you had to stop. Now it's more than 50. It was great that we had new tools because there were new stories to tell. Uh, Megan Jones brought to Whale Trust a study of female role on the breeding ground. Uh, starting with uh, the role of, of long diving females and, uh, and the question, what are they doing down there? This led to the story in National Geographic magazine in 2007 titled, uh, appropriately, What Are They Doing Down There? My role at Whale Trust is documenting uh, behavioral research on humpback whales. It'll uh, be my 27th year starting in January. Sharing what we learn uh, in scientific publications and popular publications, uh, sharing with film crews as they come through, and getting the word out in ways that uh, I really didn't imagine until I came to work at Whale Trust. In 2006, we started Whale Tales, a weekend in Kapalua where we would share research we were doing and others were doing in Maui and beyond and asking for public support. This has continued even during the pandemic with a virtual version that we've done for the last two years. But this year, we'll be live again, back to doing whale tales in Kapalua at the Ritz-Carlton. And in the 20 months I was at home in Alaska during the pandemic, I started telling stories uh, through Whale Trust called Humpback Chronicles, stories and adventures around whale research.
And of course, photography is a big part of all of these efforts, and not just mine. Uh, we have a new member of our group, uh, Ralph Pace, who's uh, working with us and has for seven years now. Ralph is a tremendous photographer. Ralph and his family live right here in Monterey. And she's really not new to us. She's been working with us since she was a kid. But Haley Rob Spears, uh, now a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz, uh, adds to the scientific component and also uh, takes some really interesting pictures along the way with the GoPro on a pole. From here, I head back to Maui. We'll be working once again with Jim and Megan. Uh, I'll go out on the boat most days with Jason and Haley and Ralph. And on the documentary boat, on the good days, we'll still be swimming with whales and telling their stories. We missed the 21 season because of the pandemic, but we were back this year. And uh, we didn't know it, but bubbles were going to be a big part of this year. And on uh, January 28th, we had this little calf that wouldn't go back to mom when she went down. She just swam around the boat and for some reason blew bubbles over and over again. And uh, it was just a, a happy whale picture and a, a great way to be back in Hawaii. And it turns out there's a scientific publication about bubble blowing this month coming out. And what we've been seeing for 20 years, but finally got enough to do a peer review publication on it, is that male humpback whales give bubble baths to female humpback whales. <laughs> we call it unofficially the California jacuzzi move, <laughs> but it's out as a scientific publication this year. And, and that idea that when you come in, however you're drawn into the narrative of whales, there are a couple things I should say. In 1980, I sent a proposal to do whales to National Geographic and was told, no, we've done whales. That was 18 whale stories ago. <laughs> and, and at the same time, two years ago, someone asked Jim Darling at a conference, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do we know about humpback whales? And without a moment's blinking time, he said, oh, way less than 1. This isn't the end of the story. This is the beginning of the story. And I'll tell you right now that all the things you know about whales are just not even beginning to see all the cool things that they do. And you're five years behind stuff that's going to come out. That's all makes whales, especially humpback whales, a really different animal. And in 1963, after they'd filmed the whale and photographed the whale and set on the back of the whale, my father dove down to take the line off the tail of the whale. And I asked him if he still remembered and what he thought about that. On the last dive, when we cut the whale free, it was, it was just, I think the whale was, it was as excited as I was. And the whale could swim away, and we just on the surface and saw him dive, and, and then all of a sudden he came to the surface, and, and spouted and was going away. And we I felt I, we did something good. Thanks, Dad. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, he's watching. Thank you. I really want to thank. Uh, I, I, I can't thank all the people I should, but National Geographic invented me and gave me so much freedom to be what I became. Whale Trust is a great place to end up where I am today, and uh, I'm a really happy camper. Limblad Expeditions for being my sponsor and for getting me around all kinds of cool places and traveling with my wife when I was doing it. And Optic West and B&H for having me here today and all of you, thank you very, very much. Since, since and you can come with us. I'm sorry. 
Let's do a little Q&A. We get a little bit of time on that. Uh, we've got Emmanuel we have, has a microphone. This gentleman over here has a, a question. We're going to give Emmanuel his exercise today. Boy, that was a whale of a good presentation, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Flip, um, I, I noticed now Tonga, uh, Morea, a lot of places are opening up so where you can swim. Well, I'll tell you right now where the name came from. Oh, I'm sorry, you got, I'm, I'm sorry. I, oh. uh, so I don't my, hear very well. Oh. <laughs> so I was saying like in Tonga, Morea, and you're seeing other places where you can go swim with whales. Do you think that'll happen in Maui? Tell me, I don't okay, hear very sure. well. Sorry, if you could repeat your question one more so, time. So my question was the, the, the ability for tourists to go swim with whales and photograph them is starting to open up worldwide. Do you see that happening in Maui? It's a really good question. I mean, all the stuff we do, and you saw the little permit things there, are under permit for research and education. And uh, it's a political question. You know, I mean, it is, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a great thing. I wish everybody could, could be in the water and have a whale swim up to them. And that first story I did on sharks was great, and sharks are really important. But what you get looking in the eye of a whale or a dolphin is so different than what you get looking in the eye of a shark. It's a really, really special thing. And plus, sharks still scare me a little bit. Hi, I have a question. You said that there's a lot of stuff that we still don't know about whales. We won't know for another five years. What is it that you can give us a heads up on, on something that's really interesting that they do? Altruistic humpback whales. Humpback whales, you've seen the pictures in the Antarctic of uh, killer whales washing seals off of an ice floe. Humpback whales go in there and pick the seals up on their belly and say, come and get them. Humpback whales in Norway, when killer whales are herding herring into a group, steal the herring from killer whales. And killer whales right out here in Monterey, when, when, when they're going after uh, baby gray whales, Humpbacks have been coming in and breaking up the at attempted kill. So humpbacks, for, for non, not even the same species, are going in and causing trouble for predators. What is that all about? But it sure makes them an interesting animal. Thanks, folks. OK, <laughs> thank you so much. OK, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a one-hour lunch break. Feel free to grab some lunch right local around here. Or if you want to uh, go take some photographs in our macro stations, bring them to the workflow area, then bring them over to the pushpin gallery, and you could be winners. Thank you.
Introducing the new Paybu credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your Paybu credit card. So you want to save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The B&H Paybu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over 6 or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new Paybu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either Paybu savings or special financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved Paybu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new Paybu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today. This is a brief history of B&H, everyone's favorite photo and video store. The year was 1973. The Mets went to the World Series. The first cell phone call was made. And Bleamy and Herman opened a specialty photography shop at 17 Warren Street, New York City. They had a simple philosophy. Be honest, treat people right, and they will come back. Thanks, Irving. Also, free candy, and it worked. Over the next 20 years, we expanded and moved to West 17th Street, then 34th Street and 9th Avenue, and added more products. Lighting, binoculars, telescopes, audio, video, tripods, computers, printers, mobile, televisions, projectors, drones, and even more free candy. Now it's three stories on over 400,000 products and over 1,000 employees. We take millions of orders online and ship to 179 countries and counting. You can talk to us in person, on the phone, B&H, how can I help you? Or online. Check out our checkout baskets. Also check out our checkout numbers. Also check out the flare on Marais vest. And everyone's favorite part, our conveyor belt. The benefit of the conveyor belt is you don't have to worry about the product or schlep it around anymore until checkout. Nice. These are the owners. They still come to work every day. They're around here somewhere. Anyway, this is Jeanette. Oh, sorry, she's busy. This is our warehouse. This is Yakov and Levy fighting over lighting kits. B&H is not a chain. B&H is open every day, except Saturdays, of course. Now you know almost the whole story. We are B&H. Alpha.
Its extreme environment over time has shaped the landscape itself, it's shaped the animals that live here, and it has very much shaped its human history. You really do feel when you're here like you're living on the edge of the world. We're in some of the most beautiful fjords that exist on the planet. We're always looking to find polar bears, and already, as we have dropped our anchor, we have seen several. It's barren and rich at the same time, and that's what I find amazing. Monstrous amounts of seabirds here, nesting in the millions. Iceland really is the land of fire and ice. Oh. It's the land, it's the sea, it's the atmosphere. It's really what the Arctic is all about. Our voyage together explores where the desert meets the sea. This whole set of mangroves right here is a roosting area and a nesting area for magnificent frigates. Wow, how cool to be back here. Today we traveled north through Hull Canal, which is an incredibly narrow channel. Here's a place we have the opportunity to see moms and calves, some of them just a few weeks old. <laughs> it's a fantastically warm and wonderful day here in Baja, and we're seeing incredible behavior from these gray whales. I had no idea how beautiful this place was going to be. It's really quite unimaginable until you've been here. We are in the isthmus of Central America. It's one of the most diverse places on our planet. We're very lucky to get to walk the best kept tropical rainforest in Mesoamerica. Cool is that, huh? We were just hiking and we saw six macaws, which was absolutely awesome. The fish were outrageously beautiful. Schools of fish, little tiny things, yellow striped. Ah! Oh, that's great. I love it. <laughs> Running in the Panama Canal is one of the more exciting parts of my job. I just see uh, mechanics behind it. I mean, the technology just keeps improving. Definitely the high point. Everything is so special in this part of the world. Welcome to the journey that will change your life. This is a strange, beautiful, remarkable place. The word unique absolutely applies here. There are so many creatures that exist nowhere else on Earth. In the middle of the equator, isolated from the rest of the world, here, animals don't show concern to the observers. It's something that you will never forget. We're with the giant tortoises, and we're walking through their natural home. My inner child is just like, yes! <laughs> Galapagos, you never know what to expect, and I've often said that every single week, something new happens. Look at this landing one. Don't move, everybody, don't move. It's gonna pass by next to us. It's just awesome. It will never leave you if you go to the Galapagos Islands. You will have stories for the rest of your life, I promise you. As a photographer who works with National Geographic, it's such a privilege and an honor to be able to bring the National Geographic audience to visit some of the most remote spots on the planet investigating the native plants, looking for endemic birds. Manta ray coming straight at us, straight ahead of us now, you can see them. It was amazing, it was beautiful. Sharp ridge lines and peaks that are so defining for these islands. People are going back to their history and finding ways to renew that. So those layers of history in the present day, you know, are visible in the everyday lives of the people that we're meeting. I've never seen anything like it. It's most pure in a way, because nobody's here. This is the postcard that we all buy or dream of going to see. This is a brief history of B&H, everyone's favorite photo and video store. The year was 1973. The Mets went to the World Series. The first cell phone call was made. 
and Bleamy and Herman opened a specialty photography shop at 17 Warren Street, New York City. They had a simple philosophy. Be honest, treat people right, and they will come back. Thanks, Irving. Also, free candy, and it worked. Over the next 20 years, we expanded and moved to West 17th Street, then 34th Street and 9th Avenue, and added more products. Lighting, binoculars, telescopes, audio, video, tripods, computers, printers, mobile, televisions, projectors, drones, and even more free candy. Now it's three stories and over 400,000 products and over 1,000 employees. We take millions of orders online and ship to 179 countries and counting. You can talk to us in person, on the phone, DNA can I help you? Or online. Check out our checkout baskets. Also check out our checkout numbers. Also check out the flare on Marais' vest. And everyone's favorite part, our conveyor belt. The benefit of the conveyor belt is you don't have to worry about the product or schlep it around anymore until checkout. Nice. These are the owners. They still come to work every day. They're around here somewhere. Anyway, this is Jeanette. Oh, sorry, she's busy. This is our warehouse. This is Yakov and Levy fighting over lighting kits. b &H is not a chain. b &H is open every day, except Saturdays, of course. Now you know almost the whole story. We are b &H. This is a real b &H customer story. OK, we checked all four systems, and then team was a go. The b &H we help folks find the products they need. Isn't that right, Irving? Yes, definitely. We need to be ready for whatever the customer needs, even when, especially when the items are rare. So true. Could you give us an example, Irving? We help millions of customers all over the world. Come on, just one example? Well, there was NASA. NASA? NASA. What's the big deal? We have everyone, big and small. So what did NASA need? A unique Hasselblad lens for a space mission. I guess no one else had it, but we did. But we often have what others don't. Love it. What else can you tell us about this story? That is the story. Copy that, Irving. And thank you for sharing. For all your needs, big or small, check out bnh.com. Can I go back to work now? <laughs> this is a real BH customer story. Steph Mandis came to BH to take her photography to the next level. She's an artist by choice, pizza maker by birth, and BH customer for life. Am I missing anything here? Teacher, entrepreneur, product designer, and a photographer. And a restaurateur. I forgot that part. <laughs> Impressive. Steph, I gotta be honest, I don't know where to look first. Is that a microscope? Yeah, that's my uh, trinocular axiolab, and that's what I use to make bioart. Bioart? What's that? Bioart is where science and art meet. Uh, amazing. So what came first, the camera or the microscope? So first came the microscope, then the camera, and thankfully, that's where B&H stepped in. When I first went to B&H trying to find a camera for my microscope, I thought it was a little oddball request, but turns out they've done this before and they knew exactly what I was looking for. What's great about working with people at B&H is that they use the gear that they're selling you. So what are you looking at now? Cheese, sauce, peppers, onions, olives, pizza toppings. Hmm, I'm sensing a theme here. Uh, yeah, my family started a pizza restaurant in 1960. Whoa, 60 years of pizza, what's the secret? We use cheddar cheese. Huh. Okay. So what's next for you, Steph? I want to take this tiny thing that I've been looking at and blow it up using projectors. I just have to figure out what equipment I need. I like where this is going. So B and H, you know, we're gonna we're gonna talk again. Steph, we're always here when you need us. And be sure to save me a slice. For your next project, head to the experts at bnh.com. Oh yeah, I've definitely put him under the microscope. <laughs> Cat fur looks crazy. <laughs> Fred Smith here told us the b &H photo helped change his life. Fred, tell us your story. I was a fitness instructor in Atlanta, and I transferred to New York March 13, 2020, right as the city went under lockdown. Oof, that's rough timing. All the studios shut down. But with b and hs help, I started Workout with Fred. It's an online fitness platform with cycling classes and off-the-bike classes taught by me. Talk about lemons to lemonade. As I started looking for equipment, everybody I spoke to was pointing me to b &H. I needed a camera, a lens, microphone, capture card, audio interface. Whoa, Fred, we're running out of room here. <laughs> well, here's the thing. That setup is really complicated, and that's where b &H came in. I felt like every expert I spoke to had been in my shoes before, whether I was on the chat or I called. Anytime I had a question, they had a solution. I was like, ah, I wish I'd called you earlier. We're always here for you, Fred. Say, where do you film all this? Let me show you. 
My living room is essentially a recording studio. Everything in here, except for the couch and the TV, are laid out so that I can do my recording. Amazing. What's next for you, Fred? One of the things I wanted to do for years was start a video podcast. So I started something called Join the Convo. We discuss important topics in a safe space. Fred, you're a real mensch. Thank you for sharing your B&H story with us. If you're thinking of starting a virtual business like Fred, check out bnh.com. This is a real B&H customer story. Jack and Barbara, professional wildlife photographers and B&H customers for 30 years, live in remote Alaska. Hey, what's the population there? About 50 to 52 people and bears. We're definitely not in New York anymore. It's just quiet here. It's beautiful. The wildlife photography out here is amazing. While they could order equipment from any number of sites, they don't. Anytime we need anything, B&H is our go-to. We can send an email. We have used the chat feature and, of course, the phone if our phones are working. If the phones are working. Hi, Jack. What can I help you with? I needed a tripod, and it had to be light, it had to be sturdy, so I talked with somebody at B&H. I think his name is Charles, and he pointed me toward a certain tripod and liked it so much that I bought a second one. Nice one, Charles. When it comes to getting gear, things were shipped quickly, packed well, made it through the harrowing journey, going from plane to smaller plane to somebody's hand thrown to somebody else, put in the back of a truck, and arrives unscathed. That's quite the schlep. It must be incredible when it gets there. Oh, it's it's like Christmas. I mean, honestly, it's better than Christmas. Yeah, it's I, my birthday. B&H has everything that we need. I mean, when have we ever looked for something and it wasn't available? Well, there was bananas. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> bananas indeed. Wherever you live, B&H is ready to help. Chat, email, and if your phones are working, give us a call. This is a story about a magical place where everything's amazing, especially the people. We can tell you everything there is to know about over 400,000 different pieces of gear. Tell them, Lenny. And we have a 17 millimeter, 24 millimeter, 45 millimeter. He does this all day. We'll help you find the right thing, which is often not the most expensive. The A9 is great, but I think the 6500 is better for what you need. That's pretty rare. And just like you, we love to explore and share our passion because we're creators as well. Israel and Jake like to make videos for the web. Oh, I love it when he does this. Oh, by the way, if you can't meet us in person, you can always chat with us online. Think of us as collaborators, production partners, problem solvers. This is Greg. He's made five gold records. Can you play your voice high? And here's Jay, the king of the candidates. Wait, 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 I'm not ready, Jay. Sometimes we geek out and help each other, but mostly we're here to help you. Like Lenny, who's still going, because there's a lot to say when you're making some pretty important decisions. So now you've met 16 of over 1,000 employees. 16 reasons our customers like to do business with people, not algorithms. We are B&H. Introducing the new Paybu credit card. You can save the tax, or choose special financing for your purchases made on your Paybu credit card. So you want to save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The B&H Paybu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over 6 or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new Paybu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either Paybu savings or special financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in-store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved Paybu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new Paybu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today.
Introducing the new Paybu credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your Paybu credit card. So you want to save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The B&H Paybu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over 6 or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new Paybu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either Paybu savings or special financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in-store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved Paybu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new Paybu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today. Build a bonfire right now. That's just any bonfire. Any bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> This morning we're at Grindle Island and it's the most amazing forest and a perfect place to really try out our photographic skills. We've been looking at the dappled light and how to cope with that in the forest, but also zooming in and getting those amazing macro shots of the ferns and the growth of the ferns. You also have these trees here, the Sitka spruce, the hemlock, which has this incredible patterns and allows you to be able to get almost abstract photography out of the rainforest. So we've been learning about how to shoot with this dappled light. A couple of different techniques we've been learning around. HDR, which allows you to be able to cope with the bright light as well as the dark light. We've also been looking at just the angle of the light. Where is the light coming from? And focusing on taking photographs into the shadows so that you don't get that big contrast, as well as trying to look for rays of sunshine to light up the forest. So the thing that interests me the most about exchanging with cultures around the world is this idea, well, the core idea of storytelling in general. I look at storytelling as, as this ancient tradition that's been around for 10,000 years or more. I look at it as an honor to be part of that tradition today. But as part of the storytelling process, I think it's about exchanging, about learning, about intuitively experiencing people in parts of the world and being part of the process to interpret it and translate it through a different medium. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not just about me going there and telling the story, it's actually about um, the person I'm engaging in the story with and the audience itself. Getting the opportunity to get a glimpse into other people's worlds, into other people's lives, is absolutely a privilege. We should never expect that we can just show up and, and get these opportunities. It's something that's, that's given, it's a gift. Um, but when we do share, I think it opens up the minds and hearts of, of everyone involved.
After wet landing, we got ready with our camera gear to practice some of the wildlife photography available here in the Enchanted Archipelago. A very interesting and important tip for wildlife photography is to anticipate the action, and that's when the naturalists kick in pretty well. We come in because we do know the behavior of the wildlife, and we tell our guests to be ready with the cameras because something's about to happen. Noses together again. I really enjoyed the photography walks, how to anticipate a shot, how to compose a shot. And as I was taking photos, the, the sea lion came right up to me. So that was an incredible experience. My name is Bill Wansnyder, and I like to photograph textures. Some texture pictures I found really interesting here was the coral. And on the shore, walking along the beach, was where I could start to then photograph them with my iPhone. And you could start to see all these cool patterns that existed. And then as you enlarge them, there was even more cool patterns that start to unfold. And then every single one of those coral, even if it's, say, the same type of brain coral, for instance, they all had different patterns that were in them, almost like within the, say, the patterns that you might see in somebody's fingerprint. As I look around, I've got a couple more days here in Belize, and I know that there's going to be some other really cool textures that I'm going to be able to see, and a wonderful chance for me to explore another part of the world. We are here at Dinyandi Waterfall and it is a beautiful time of day for photos. I love photographing moving water. When I can put my camera on a tripod and do a very slow shutter speed and get that nice silky waterfall coming down. I've been uh, kind of shooting on my own a bit. I can get creative that way. We walked across the Arctic Circle and some of us continued on out to the bird cliffs to watch the puffins backlit with sand eels in their beaks. Perhaps life-changing moment for some sitting there as the sun set. We have beautiful landscapes here. Well surrounding us, what more could we ask for? When guests leave here, we hope they'll be going home with great pictures that can inspire their friends and family to care about the planet and to explore the world like they have. These photo expeditions are full immersion trips. They're very special because we slow down and we get to really enjoy the wildlife and learn from the naturalists and improve our photography skills. We just experienced the frigate bird drumming on its red pouch. And this is the photographer's dream is to be able to witness these wild creatures out here and especially these islands are so special. They're the enchanted islands. These are my favorite trips. And the Galapagos Islands is one of my favorite places on earth. It's a pretty amazing experience. Everything is really beautiful and all the photographers and the naturalists have been very accommodating. They've taught me a lot, which has been a great experience for me. Uh, I'm just amazed by you know, everything there is to see, all the beautiful birds and all the beautiful scenery. And there's a lot of patience allowing us to, you know, have fun and do what we really enjoy in life. So it's been an amazing experience for me. <laughs> Alpha.
Come on. Where are you? Everybody got a good bite to eat. Great. I, I ate a Starbucks sandwich in record time. <laughs> 35 seconds. <laughs> That's how we roll. I'll give a couple more minutes for people to meander on in. We've got an awesome program is coming up next, Colby Brown from Sony. How many Sony people are, are shooters out here? Pretty good. Some nice cameras. You know, I, I think there's a, Colby's gonna talk about the, the alpha system and, and the really heavy duty cameras, but I think that there's a, a unicorn camera that Sony has, and it's the RX10 Mark IV. Does anyone shoot with the RX10 Mark IV? That's, it's, it's a 24 to 600 millimeter self-contained, one inch sensor, uh, weatherproof, relatively small camera body. But what's cool about it is that you can really operate it one-handed. So if you're kind of, if you're in an adverse condition or you're on a boat and you have to hold on to something, you can sit there and zoom with the one hand and it's, it's pretty cool. I shot an, a, a, a viral video with it, which was pretty cool. If you, if you want to check it out, it's on YouTube and just search for uh, 10 hours walking as a goth New York City. It'll come right up. It's got like over 14 million views. It's pretty amazing. But the quality on that camera is incredible and it has a, a really good stabilizer built into it. It's sort of like if you had to have one camera, that's it. I, I kind of think it's like the ultimate travel camera, right? It's, it just, you're waiting for the five? I, do you hear that, Sony? They're waiting for the five, come on. I, I think you know things slowed down a little bit with COVID in terms of releases. All the companies were like cranking out a new camera every year and things slowed down, but now we're back in track and happening fast. But be careful when you wait for that five, the six is gonna be right around the corner. <laughs> I, I was like, like, how do you know when the best time to buy a new MacBook computer is? Right after I buy mine, because that, the new one will come out. It's like inevitable. <laughs> Uh, so the five is, I think, 21 megapixel, 21, and and the one I have the actually I have the Mark II, and I haven't I haven't upgraded the five is I've, I've played with the five, but the two I think is like, I think it's the same size, a one inch sensor. I think they've kept it the same, but it's got a, a Zeiss lens that's matched for the for the sensor, and that's what that's what gives it its its jimmy jammy. Also, the 24 to 600, you really don't need anything else. So you're not taking lenses off and introducing dust into the mirror box and all that stuff. But uh, that's my camera I take out. I feel like I'm cheating with that camera. You know, it's, like, it's, it's really pretty sharp. All right, so. Okay, let's give this a, another minute. And uh, Colby's gonna be talking about macro photography, macro and wildlife. And I, I think it's very apropos. You know, during the pandemic, macro was like, was the shiznit. We were all doing macro in our backyards and learning it. And we, at B&H, we sold a ton of macro lenses. So it, it's kind of, it's great. You know, it lets you get a little closer to your photography. Come on, guys. That was a pun. Yes, okay, thanks. Okay. All righty. Um, I think we could get this going. Ready? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present to you Colby Brown, he is a Sony artisan. He's a veteran of optic. He's an amazing photographer. Uh, B&H has been uh, working on programs with, with Colby and Sony for, uh, for a couple of years. And I believe we sent you to Ecuador? Yes, Ecuador. That's right next to the Galapagos. Right, <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a great welcome for Colby Brown, Sony artisan. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Excellent. How's everyone doing? Full bellies from lunch. I didn't get lunch because I was talking to people, but hopefully after this. 
Um, thank you guys for joining here at Optic b &H. Thank you guys for having me back. All you guys tuning in online, uh, thank you guys for watching as well. Um, you guys, I'm sure, all know by now the deal here at Optic is that everything's being recorded, so if there's something that I cover or any of the other wonderful talks that are here that you miss something, you're gonna be able to check and see it online later on b &H's YouTube website, so that's always great. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. I have a lot of things to talk about today uh, wrapped around macro wildlife photography. Uh, for a lot of people, that is an interesting handful of words. Most people, when you think of wildlife photographers, uh, myself included for a long time, uh, you think about the big telephoto lenses and photographing big you know, predators and cats and bears and birds and all sorts of fun stuff. And I think sometimes uh, we, we miss the little things you know, kind of pun intended. Um, as David was talking about macro, wildlife photography has been a new passion of mine for the last probably four years now, um, but it's something that definitely I didn't expect to be as interesting and exciting and to be as challenging as it ultimately um, end up being initially once I begin to open my eyes and, and change my mindset, which we'll talk about during this presentation. Um, so let's talk about a few just real quick house cleaning things. Um, Instagram, even though it's a little bit of a dying platform these days, uh, some of you guys might not enjoy Instagram as much. Um, cool Ground Photography is where you can find me. It's a great place to reach out if you have questions after this talk or want to talk about other things or, or whatnot. It's a great place to connect. Of course, I have my website, coldgroundphotography.com. We have a lot of workshops all over the world where we teach things like what I'm gonna talk about today with macro wildlife photography, as well as tons of other stuff in the wildlife travel um, astral cultural space as well. Lots of great information there, especially if you're Sony shooters, I have most gear setup guides for free to set up the new A1. Um, soon it'll be A7R5, all sorts of fun stuff, or those thinking about migrating, or just general information and knowledge is out there as well. And then as David had mentioned, um, this summer, uh, the latest B&H project that I worked on uh, with them was actually down in Ecuador and the Amazon. And what we did is we put it put together a seven part video series that focused on wildlife, um, regular wildlife, macro, as well as some landscape, and then we did some editing and post-processing. So it's seven part free series on YouTube. You guys can check it out, it's fun. Most, of this, most episodes are you know, 15 minutes long, but it's really well put together. B&H's production team did a phenomenal job. We had a lot of fun doing it. You can find it right now on B&H's uh, YouTube page. Um, all episodes have been released as of a few weeks ago, um, so it's worth checking out. We'll cover some of the same things in this talk about the, especially the macro episode that we did there, uh, but we expand upon it quite a bit more because we have an hour rather than 15 minutes on YouTube. So let's talk a little bit about the journey into macro photography. So for me, I started doing photography full-time 18 years ago. Um, originally started out buying a camera right when digital SLRs were first uh, getting more affordable and more accessible. And I purely jumped into the mindset, or jumped in because I had a love of travel. I wanted to be traveling, I just graduated from college, I wanted to explore more of the world, to step outside my comfort zone. And at the time, um, I, I didn't have a family, I was single, I was nomadic, I didn't have a ton of debt, so I just sold everything that I had after I graduated and started traveling around the world. And picking up a camera was purely by, not coincidence, it was intentional, but it was more happenstance where I just figured that if I had a camera, maybe I could take some photos, I could write a story or two, and it might allow me to you know, live the backpacker life and travel around cheaply around, at the time I was going to Southeast Asia, for a few years and just make a little extra money on the side. And what I realized is that travel photography was that, in, that origin or inception point. It's always to me been about capturing experiences out there but it was that genre of travel photography that's somewhat all-encompassing that pulled me in that I found myself quickly kind of gravitating towards different types of genres. And the reason for that is that my personality doesn't do great when there's too much consistency, especially in the creative space. So if I do the same thing over and over and over again, I get bored real quickly. And so I constantly found myself throughout my career not reinventing myself, but challenging myself by dabbling in different types of fields within the genres of photography. And so it went from travel to landscape. I started a phil uh, philanthropic humanitarian focused photography company called The Giving Lens, which is still in existence. Great stuff you can find on the internet uh, about that. Um, I started getting into you know, culture, eventually found myself 
interested in wildlife photography, which initially was more about, uh, it was more based on opportunity. I'd find myself going to beautiful locations around the world to work on projects that I was there to photograph, you know, maybe Milky Ways over the Solar de Uni in Bolivia, but then I, there happened to be amazing flamingos that I wanted to learn how to capture. And so initially my jump into wildlife photography was just that, it was based on opportunity. And leading up into the COVID pandemic, I was kind of burned out, to be honest. I've been traveling at the time for uh, almost, you know, was it 16, 15 years at the time, constantly, all seven continents, almost every single year. And I found myself needing a break and needing a, a creative sabbatical, so to speak. And once I got done of the, the same 12 to 14 month break of life that most of us had during that time space, I found myself re-energized and wanting to get back into a lot of different things, but it was during that COVID break that I really started diving much more into macro photography for the same reason David had mentioned. We weren't traveling, which was what I had been doing forever, for 18 years. Um, you know, it, <laughs> COVID was interesting because I spent more time at home with my wife and son since my son was born and since me and my wife were married 13 years ago. And so having something like a macro lens or learning about macro lens and learning about flash photography, which at the time was very foreign to me, um, it was a really fun experiment that I really began to love and, and find passion in, in, in a place that I didn't think, like I mentioned before, uh, was actually there. And so that's kind of like the whole idea of like why macro photography? It's new, it's different, it's challenging. As I mentioned, I got into wildlife photography with this idea of first opportunity, but then it became passion. Like, where can I travel to some exotic locations and photograph some amazing creatures that are out there? You know, tigers in India, you can get foxes in Patagonia, toucans in Costa Rica. And through that same process of A, needing to constantly challenge myself, try to do new and different things, um, but also based on that idea of opportunity within the wildlife space, I found myself in places like Costa Rica and being like, oh, hey, I'm here photographing all these amazing species, but like, what's that frog? And that snake looks interesting. Like all these things that I didn't think I might have been interested in, all of a sudden I found myself based on that opportunity. And as soon as you started to dip your toe into that water, I found myself just captivated by a world that I had overlooked for so long. And I think within the wildlife space especially, it is unique and different than most other um, species to photograph because it is much more accessible. Again, if you think about, you know, maybe foxes are prominent in a lot of places in North America, but we don't have a ton of tigers. And unless you're, you're, you're flying all the way out to India or Sri Lanka and you're spending a lot of money, like there's a lot of barriers to entry to do that. And the same thing with the gear, right? I mean, I use a 400 millimeter f2.8 and a 600 millimeter f4, two $13,000 lenses a piece on most of my big wildlife trips around the world. That is not attainable for a lot of people, not only price-wise, but also distance-wise and all sorts of other elements. But when it comes to macro photography, we all have opportunities to do this in our own backyard. I live in Eastern PA now, um, in the woods out there, about an hour and a half outside of uh, New York City. And there are a ton of opportunities for stuff out of frogs and toads, uh, you know, different types of salamander, all sorts of fun stuff that again, I just overlooked, stepped over, didn't pay attention to, that all of a sudden once I got into macro wildlife photography and learned more about flash, which we're gonna talk about, just opened up a whole new creative door that now I find myself planning trips all over the world to find very specific species of snakes. They're very unique forms of poison dart frogs in Central and South America. Uh, I get, just got done, and I'll show you guys some images from Uganda, going and looking for some of the most venomous snakes um, in East Africa, and just having a blast being out there photographing these amazing creatures that are sometimes vilified, um, sometimes uh, not appreciated, um, just in the same vein as like people that do underwater photography think about sharks with the general public. I feel the same way about snakes. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and there's amazing creatures if you learn how to do it safely, and of course you learn the different techniques in order to come away with some amazing images and experiences, which we're all hoping to do. So let's first and start off about, talk about gear, because again, gear is important here. Uh, not as significant as uh, general wildlife photography, but it does play a role. So for me, uh, I'm a Sony artisan, as I mentioned before. So I've been with Sony for seven years. I worked with Canon for a bit before that. I've done projects with Phase One, shot Nikon for a little bit, but for the last seven years, I've been a Sony artisan. And so this, uh, these days, I predominantly shoot with two A1s for everything. 
the A1, in my personal opinion, biased or not, is the most significant camera that we've had released in a long time. Um, the fact that you can get 30 frames per second with a 50 megapixel camera, 30 frames per second, not a big deal for macro, but 50 megapixels is great for, for cropping in. Um, you have 15 stops of dynamic range at ISO 100, which is still more than most of the competition out there. You get backside illuminated stack sensors, super fast readout speeds, really great for autofocus, which still plays a role in a lot of macro work, especially with moving subjects, uh, things like that. Um, it is still my go-to camera. I can take this one camera with me when I'm going to photograph, you know, cheetahs at full speed in Namibia, and then, you know, head over to East Africa to photograph snakes, and then go to photograph birds in flight, and then go to photograph a beautiful sunset. It can kind of do a little bit of everything. For me, that is still, like I said, it's my go-to camera. I highly recommend to check it out if you guys haven't. The booth over there, a uh, lot of great technology that's inside it. The new A7R5 is something that I'm quite excited about. I haven't used extensively. I'm actually taking it with me. I leave tomorrow to head up to Alaska to go photograph bald eagles for the final migration up in Haines uh, for the next week and a half. But it has a handful of different technology inside it that I think is quite interesting and is kind of a prelude uh, or, or foreshadowing towards where the industry is going. And what I mean by that is that it's not the 61 megapixel sensor, which is great. More resolution is great, except for hard drive space. Um, but it, what it has is this new AI processing unit that I'm sure at least some of you guys have heard about. So it's the first camera in the entire world that has a dedicated processor inside the camera for AI learning. And this is tied towards autofocus. And what it can do is essentially uh, re recognize the specific species of animal that you're photographing. And it can predictively expect where it thinks it's gonna go. It understands movements of different types of insects, which now has eye autofocus for, uh, as well. Um, it can sit there and look at certain types of birds and, and have a better idea of predictive flight patterns, like all sorts of different things. This is the first time in a camera you have a processing unit that is dedicated towards that. Because previously what happens is that you have a certain amount of processing power per camera. And anytime you want to add these new features, it's taking away processing power of potential other features. And so for the A7R5, it's really interesting to see this being the first camera come out with it. I'm super excited to try it out, mixed in with the fact that Sony finally has some image stacking capability, which some of the competition has had for a while, which is interesting from a macro perspective. Um, but there's that AI predict uh, predictive processor unit that I think is gonna be interesting, especially as we see that start to trickle in for the Sony lineup into other Sony uh, mainstay cameras, as well as I guarantee you, you're gonna see something similar in some of the other competition that's out there that's just slightly behind in terms of that specific processing um, feature set. But that's really interesting to figure out and understand in an, auto, uh, an autofocus space exactly how can you step things up to the next level. Because if you really think about it, we're starting to reach the heights of what sensors can do with a standard full frame sensor um, with ISO and noise, even dynamic range. You know, unless you shoot medium format, you're not going beyond 15 stops of light. And even then, it's only at ISO 100. The future for a lot of what the professional cameras you guys are using out there is gonna be in AI and it's gonna be in computational learning. A lot of the stuff that we've seen start off with, coincidentally, in the cell phone space where Sony actually manufactures most of those sensors, including those in most of your iPhones out there. But a lot of that interesting technology is gonna start trickling up into, this camera, uh, into the camera gear that we're all you know, excited to be using, and it's gonna be really interesting. It's gonna be kind of the new forefront of where things are going across the board, not just in the macro wildlife space. So moving on to lenses, the two most common lenses that I use in macro wildlife photography, Sony has the Sony 90 millimeter f2.8 macro lens. It is one that's been around for a while, uh, to be honest. I'm actually hopeful that they come out with a new version uh, in the next year or two with the new linear motors that are in most of other Sony's, uh, Sony's lenses, but it's still uh, a pillar lens when it comes to macro wildlife photo uh, photography. It's super sharp, uh, it's great bokeh, it's great to control. Um, you have a lot of great features inside it. Um, it's not overly heavy. Uh, 90 millimeters is a nice distance. You get a nice one-to-one -one ratio with this particular lens. Essentially means that when you work with the minimum focus distance, you're getting a one-to-one -one actual size preview of whatever photograph uh, thing you're trying to photograph. Some other macro lens are different ratios instead of one-to-one, -one, which means they will be enlarged a little bit larger than they actually are in real life. Uh, this one in particular is a one-to-one, -one, but it's still a great camera and still, or a great lens. It's still something that I use in most of my macro work. 
And then when I find myself working, as you guys will see here, with specific species that are, um, how do you put it, overly aggressive and highly deadly, um, there are times when you don't want to be six inches away from a venomous snake that's extra bitey that morning. Um, so in those situations, most of the time I use a 7200, the new 7200 f2.8 G Master lens. This is the new version that just came out. It's half the weight of the first generation. It's incredibly sharp. Um, it's, it's smaller, it's lighter, it's portable, it's an amazing lens. I kind of joke around that it's so sharp you can shave with it, but it's a great setup. It's, it's a great lightweight option to be a little bit more of at a safe distance. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great lens to use and a nice compression. I've also used the 100 to 400, which can work if you're on a tripod and you're further away to really get some nice compression uh, with certain types of species, but more times than not, I use the 7200 uh, in that range. So let's talk a little bit about light. Now, most of you guys that have been here, I'm sure at some point have heard Scott Kelby talk. I'm, I'm sure most of you guys, have, have anyone heard Kelby speak about Flash before? So I've known Scott for a long time. Scott is a phenomenal educator in the Flash space. Um, I've spoken at a number of events, including Kelby's own events uh, back in the day. And up until recently, I had the same response, anyone, anyone talk to me about Flash, which they, you know, they sit there and say, you know, what Flash are you using? Or I have clients ask. And my response was the same as it is for anyone that doesn't fully understand Flash was that, no, 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 I'm a natural light photographer. That's generally the response for someone that doesn't fully understand how to properly use Flash. And that was absolutely me for a long time. Um, I would sit there and I would think about Flash or, or I would think about Flash not knowing necessarily where to start or how to properly use it and think that anytime it was used or that I potentially would use it, it would look fake, it, it would look unrealistic, it wouldn't give me the results that I wanted to. And it wasn't until I really started diving into understanding Flash, off-camera Flash, um, using multiple different flashes, which we'll talk about a little bit in a second, to really control lighting, especially with macro wildlife photography. It was kind of my inception point, dipping my toe into that Flash world, realizing so many opportunities that I missed early on in my career because of some sense of, of ignorance or at least um, I was you know, apathetic towards that type of approach with this kind of photography. Um, but flash is super important in the wildlife space. So I have three different images here I'm about to show you of a very particular snake that I was uh, intentionally went out to go find in East Africa actually just two months ago when I was in Uganda. And it's called a rhino uh, rhinoceros viper. Um, it's a fascinating looking guy. Um, it has these beautiful spikes on the front of it. You understand why it has this name, rhinoceros, right? Um, beautiful, beautiful creature. And the way that you can photograph, obviously, any of these subjects are generally broken down in the macro wildlife space into three different spaces, three different opportunities that you can find yourself in. Now, of course, you have natural light. Now, this is something that as obvious as it sounds, you could only do when you have proper light. Now, in the macro space, you don't always have that opportunity because sometimes you're working under dense jungle where there's not a ton of light. And sometimes you find yourself working at night in the middle of forest or your local pond or wherever it is, and obviously there is no light, so you have to use flash. So natural light is a nice, it's a very specific look. When you have light, I usually almost, almost always try to get some natural light shots but I can tell you I prefer the flash look. Uh, it's just my personal you know, cup of tea, but it is an option out there in certain situations. Now, in addition to natural light, you also have fill light. So this is the idea of using your flash, still off-camera flash, this is most of the type of flash that I use, and you're essentially just using the light from your, your speed light is usually what I use to be able to fill and add a little bit of extra light but still have it be a natural environment. These are great opportunities, again, when you have some light to work with, not always the case, but when you do have it, it can be nice where you can find unique opportunities to use a little bit of fill light. You still get the nice little cache light in the eye, as you can see there uh, in this rhinoceros viper, but it still looks much more natural outside of that cache light. And then, you can use flash even during the day to completely overpower all light. 
This to me is really interesting. It gives much more of a studio look, even though I was, you know, sweating like crazy and you know had bug bites and all sorts of fun stuff in the jungles in, in East Africa and Uganda. It looks like it's in a studio, but you were out there in the field. And specifically using your off-camera flash, I generally use two flashes. In this case, it was one high-powered flash uh, with a stronger power rating, which we'll talk about in a second, um, in order to block out all of the other light that was out there in the field, giving me a very distinct and unique look um, to apply to the type of image that I was looking to create. So what are your, fla your flash options? So every different manufacturer, for the most part, carries their own flash systems, and those are great. Because I teach a lot of workshops, including you know, stuff where I'm teaching macro wildlife photography, I generally use more of the third party because they're more universally accessible. So I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about two different products here. Um, one from Aperture, which is just kind of a, a, a general LED light, and then uh, a Godox flash, which you actually have out here at the Godox place if you're looking for a new flash option. We'll talk about that in a second. But the first option, and not my favorite, but certainly an option out there, are there are LED lights. Now, this is an Aperture MC RGB LED light. The cool thing about this is that you can dial in your, the color spectrum for whatever you want. So it can be great to create some very unique and creative macro wildlife images if you want to adjust the background color or play around with tone and tint with different types of things. Um, when I first started doing macro wildlife photography, I, I took a couple of these down to Costa Rica a few years back and used them purely as my light source. And the problem is, is that it just never outputs enough light. So I couldn't use a high enough aperture, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, the, the, the look and feel was okay, but I had to use slightly higher ISOs and shutter speeds that I wasn't comfortable with doing ultimately. It's just, I find it much better to use a proper speed light. Now the reason that I like to use speed lights rather than constant lights is because A, I'm focusing on still photography, but B, they're generally just much more portable. So for the most part these days, I use uh, a series of the Godox V863s. Now it's a 65 watt flash, which is important. It outputs enough power to get the types of images that I want to. In most situations, I use two of these um, together uh, with a softbox, which I think, yeah, I think I have a, a slide up here talking about the softboxes. Um, and this gives me the freedom and flexibility for off-camera, purely wireless flash, which we'll talk about a wireless commander in a second, to really control and direct light. And this is the biggest thing when it comes to macro wildlife photography, is that your settings don't change a whole lot, which we'll talk about. Your composition and your lighting really make or break these images. And those happen in a couple, you know, handful of different ways, which again, we'll discuss. Um, but regardless, off-camera flash gives you that most flexibility. If you're working with small subjects, you can use a single flash unit. I personally prefer two, especially if I'm working with large uh, larger macro wildlife situations, such as some of the snakes, because then, again, you can control backlighting, you can truly become your own little uh, director of photography. So the main different wireless commander that I personally use is the Godox X-Pro S. That's a TTL wireless flash trigger. Um, I usually use it on manual TTL. as just a way to communicate for the camera to tell how much flash power you want. It's the same principle that I like to think about when I'm mostly Shooting wildlife photography, I shoot in manual mode because I like to control all the different elements of the exposure. TTL makes it easy for you if you want the camera to do it, but where's the fun in that? So I usually shoot in manual mode, controlling the power of each of my flash that either myself or I have other people helping hold depending on the type of subject that I'm trying to photograph. But I can control all the power output from this uh, device that sits on the hot shoe of my camera, making it very easy. And then soft boxes are super, super helpful. Soft boxes really help diffuse that light. So if you don't have a soft box, you get really harsh shadows. It's hard light that's hitting your subject. Um, if you're not familiar with flash, these are super handy because they essentially take the flash and the power of the flash and then spread out and, and soften the light to be much more uh, visceral and appealing rather than that hard light. So you don't get the softer shadows, um, you get a much more appealing look. And so that's what I use for off-camera flash. If I'm working on a system where, or if I'm in a situation where I find myself out there alone, then oftentimes where I can't have other people helping hold, especially if I'm trying to use two flashes, because I only have two hands and not three to hold the camera, 
then I will use something like this. This is a custom built diffuser that sits on camera flash. This is great for smaller stuff if you're photographing small insects in your backyard or small frogs or things like that. But it's really great because the light will hit the front diffuser, bounce off the bottom and the top, and it really does a good job of surrounding your, your image. You can't get truly creative with your shots, but you can get really nice, well-lit shots of some pretty amazing species that are out there. So most of the time, these are the situations that I find myself in. So this is the same rhinoceros um, viper that you guys saw before, sitting right there on the tree, just a couple inches away from, uh, from myself. I'm almost always working with professionals out there in the field, which we'll have a whole section talking about using naturalist guides in certain situations. But using the flash, you can see right here, I'm holding one flash, setting things up. I have someone else holding the secondary flash, depending on the type of backlight I was going for this particular image. But this is usually what's happening. I'm out there in the field, I'm looking for these amazing species, and then I'm figuring out how can I get creative with composition, subject um, placement, uh, how I'm gonna frame them, and then certainly how I can control the light, which like I said, is quite big. So let's talk about camera settings. Um, this is a cute little baby chameleon that usually gets everyone's attention to start with. Um, but camera settings when it comes to macro wildlife photography doesn't vary a whole lot. It's not like regular wildlife photography where you have very different sitting, uh, situations or settings for a bird perched and then a bird in flight and then a cheetah running at you and all this other stuff. For the most part, most of my settings stay relatively the same. So I'm generally shooting with ISO 100 or 200. I'm, my aperture is gonna range, that, that's gonna be the one variable. It's gonna range from anywhere between F11 to F22. Now when you start shooting at higher apertures, you do end up dealing with issues of diffraction. Diffraction is essentially where you're shooting at a too high of aperture, um, which is uh, expounded or, or, or exacerbated more accurately when you work in macro wildlife photography or macro use, uh, where it softens your image a little bit. But the reality is that because you're using a macro lens with such a shallow depth of field, you really need to have a high aperture, uh, aperture in order to get a wider plane of focus, more of your image in focus. So in this particular case, it's not just the chameleon's eye, it's the back of their head, it's halfway down the body, it's some of their arm, if not their full arm. And so I'm willing to sacrifice a little diffraction, a slight bit of softness that I'm gonna correct in post-processing by shooting at F18, which I normally might not do in other situations. Whereas I could have a slightly sharper image at F11, but then I'd have more issues with depth of field. So in this case, that F8, you know, F11 to F22 is generally my range. And then I usually stick right around 100th of a second. Um, for those that don't know, that don't use flash, with 99% of the cameras that are out there, 1 200th of a second is your minimum, or your, your maximum speed for uh, sync speed with flash. With the Sony A1, it's the only camera that can actually do 1 400th of a second, but you don't need to do that because these subjects aren't moving very fast at all, and you don't need to worry about all sorts of other issues that you normally would use that if you had a lot of light and you're trying to use very shallow apertures during daylight for portraits and other things in different genres. So it's a poison dart frog in, in Costa Rica. This one, as I mentioned, was when I was using those LED lights. So you can see I had to put my ISO up to 1,000. I shot at F14, and it was at 1 30th of a second, which is really way, way too slow. I had to take so many different shots in this particular image to get this frog, not only because um, this was a male that was trying to attract a female, so it was kind of puffing itself up, so it was moving slightly, but I, it took a handful of shots to get that tack sharp result, rather than if I use a speed light, threw the flash on it, and could stick with general, you know, more of a standard um, shutter speed and still have everything in focus and shoot at a much lower ISO for a cleaner image. And then this is the situation, this is an eyelash pit viper, a beautiful, beautiful species, again, found in Central and South America, and it's called an eyelash pit viper because it has little eyelashes above its eyes. And this is one that I shot on a tripod with a 100 to 400 at a distance. So you get that really nice compression, this was more natural light, um, but you could see even then, I still had to shoot at ISO 1000, 1 60th of a second because it was really late in the day. It was something that I probably, in retrospect, would have preferred to have a flash and go with a different type of look, even though the natural light look in this situation, I feel, does look quite nice. So getting creative with lighting, this is where things, like I mentioned, you have the most flexibility, and I think where most people get the most confused as well. The difference between macro wildlife photography 
and portrait studio work is really not that different. It's about the power of light and the direction of light. And what you can do when you learn what you're capable of doing or how flashes work really can open up some incredible opportunities to capture species in ways that either haven't been done before or at least very rarely have been done. This is a, a palm leaf pit viper again in Costa Rica and using just a single flash shooting from underneath the palm leaf, which that's how they get their name, that's typically where they're found, being able to light it up front side with an, a high enough power, but instead of going for two flashes and lighting up the underside, you're letting contrast play its role. It's a unique composition, it's uniquely lit, um, it pulls all the pieces together, and I've yet to see another image of these types of snakes shot in this way, even though it's the most common place where you can find them. Um, maybe too many people don't wanna be sitting underneath a palm leaf with a poisonous, you know, venomous pit viper sitting on top, but if you're willing to do so, and you can do it safely, you can get some great results. Same thing can be said for poison dart frogs, being able to find unique compositions within them, uh, lighting things up, um, using that light to control the effect, the feel, the atmosphere, the mood of the image. And what's really interesting is that it also allows you to control the, the overall, the, the, the feeling, I guess I would say, of, of how everything kind of comes together, the colors that are presented when you use flash properly. You don't overexpose uh, or, or blow out your shot with too much light uh, based on your settings that you're using can really be incredible, pulling out iridescent colors that you might not have seen otherwise, or highlighting colors and, spe and, and features that you, again, wouldn't be able to see if you shot during with natural light itself. And then you can have a lot of fun playing around different species. Every different species has different personalities. Every different, um, every different you know, creature has its own personality as well. So sometimes when I'm photographing something, I usually try to limit my time with them just to make sure that I'm not infringing too much on their own personal space, which we'll talk a little bit during the ethics uh, part of this conversation. But you can have a lot of fun once you get to know if someone's a little bit more curious. You can find them in different places and kind of follow along with them and try to get shots like this where again, I'm purposely using just a single flash unit in order to let contrast and the use of negative space really speak for itself, allowing a subject to take center frame, even if it's something um, that's quite small and unique in this particular shot. So flash can freeze action. I think a lot of the people that understand flash know this. You don't need to shoot at high shutter speeds in order to get something frozen in time because what happens is when the flash unit hits your subject, you have just that, that window where your camera is working with your flash unit can, can uh, capture and freeze that moment in time. For me, this is most prevalent in macro photography with snakes. So with snakes, being able to use uh, still a shutter speed that isn't overly high, I think this one was still one two hundredth of a second, but as the snake was using its tongue, which they commonly do in order to sense what's happening around, around you, uh, they sense heat that way, they understand their, their prey and predators, what's happening with them, is that you can kind of get and freeze the motion of that shot. It's truly an amazing opportunity to get these unique images like this, um, using flash to kind of freeze motion. This one is one of my favorites. These are one of my favorite kinds of snakes. Um, coincidentally, are not venomous, even though most of my other ones are. Um, this is a vine snake, a green vine snake. They're pretty common in Central and South America. Um, but what's interesting is that they're not venomous. They don't have venom glands. They have sharp little teeth. So if they bite, it's not gonna be your favorite moment, but it's not gonna be a trip to the hospital or worse. Um, but they're very aggressive. And so you have, to, you have to make sure when you come across them, A, that you're being safe, but also you have to find yourself in a situation where you might have a little bit more control. In this particular situation, what happened is we came across this uh, green vine snake and it was kind of wrapping itself and coiling itself around a tree where we found it, this, this log you can kind of see down there. And as it was, um, it started kind of aggressively going towards the camera. And just what we did, um, as I was working with uh, some snake wranglers and some naturalist guides, is that as it was kind of inching towards me, is that they just lightly used their finger and just kind of put their hand on the back tail, 
you know, just lightly. So the snake couldn't move for a few seconds, so I was able to get the shot safely. But that's how most of these types of shots happen, is that you're sitting there and you're doing a light controlling of the, in, uh, of the situation. As Soon as you're done, we, we took, it was about a minute getting the shots that we wanted to, we let it go back right where it came from. Um, but that's how you, when you see shots like this, that's usually the situation. You're not, you know, the, the photographer's not out there dancing around and jumping out of snake bites to get the shot. It's usually a little bit more of a controlled situation. But sometimes you can find unique spots where you do work with venomous snakes that, that can be a little bit more aggressive, um, even if they're not necessarily uh, super big threats towards human beings. In this particular case, this was a Great Lakes Viper again. I, I love vipers. And this particular one took an, uh, an issue, not with myself, not with our, our guides or naturalists that was out there, with actually the softbox. The softbox, it was not a huge fan of. Um, and so anytime we brought the softbox a little closer to kind of light up what I was going for, you would see its mouth start to open. So it really credited for these great opportunities to photograph this particular snake. And what's interesting about them, uh, about most snakes, is that their, their jaws are not, um, they're, they're not connected and attached on both sides. So what happens is that if the gland comes out on one, you can see the fang come out on one, and then so I have a couple shots of just like one fang up, and then you see the other one kind of come up once it gets into to bite mode. Um, but this was shot on a macro lens as well, but because it was looking at the, at the, at the softbox and not at myself who was on the side, then there was no, no real danger of what was happening. Um, but like I said, it, it just allows you to freeze those moments right before stuff happens, which is pretty amazing. So find reflective services. This is something I always recommend doing. Um, I'll, I'll give you two examples here. The first one is where you're creating your own reflective example. What I mean by that is that oftentimes, especially when I'm working with frogs and amphibians, is that when we go into the jungle to find these creatures out there in the wild, we will often bring um, sometimes a 12 inch by 12 inch, sometimes a little bit bigger glass plate. And then we set up like an art stand um, and hold it on both sides. And then when we find a species we, we, um, we would like to photograph, again, we're working with naturalist guides that are trained to be able to handle and hold these creatures. We'd be able to put it uh, on the gr glass plate that's close to the ground. So again, they're not at risk of getting hurt or anything. And then you can use your flash to create some really unique shots. And that's how you're getting kind of these reflective shots. Particular, this, this particular approach is done oftentimes with, with frogs, especially glass frogs, which can have translucent skin, essentially using flash from underneath to light the frog itself. And you also photograph from underneath the glass plate to see through it. And then what happens is that certain species of them actually have translucent skin, so you can see all their insides. It's a very unique uh, shot. I don't have anyone for this presentation, but that's what gave me the, the idea to start creating stuff like this with certain types of glass frogs and poison dart frogs. And then of course, water can be a great source as well. Uh, this is actually a, a macro lens with a baby caiman uh, taken in Central America and Panama, um, where it was holding very crazily still. I figured as I got close to it, it was gonna take off but it just held there. Uh, we used a, a flash to take a couple quick shots and then it, it eventually um, found its way you know, out of the scene. But uh, great uh, reflection opportunities for a scene like this. Perspective matters. This is something that I think is important in all genres of photography, um, especially in the macro world, because obviously we are much taller and bigger than the creatures that we're out there photographing. So being able to photograph many of these species as you can at eye level is really big, and what it does is it allows you to make much more connections with the species, I think creating much more interesting images. This is a Gabon uh, viper, um, also found in East Africa. It's a very large snake. Um, they can weigh upwards of like 10 pounds. They're um, quite large. Coincidentally, they're incredibly venomous, but they very rarely bite human beings. Um, they're not very aggressive, so they're really easy to photograph. I was really lucky to find them on this last trip to Uganda. But the most interesting composition that I found was kind of that straight on shot. And so doing it safely again, because you don't want to put yourself in peril, you know, using the new mirrorless cameras, having that flip out uh, articulating screen on the back, literally put it on the ground, articulated the screen out, and then I, I felt comfortable enough to just use my finger to take the, the shots, but I could, of course, jump into my cell phone wirelessly and been able to take the shots from there. But having that 
perspective of being right there at eye level, right at, the, right at its face, to me made the most unique type of image possible with this particular snake. And the same thing can be said about frogs again. I think you have to be willing, if you're interested in macro wildlife photography, to get a little bit dirty, you know, lay on the ground when you need to, bring a little camping chair if you need, like whatever it is that allows you to kind of get down and be able to photograph these species at their space, I think is awesome. Because like I said, it just gives you much higher potential to kind of pull everything together and have a little bit more of a unique image where the eyes can play more of a role um, into the shots that you're doing, which I think most wildlife photographers try to do anyway. So let's talk about five quick trips or tips for macro wildlife photographers that are out there. So tip number one, this is the same one for those that want, listened to my talk earlier today, this is more about general wildlife, and that's the idea of customizing your camera. So the last thing you wanna do is be in the middle of the jungle, in a place that you don't know, in the middle of the night, trying to worry about something not biting you, and you're fumbling with your camera to kind of pull, you know, pull things together. How do you adjust your flash speeds? How do you adjust your ISO on the fly? How do you change your autofocus zone? Every time I get a new camera, I dial in every different button, every different setting to fit the needs I have as a photographer. I mean, I, I try to sit there and proactively think about the stuff that I photograph, what features, functionality, or settings do I need to be one click away or less. If I can't access it while I'm looking through the viewfinder, then I wanna make sure that that's not a priority for me to have access to. So if you're moving to a new system, like someone coming into the Sony space from Canon or Nikon or Fuji or Olympus or whatnot, and people say, oh, the menus are different. Yes, they are. But if you take time to dial in your camera, I don't ever need to go into the menus because I have everything dialed in exactly as I need. It just takes time to do so. But having this stuff dialed in beforehand makes it so much easier to be out there in the field, especially in a new environment, so that you make sure, like I, meant, like I said, you have all of these features and functionality as close to you as possible. So be silent when possible. Um, this is again, super important. I, again, I talked about this a little bit in my talk earlier today, that idea that mirrorless cameras can now be truly silent. They start off with the A9, first A9, um, A92, A1, all the Sony cameras now, I think your mirrorless cameras in Canon and Nikon also now have the features, which are great. But when you're out on safari and you're photographing uh, you know, lion cubs, once I've gotten used to silent mode, I feel the digital SLRs are exponentially louder than I remember them when I shot them. But it doesn't matter all that much to most creatures out there because they've gotten somewhat used to that. It's a little bit different in the macro world. A, they're not used to it. Most species you come across might not have had other, tons of human, other human contact. But sitting with a, a camera super close to them and having your shutter go off, make super loud noise, can scare a lot of these creatures away. So shooting in silent mode makes a big difference. This is again why I shoot with the A1, or now the A7R5 uh, with his focus stacking features. But either way, having something shoot in truly silent mode really can make a big difference and allows you to get much closer than you might have otherwise. And like I said, it can happen, it helps with all different types of species that are out there. Um, you know, from, uh, you know, catydids to, you know, poison dart frogs, um, all sorts of fun stuff. The, these creatures, the poison dart frogs, this thing looks huge because I shot it with a macro lens and there's a very small crop in there. But these things are, are this big, like they're super tiny. So you wanna minimize the amount of times that A, you're stressing them out just from an ethical standpoint, but also so you can get the photographs that you're looking for as well. You wanna minimize that amount of extra noise that you're bringing to it. So working with local guides, again, this is super, super important. You obviously probably don't need to hire a local guide to go check out your local park or hang out in your backyard if you're trying this. But when you start traveling around to find some very unique, rare, and certainly some venomous species, you definitely wanna make sure that you're working with some of the best people that are out there. Um, I usually go with starting off with word of mouth, like who do I know that's been to a location that can find someone that I trust or can verify. If I can't find that, I'm usually going to places like TripAdvisor or specifically to macro wildlife photography. Um, there's the study or the, the pursuit of understanding for amphibians and frogs and reptiles, things like that, it's called herpology or herping. So there's lots of message forms about that where you can go and find local guides in different locations. Having people that you know that work with some of these best people that know what they're doing with a specific species so that you stay safe, the animal stays safe, everyone stays in, a, a, in good regards, and you can still also come away with the images you want is incredible. And this is more important than ever, of course, especially with snakes. Uh, this is again the same rhinoceros pit viper. 
if you're walking around in the jungles out there, uh, you know, most people are not gonna be paying attention exactly everywhere you're stepping. This is how easily they camouflage. The Great Lakes Pit Viper sitting on the green, green moss. You're not gonna, A, you're not gonna be able to see them and find them. I can tell you that from personal experience. But also, just from a safety standpoint, you always wanna make sure that you're working with people that know what they're doing. So the environment can play a role. This is where it's a little bit less of a studio shoot where you really wanna bring in a little bit more of the environment into the shot to get a sense and feel for where they're at. What is their environment? How does that play a role into the images you're trying to create? This is a bullet ant. For those that don't know, this is probably the most painful bite in all of the insect world. Um, it's not something I highly recommend for anyone to ever experience. Um, but they're amazing to photograph, super unique, and again, something that most people kind of disregard. But being able to pull in a bit more of the leaf, making sure I intentionally lit up some more of the stuff that was behind it to give it more sense of environment, really, to me, helped make something that was more unique, seeing that leaf in the back bottom part of the frame, rather than just focusing on the ant itself. This is a, a hognose uh, viper as well, just lighting up kind of the areas that it's most known to be in, in terms of the leaflets. Um, making sure that you understand that's part of it. You can see how they kind of blend into the background and what's happening. I didn't light up the rest of the background, but I still wanted to give a little bit of that environment or a feel for the shot. And then the same thing, this is a, um, this is a, a coordinated um, uh, uh, boa constrictor. And being able to use this more as a fill flash in this particular case gave me that opportunity to show exactly where we were at. We were out there in the jungle um, using the flash to be able to balance the type of shots that I was going for, um, creating something that was more unique rather than just the studio look, which plays a role. And then coming back to that same palm leaf pit viper, um, it had a, we had a rainstorm, so it was raining on the snake when it was on top of this palm, bit, uh, the, this palm leaf. And so then being able to find that unique composition, water dripping off of its face, using that light to get something unique, um, and then with 50 megapixels, it's great because I can actually crop in on this like straight to its face and it's just this really unique shot that you get detailed. Uh, the details are, are amazing. But it's that idea of bringing in that environment I think can play a role rather than just the studio setup or feel that you get when you overpower all light that's out there. So maintaining ethical boundaries, this is again a big part of working with these small creatures. I think anytime you find yourself in a space where obviously the creatures that you're trying to photograph are in threat of getting hurt, is that means that you're doing something wrong. You should never affect them in a negative way. Um, you should minimize the amount of time that you're spending with a lot of these creatures um, because they can get stressed out just from too much human interaction. Um, you shouldn't handle any of the species unless you truly know what you're doing because I think it can play a really big role into accidentally how some of that stuff can generally happen. This is why I always work with professional guides and locals in all the different places I work in around the world. But you wanna make sure that you know people that are, like I said, are gonna find them, uh, know how to find them, know where they're at, and then know how to handle them, know their characteristics, can teach you all about them because there's so much stuff out there that a lot of people don't know. And ultimately the idea is to come away with these kind of unique and engaging images, images that are different that, you know, you, you wouldn't have had the opportunity otherwise if you didn't work with local guides, if you didn't use a flash, if you didn't find yourself out, like I said, at night in the middle of some of these locations, or even, like I said, in your own backyard. Since I've gotten into macro wildlife photography outside of the exotic trips I do around the world now focusing on random, you know, crazy species of snake and frogs and insects, when I'm at home, it's fun to sit there. My son comes running in and says, hey, we found a new toad, you know, sitting in our backyard. I can run out and grab my flash and show him how to do it, have some fun with it. But it's really great because, like I said, it's so accessible. There's a lot of great opportunities to learn about how you can appreciate species, like I mentioned, that are often more vilified, the snakes especially. I can't tell you how many times on my macro wildlife, wildlife trips, like I do in Costa Rica coming up in January, or I have people that say, oh, I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of what you're talking about. I'm interested in learning about flash or taking pictures of frogs, but snakes freak me out. Or maybe it's spiders or whatnot. And if you think about it, so much of our misconceptions have stemmed from like, you know, cultural aspects of, you know, Disney picking the winners and losers in the wildlife space. Like, you know, it's always snakes that are evil. It's always the sharks. It's always hyenas. 
Like they always pick these winners and losers and oftentimes just through constant bombardment, we begin to, to you know, think that these creatures are innately bad or good and that's just not the case. They're just beautiful creatures. And so I hope you guys have a little bit better understanding of what it takes within the macro space of understanding and appreciation of the creatures that are out there. Um, and I hope it's piqued a little bit of your curiosity because especially for those that are interested in wildlife, there's just so many doors that this opens up, both, like I said, in your own backyard or certainly around the world. So with that said, that's my talk for today. Wow. Good? Wow. Amazing. Thank you. I, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> If uh, do you have some questions, we can take a few uh, Q and A's. Questions? Yeah, I see so a few questions while we're here. Arm first, I'll get to you in a second. Sorry, stop. Keep it nice and close there. Your image, oh. yeah, your image of the frogs with the glass. Yeah. Were, the, were the frogs actually on the glass, and how much help did you need to take those photos? Yeah, that's a great question. So, how many? Um, so, the frogs that were on the glass. Um, so the frogs are actually on the glass. So that's the reflective pieces. See if I can find this real quick. Um, all right. There you go. Um, so we placed the frogs on the glass. So we're, again, we're working with naturalist guys that are helping us find these creatures. They're the ones that are handling them, generally with, you know, with gloves and whatnot, because some of these are poison dart frogs, so they can leave rashes. Some are more poisonous than others. And then placing them on the, uh, on the glass, they're generally uh, very docile creatures. Again, we place them towards the ground. Um, so that if they do jump, they are, again are not going to get hurt. The idea is to minimize the amount of effect you're having on these so, creatures. Um, but then most of the time when I'm out there doing my macro stuff, I'm usually always working with at least one other person because I need that other person to help me hold the flash so I can concentrate on the shots that I'm trying to get, on my composition, on controlling the flash exposure and things like that. So for me, if I'm using a two camera flash setup, then I usually have at least one other person. Sometimes I'll have two people that help dictate and color the, uh, control the light. And then I'll tell people or help move their hands depending on the type of look that I'm going for, the type of exposure that I want. But they are sitting on the glass. Like I said, the glass plates can be 12 inches. Sometimes they're a little bit bigger. And then we just have them sit on, uh, on clamps uh, set up with uh, art stands out there in the field that we bring with us. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering when you travel, uh, how, through airports and on airplanes, sure. how do you carry all those 600 and 400 millimeter lenses and all this stuff that you don't want to check? Or yeah. At least I don't want to check. No, 100%. Yeah. You don't want to check. Any, I don't want to check any of my camera gear, macro or, or the big lenses uh, or not. So I have a, a, a system where I have, um, I, I use camera bags that have removable internal camera units. So whether, so usually when I'm traveling like here, because I leave tomorrow for Alaska to photograph bald eagles, as I mentioned, I have a roller bag that can fit my 400 and my 600 in a body or two. And, but that's an internal unit that fits inside the bag. And so like when I was flying here, I flew here from Newark to Denver, a regular flight. And then it was the regional United Express coming here where that bag's just not gonna fit in the overhead. So they said, hey, we need to check your bag. I said, that's fine. Got the green tag, walked outside to gate check it right by the plane put my bag down, unzipped it, pulled out the internal camera unit that is, will fit anywhere, handed them the bag, the guy looked at me funny, and then I took, carried my camera gear onto the plane. So that really helps. When you're out there in the field, um, I'll usually use another, like I use Shimoda uh, camera bags uh, most of the time when I'm out there. Um, uh, they fit with those internal camera units, or sometimes I'll use like uh, Gura gear, has a great bag, the Kabuku uh, 3.0 or 3.0, 3.5, uh, the second generation that just came out, can also fit a 400 and a 600, 400 attached with the body, and a 600 without attached, if I need a bag that's actually backpack carrying in the field for that. But usually it's like, it's, I'm either going transit, or once I get out in the field, then I'm usually switching to one of those other two systems. But usually it's kind of a, a mixture approach, depending on the type of planes I'm gonna find myself in. But I never check camera gear, outside of maybe a few exceptions in real rural Africa, where you have no choice and you're on like a, questionable, you know, Russian twin propeller plane. I have other issues to worry about at that stage, so. <laughs> yes, um, yep. Hi, I was just Hi. wondering, how long does it take for you to set up the shots 
as opposed to taking the shots. So you yeah. obviously put a lot of thought into how to do the lighting and all of that, but you're out in the field. Sure. How do you work all of that and how much time? Does That's it a take? great question. So how much time does it take to set up these shots? So because outside of maybe the, the mirror, you know, using the, the glass and everything uh, with these particular kinds of frogs uh, that are a little bit more contrived or thought through, most of the rest of the stuff is more organic. Like the creatures and the species, again, all have different personalities. You have small coffee snakes can be super colorful and fun, but they're super docile. And you can kind of, you know, I've had them in my hands just playing with them and then you kind of figure out where you want to place them um, compared to other things that are more venomous or whatnot. So usually I'm at first looking to figure out where's a good background. Sometimes you find them right where you want them. Sometimes you don't. And so again, working with a naturalist guide, snake wranglers specifically with snakes, just there to say, oh, we found, you know, the rhinoceros you know, viper, okay, well, can we move him to, you know, this piece of wood and get him placed there, get my shots, but it's not like I'm setting up a ton of stuff. It's usually just like, we're setting up, where is it gonna go? How can I get the best shot possible without sitting there and trying to um, micromanage a wild animal, which is just never gonna work. Um, and so it is a mixture of having the right gear and the knowledge and being in the right place at the right time and then working with the creature as best you can to come up with the best type of image possible without infringing on, you know, freaking it out, so to speak, if that makes sense. You see a log where you think this will be a great place for the snake to be, and the snake's over there, you actually have somebody. That's where we would use the wranglers or the people, the professionals that know what they're doing, that are certified in the countries that, that I find them in, to be able to sit there and be able to safely, you know, using the, the, snake, uh, the snake stick, and be able to carefully position them where they're at to, uh, for their sa the snake safety, the person's safety, my safety, everything safe. And then once we're done with it, like I said, we usually try to minimize the amount of exposure we're with them. We then place them right back where we found them so that they're never outside of their own environment, which so is a big no-no, of so course, for uh, right. you know, dynamic ecosystems. So there's a little pre-planning in that you can There'll see. There'll be some, depending on the type of shot that I want, environmental portraits or certain natural light. It's more so like, hey, this background looks great. But then once I get there, it's like, what can I get with how the snake's moving and whatnot? Not like, oh, the snake's not looking at me the right way. It's like, okay, I need a mocha on the other side, and how do I get the good shot? Like, that's the type of thing. Because again, we're, you're not, you can't manhandle a creature to be exactly what you want to. You have to take the best shot you possibly can. Thank you. Of course, yeah. What's the ambient lighting condition when you're taking it? What's the ambient lighting condition? For, for these, shots? these ones? Yeah. Middle of the night. Middle of the night. So I'd say like half the time I find myself in the jungles at night because there's a lot of diurnal animals that are, are only become active at night, a lot of snakes, for example. Um, sometimes you can't find them in the tail ends or the beginnings of the day, but a lot of these creatures generally become more active at night. And a lot of the, depending on the creature, it also usually comes more so with rain. So rainy seasons are better for this. So you think about amphibians, amphibians love water. What do reptiles love to eat? Amphibians, there's more you know, frogs out there in the jungles. It's gonna be during the rainy season, which means there's gonna be more snakes, which gives me a higher probability to find the specific species I'm after. But um, a lot of these situations, it is you know, super, it, it's pitch black, and we're controlling light. We're, we're putting light, I, I have a, a system on my soft boxes, which I didn't show, where I have a very small power bank, very lightweight, very low wattage, that connects to an LED light inside the actual soft box, and then I turn those on in the night, and that gives me enough light in order to uh, autofocus in pitch dark, and then the flash always overpowers that light anyway. But that way I have a bit of, of, of autofocus, or yeah, autofocus assist in pitch dark settings, because otherwise you have to use flashlights or something, uh, because otherwise there's just not enough out there. Any other questions? One more question back here. Yeah, so a lot of the creatures, so amphibians especially, the question was it looks like the glass is wet. In some situations, it is wet. Um, a lot of these creatures, especially amphibians, live near the water. And so having them outside the water for our short periods of photographing with them, it can be more advantageous and more safe for them to make sure that they're wet. So sometimes that means there's going to be a little bit of water uh, based on the reflections as well. It can, absolutely. Again, depends on the type of scene you're looking for. If you're looking for proper reflections or if you're looking to shoot underneath, as I talked about with some of those glass frogs, then you generally want it more clean. Uh, but like I said, you got, it's more of a timing standpoint where you want to minimize the amount of time uh, with the creatures outside of their natural environment. 
I think we're out of time. If you guys want to join me for anyone else has any other questions at the Sony booth, uh, I'll be over there. I can answer your questions directly um, so that whoever else is talking next uh, can get up here and do their thing. So thank you guys again. Amazing. Wow, pretty cool. Okay, so that was amazing, but now we're gonna totally turn this around a different way. Are you guys familiar with the uh, photographer Cindy Sherman? Okay, maybe Arno Minkinen? So these are photographers that have turned their cameras on themselves and have, have done self-portraiture in a, a totally new vein. So I was introduced to Lizzie Gad a couple of years ago and I absolutely fell in love with her work. I think her work is completely unique completely different and I really wanted to host her and we had her scheduled for Optic West in 2020 which didn't happen and then we had her uh, on, a, on a virtual program and I never got to meet her. We finally got her out here. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present to you uh, Lizzie Gad who is, a, uh, is going, to, she's going to blow you away. It's going to be a little bit different than what Colby just showed you. So without further ado, I present to you Lizzie Gad. Lizzie. Perfect. Thanks, all right. You can all hear me okay? Yay. All right. First of all, I am so honored and happy to be here and a little overwhelmed. This is the biggest stage I've spoken from. So this is exciting and a little nerve wracking, but I am just so happy to be here. And hello to everybody tuning in online as well. Nice to have you tuning in. Um, so I am a self-portrait photographer and uh, I don't even know how to properly describe it. So the best way I can do that is by showing you. In my talk today, we're gonna go a little bit through what I do and how I got started and how I make these self-portraits all in vast landscapes and nature. And then we're gonna get into more of the why I make these self-portraits and we'll get deeper into the soul side of it. Um, very much into like the creative uh, side. So without further ado, for those of you who don't know my work, by way of introduction, let's take a walk with me. Let's take a walk through your imagination, off into the far off mountains. Let's say you're maybe a six or seven hour hike away from any ounce of civilization. You're up in the peaks and maybe you're alone and you're just soaking in the stillness as all the mist and clouds weave in and out of the mountain peaks and everything's silent and serene. And then when you think that you might be alone up there and you're just enjoying the solitude, suddenly you might see in the snow field in the distance a strange little scruffy dog. <laughs> who might be tumbling around and rolling down the snow and getting the zoomies and just rolling around. And you're like, what is this little dog doing up here where there should be mountain goats and bears and all of those creatures instead? So then you might wonder, is there somebody else up here in the middle of nowhere? So you might look around and then through the mist, you might see a very strange scene that appears to be a person wearing a dress and barefoot in about zero degrees Celsius, that's 32 Fahrenheit. And she appears to be jumping back and forth between some rocks, kind of dancing, but mostly tripping, slipping and sliding. And you might wonder, who on earth is that? That person is me. <laughs> and this is what I do for my living. <laughs> Um, it's also what I started doing for my soul, and I'll get more into that as we go on. But when you see this scene and you wonder what on earth I'm doing, what I'm doing is I'm taking self-portraits, and somewhere on that mountain is a camera that's photographing me, um, usually on time-lapse mode, intervalometer. Uh, if I saw you, and realized you were watching me, I would probably run back to my camera, I would take it off the tripod, and I would pretend that I was actually just taking photos of the lichen on the rocks or something, and 
which in hindsight looks totally weirder that I would be like in a dress and barefoot, no jackets or anything in the mountain, and I'm just crouched down taking photos of the little plants and like, and so yeah, that's pretty weird. But when I do this, what I'm hoping to capture in all my little awkward glory time <laughs> is uh, out of this, I hope to capture this. So this particular photo is titled Dreamer, and this is one of my most meaningful photos to me uh, that I took six years ago now already. And this is on a local mountain to me. This mountain is, I grew up every day of my life looking at this mountain. Um, my family and I lived near the base of it. And as I grew older and started to explore around the base, and then in my teen years, I started to hike further up it. And it takes about a five or six hour hike to get to the peak of the mountain. And in my late teens, I began going up there with trekking gear and camping gear. And I would spend a couple of nights, two or three nights at a time, just staying up there and losing myself to all the fog coming in and out in the very rainy, foggy mountains. This is in uh, just outside of Vancouver, BC. So I grew up just outside of Vancouver on the unceded traditional territories of the Katsi and Kwantlen indigenous people. And this particular mountain, uh, today it's called Golden Ears Mountain, which that name is actually what we Westerners totally botched. <laughs> the original name that the indigenous people called it is the Golden Iries, not ears. And the Golden Iries translates to place where the golden eagles nest. So growing up here, I felt very connected to nature as I explored this mountain and the forests and all the misty rain clouds around it. And I would see the golden eagles and the bald eagles and the bears and haven't seen a cougar yet, but I would like to someday. And all the other wildlife. And I would love to just spend all my time out there and photographing the wildlife and nature and feeling that connection in nature. And that eventually led me to capturing that connection that I felt through self-portraiture, which I'll get into a little more as we go along. So the first question that most people ask me when they find out I'm a photographer is, oh, what kind of photography do you do? And I never really know how to answer that without just saying, I take selfies. <laughs> and, <laughs> But then I'm like, not, not the kind of selfies on the phone, and how do I describe it? So I've been trying to really figure out how to nail my self-portrait description, and I think I've got it down to, I take story se storytelling self-portraits with an ethereal twist, all in real and raw natural landscapes. And the purpose is to portray the feeling of peaceful solitude found in nature and the beauty of matching one's heartbeat to the beat of nature. So that is my goal with these images. This photo here is titled Mother Nature and was taken in Scotland three years ago. This is an image from probably four, four or five years ago, and this is in Golden Ears or Golden Iries uh, Provincial Park where I grew up. And this particular lake, Alouet Lake in the park, I would visit almost every day for my whole growing up life uh, from 16 years old onward as I fell in love with photography. And every time I came to this lake, the atmosphere was completely different, but I was always in search of these still mornings where the lake would just mirror the sky and the fog. Um, and on this particular day, the lake level was a little lower and this rock appeared and I decided to wade out, it was about this steep, and I waded through the water and sat on this rock, waded maybe four or five minutes until the water went still again and ended up with this photo called Stranded in a Dream. So these are the images that I take now, but I'll walk you all through a little bit of how I got started. Back to the beginning, I haven't always been at this level of cell portraiture. I started uh, in 2007 and I grew up always painting, drawing, and loving any kind of art form, and my parents were very supportive. I feel very blessed for the upbringing that I had. And when I was, let's see, 2007, uh, that was 15 years ago, I was 14 when I stole my dad's little point-and-shoot camera and started taking photos of just the little nature and uh, landscapes and everything around me. And I joined Flickr at the time, 
And that's where everything took off. My first upload to Flickr was that photo of a candle in the bottom corner of the screen. I thought it was awesome. It's a candle. <laughs> and then my second upload was a spider. The third upload was my cat named White Cat because I was very original with naming my pets when I was young. And my love for photography just grew from there. I started taking more and more photos, particular, particularly based around nature and wildlife and everything that was my first love growing up, being outdoors. But I also began to realize that I could use photography as a way to develop my art and come up with new ideas and um, ways uh, I could figure out um, how to set up images and and I started experimenting more, and I went through the phase that we all go through where we take sepia photos and then selective color sepia photos. And then I decided to brand myself as Dizzy Photography around 2008 because it rhymes with Lizzie, and I thought it was cool. And so that was, this was me just experimenting for the first uh, three years of picking up a camera. And then in about 2009, 2010, I was uploading daily to Flickr I was following a lot of people there that really inspired me. And I started noticing this trend of like-minded photographers I was becoming friends with who were taking self-portraits and they were doing this project called the 365 Project where they would take one self-portrait every day for a year. And that started to really inspire me and I thought, wow, maybe I should try this. And I was terrified of taking self-portraits or any kind of human portrait and growing up, I was always quite shy and much preferred to be by myself or with my animals in the natural world. So I never thought about photographing other people. But then I thought, looking at these photos that my friends were taking and posting to Flickr, I began thinking maybe I should push myself and challenge myself and step out of my comfort zone and start taking portraits, obviously self-portraits, because I'm too shy to ask other people. <laughs> um, so I decided that I would also take on the 365 project, one cell portrait every day for the year of 2010. So starting on January 1st, I began, and I didn't miss a single day. I took one cell portrait every day that year, and they were all over the place. I had no niche, I had no idea what I was doing. It was purely to push myself, to test my boundaries, to grow, and to experiment, and to have fun. And it was so much fun every day. At the end of the day, when, after I would take my photo, I would quickly edit it and upload it and interact with all of my other friends who were doing the same project on Flickr. And we became like a tight-knit communi community all supporting each other. So as the year went on, well, you can see in most of my photos, I, I had all kinds of weird ideas, like sitting in a wheelbarrow and holding a shovel and my, my old dog, Sparky, sitting there with me. And, a lot of the photos were just kind of random and spontaneous. And then some nights I would go to bed and then remember that I hadn't taken my photo yet. So I'd quickly run outside just before midnight and snap a, some, any kind of creative photo just to make sure that I tested my creativity that day and didn't miss out on taking that image. And some of those images were very strange images. Like, I don't even know what this is, I was sitting in the driveway after it rained. I was holding White Cat. And then I thought I would get extra creative, so I asked my brother, who loved laser pointers, I was like, hey, Joey, can you like shine your laser pointer all around me while I do this um, image and see like what kind of lines it can create? And he got all excited, so he did that. And it resulted in this really strange photo that where like, white cat and my crotch is like very lit up, which is kind of weird and I don't know. But it was the only photo I got that day, so I posted that online and it was part of my, my project. And so be it, not everything is perfect. We're all experimenting and learning and sometimes it's two steps forward and a step back. But as we, or as I continued on throughout the year, I started to notice this trend where I was going outdoors more and more and it was like I was, without realizing it, starting to fall into my niche of connecting with the peace that I find out in nature. And I didn't even fully realize this until the very last day, on day 365. 
It was December 31st, and I decided that I would go out with a bang. I would get up early and go to the Golden Ears, Golden Iris National or Provincial Park to this lake here. So I went there, and it was minus 10 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is Fahrenheit, but it was cold. The edges of the lake were all iced over. And those rocks were, the lake had been wavy the night before, so the rocks were soaked but then frozen. So when I was walking out on the rocks, I was slipping everywhere and ended up slipping in just over my knees with the white dress. But it was kind of funny because as soon as I got out, the dress froze from the knees down, so it was like cardboard. So I was just trying to pose and crouch with this frozen dress. But what was interesting to me was that even though it was so cold and I was struggling with this dress, I was so in the moment, I was in the zone, that I couldn't feel how cold I was. I was out here, the only person out here, on these rocks in this lake early in the morning as the sun was rising. There was fresh snow on the trees, everything was still, and it was silent. And up to this point, I thought the end of my 365 project would be the end of taking self-portraits. I knew I wanted to be a photographer, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to pursue in photography yet. I thought this was just gonna be another challenge for me to grow with. But while I was taking this photo on that last day, suddenly something clicked in my head where I realized this moment of connection and solitude and silence and peace that I'm experiencing in nature right now where I feel completely present. I don't even realize how cold I am and then being able to capture that moment, to remember it by, and then to share that moment with other people and try to bring that feeling of peace and the beauty that you can find in solitude in nature. Being able to bring that to other people and for myself, that's what I wanna do. So it was very strange to me that on that last day, that's when I realized that this was going to be my niche of photography. So I ended up continuing, oh, thank you. <laughs> I ended up continuing uh, the style, not every single day. That was a, a very hard year, but it was a year that I grew the most in terms of learning how to edit my photos and, and how to take photos and all of that. So I do suggest if you really wanna push yourself to grow as fast as possible in photography, take photos and edit every single day, but also don't overrun yourself because after that year, I took a, a pretty good break for a few months. <laughs> But I, I started continuing, and this photo is titled Run Home, uh, taken in the mountains next to my house. And it just became something that I loved doing, going out into nature and trying to capture these storytelling scenes and feeling this connection with nature. And these photos became a therapeutic experience for me. It became a way to not only connect with nature, but to find connection with myself as well by channeling my emotions through and in front of the camera. So this was over 12 years ago now. And these photos taken throughout those 12 years since, this is in the Golden Iris Forest, um, 10 minutes from my house. And I would spend so much time just wandering through these mossy trees. And in the winter months, from October to about March, uh, I'm always watching the weather because after a rainfall, if I know it's going to clear up the next morning, I know that there will be fog that rises up from the lake in that park. And eventually, when the sun comes over the mountain and hits the fog on the lake, it will expand and the fog will start rolling up in waves into this forest. So I become a, a very nerdy weather person <laughs> where I'm always checking the weather and trying to figure out, like, oh, it needs to be like five kilometer winds or less, and it has to be like this amount of precipitation overnight, and then it has to start clearing by this time in the morning, like 2 a.m. or something. And, and I, I feel like I've got it nailed to a T now for where I live, but every time everything's lining up, I run out to this forest early the next morning, and I'll sit there, and I'll wait. And sometimes, I always, when I grew up there, I would tell my parents, I was like, I'm running out to Golden Ears, I'll be back in a couple hours. And then it would be at least six hours later before I returned because you just lose all sense of time when you're in this forest and the waves of sunbeams are just rolling through. It's magical. 
And this image, I believe this was about seven years ago, um, also in the mountains near my home. This is up near Squamish. And I hiked up here, uh, spent two nights up here in the snow. And when I hiked up, it was, everything was fogged in and it was snowing, a mix of rain and snow, and it got snowier the higher up into the mountains I went. I couldn't see any of the surrounding scenery, and I hadn't been to this particular place before, so I had no idea what the views were like surrounding me. But I was just enjoying the, the silence of the snow, and I love that feeling of rest and peace that you get in winter when the snow silences everything, and you can feel your own soul resting. And when I got to where I was going to camp, I, I figured I probably wouldn't be taking a photo at all that weekend because I couldn't see 10 feet in front of me. But the next morning, the snow stopped, and I got out, and I walked to this snow field, and I thought, if the snow stopped and the fog is here, I feel like if the sun is rising, the fog will probably start opening, and I'm betting there's gonna be a view in that direction. So I just stood in this field and I waited for about an hour and then sure enough, as soon as the sun crested the mountains, the fog just started parting and it was revealing this valley full of fog and the trees and the mountains in the distance. So quickly I was like, oh, I gotta put on my dress and set up and take this photo. So I, I took this, which I believe I titled Arise. So before I get more into uh, the soul side of my photos. I know from past talks that I've done that everybody in the audience is always itching to ask how I take these photos and all the other little nerdy questions. And I am very much a creative brain. I've never been a very nerdy brain, so I'm learning how to figure out how to describe how I actually take these photos. So let's dip into the nerdy side, uh, dip into the how. This is the gear that I use. Uh, I've been shooting with the Sony a7R III for the past almost five years now, a camera that I absolutely love. And my go-to lenses as of right now are the 50 millimeter 1.2 and the 35 millimeter 1.4. And I love these lenses for the really dreamy bokeh, um, the depth of field that I can get with them. And the 50 in particular, I'd say is my favorite, but the 35, just to have that wider angle when I'm shooting in the mountains, uh, that might be my go-to now when I go on hikes. And I also love using my 85 millimeter 1.4, an extra dreamy lens, but sometimes it's a little too tight for the landscapes I'm in, so I have to be careful about when I choose to take that on hikes into the backcountry with me, but I do love that lens. And then I also have the 12 to 24 millimeter lens, which I use uh, especially at night when I want to take photos of the wide starry skies or the northern lights, or if I'm in ice caves and want to have that wider view within the caves. And then I use my trusty Vanguard VO204AB tripod, which I've had for, I don't know, eight years, nine years maybe now, and it's, now it actually consists of three or four tripods because of the amount of times I've dropped it off cliffs or all kinds of things on my hikes and it's fallen Apart. It was very good, but I put it through a lot of brutal use. And every time a piece goes missing, I find another piece from another tripod and I somehow I'll tape it together or have my dad screw it together. Or Now it's a mess, but it still works, so I'm still using it. And then I also use my Platypod Max, which is another kind of tripod. It's like a plate that you put your camera on and then you can put it like really low to the ground and you'll notice throughout a lot of these photos that I show that it's, a lot of them are all taken at ground level. And I like that because it gives you a different angle and also a dreamier depth of field when you have the, the foreground more out of focus and it kind of leads you up to the subject, me, and then to the background after. Uh, so you'll notice that throughout some of these slides. And then of course I also have chocolate in my backpack at all times, very important. And I don't know why I put that photo of me in the, the bottom corner there. I don't actually have that massive lens in my camera bag, and I don't normally carry wine either. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my partner, Chris, over there, he, he snapped this photo of me in Africa last year, and I thought that was the coolest moment of my life, how it looked right there. So somehow that made it into this slide. This photo I took 
about a month ago. It's called The Whims of Autumn. This was taken in the Rocky Mountains. My partner and I just moved to Banff uh, two or three months ago. So now I'm exploring my new backyard for the time being. And I want to describe how I take these self-portraits. So this place, we were hiking in the back country um, for four, three nights, four days. And it took us about 50 kilometers to reach this lake. And I had some ideas in my mind that I wanted to do there and create these self-portraits. And when we got there, we were kind of exploring around. And this particular lake has actually become a very popular spot for photographers from around the world. But they all photograph the same scene at the one end of the lake. So I've always known, like, I would love to take a photo here, but I want to do something different than everything that I see online. So my partner and I took a walk around the back of the lake and found all these beautiful red um, plants as, just before winter hit. And I thought, oh, I need to figure out how to use these. Like, I've never seen anybody shoot with this here before. So we decided to think about it. The weather wasn't quite right. I love to shoot in like moodier weather or foggy weather. And that day it was just very clear, deep blue sky. Everything was contrasty and it was just, it was still stunning. But for the kind of photos that I want, it was still a little blah. <laughs> so we went, we set up our tent and we went to sleep that night. The next morning we woke up and there was a little bit of smoky haze from smoke or forest fires in the mountains nearby. And as the sun was rising, it kind of created this depth through the mountains. You could see the layers and everything went gold as the sun rose through the haze. And I was like, oh, I gotta take this photo, let's go. So we trekked around to the other side of the lake again. And I started crawling around like on my hands and knees and all this foliage and trying to find, like I said, I love to shoot at a low angle. and Because um, if you're shooting higher, you would barely see any of that foliage. But I love to have things in the foreground that create depth and can also create framing. So I was able to frame the camera uh, next to that one bit of leafy plant stuff. <laughs> and I tried to find a, set up the scene in a way where all the lines from the mountains and the trees would come down and lead to me. And then I would place myself in the center. I'm one of those rule breakers who doesn't abide by the rule of thirds. I usually always like to put myself in the center. I don't know why, but that's the way it works for me and my brain. So I put myself in the center and in the least busy part of the photo so that I would stand out. And then after I found exactly where I wanted to set up, um, I put my camera on the tripod, got it all dialed in, and how I focus is I usually have my dog stand. My dog comes on all our hikes with us. So I have my dog <laughs> stand where I'm going to stand, and then I focus the camera on him, and then I'll switch the lens to manual focus so it stays locked where my dog is. And if my dog isn't there, then I'll use my partner. And, but before my partner is around, it, it was always my dog and I everywhere. <laughs> so it's what I'm used to. And so after that, we swap places. And no, my dog doesn't take the photo, but <laughs> I would like to train him to do that one day. <laughs> um, so I'll go stand there. But I used to use a remote to take all my self-portraits. But then I was always trying to hide it somewhere behind me, or I actually kept destroying them. I would step on them. I would drop it in lakes. I would run over it with my van. And so holding remotes just became too much of a hassle. But then my Sony camera in nowadays, they have built-in intervalometers. So when I found out that was a thing, I was able to update my camera and find that in the menu. So now it's just a quick couple of buttons that I press right in the camera. And I usually set my in-camera intervalometer to take one photo every two or three seconds. I believe this for this photo is every two seconds. So I set that, and the focus was already locked in. All my lighting and everything was where I wanted it. I usually always do in manual. And then I started the intervalometer, and I ran out in front of the camera. And then I thought, what can I do to make this even more interesting? I know, I'll use the stick on the ground. So I picked up a stick, and then I thought I would just kind of shake my head back and forth to make it look like there was some wind blowing by and create more of an adventurous scene and something whimsical and fun. So that's 
how I ended up with that photo. And I actually wrote, uh, when I was editing that, this little poem came to me. This photo is titled, The Whims of Autumn. Where will this season's venture take you, O oh wandering one? Pick up your walking stick and wander with me, your imagination. Your feet connected to the grounding earth, but your eyes lifted to the heights of the mountains. Your courage strong to face the ever-changing, and your curiosity endless in the vast and beautiful unknown. Where will this season's venture take you, O oh wandering one? Let us follow the whims our, of our autumnal imagination and find out, shall we? Oh. Thanks. <laughs> so sometimes taking those photos is a magi magical experience. And sometimes it looks more like this, where it's not always fun and peaceful. This is minus 15 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is Fahrenheit. Uh, this is me on the ground. I was crawling around in the dust and dirt in the middle of the prairies in Alberta, and it, it was so cold. Uh, <laughs> and to, t to describe how we got here uh, that night, my partner had the brilliant idea that we were going to drive out into the prairies because there is a slight potential of aurora borealis. And we were going to camp in the back of his truck where you have the, uh, the truck canopy thing over it, but it's only like that tall, so it feels like you're in a coffin. And it was, <laughs> and it was so cold. So we, we got in there, and, and I was like, this better be worth it. And it was so dusty in there, and it's hard to breathe. And anyway, at about 3 in the morning, um, I was a little grumpy, and I couldn't sleep at all. And so my partner opened the, the back of the hatch and looked up, and, and he was like, oh, just cloudy, and then he closed it, and then he's like, wait a minute, was that cloud? So he opened it again, and he's like, no, that's aurora. And I was like, what? No way. But I looked, and then I realized it is kind of flickering a little bit, so it, it must be aurora. Maybe it'll build up more. So we crawled out of the truck, and it wasn't anything crazy yet, but I decided if it was going to blow up over the sky, I would want to be ready to take a photo. So I began crawling around on my hands and knees, trying to find, <laughs> because we were in the prairies, which isn't normally where I shoot photos. I like to be in mountains, and I like to have things to stand on. I'm usually standing on rocks or on a tree stump or anything, and there's nothing in the prairies. <laughs> and so I wanted to take a photo where I would be kind of at ground level, but with the whole sky above me, but I couldn't get the camera low enough to get the angle that I wanted. So I was crawling around until I could find a gopher hole. And then I put my camera, it's kind of hard to see, but I put the platypod and my camera right down into the gopher hole. And that was the only angle that I could find that my camera could angle up a little bit, but still capture the ground where I was going to stand. So I sat up, and I waited and waited. And then the sky started getting even better. So we thought, oh. I better put on the dress. It's going to suck. It's going to be cold. And it, the wind started picking up, and the wind is icy at that temperature. And then I also had the thought suddenly that I wanted to take this photo one step further. What could I do? I know. I could light a candle and hold it in my self-portrait, which is a bad idea when it's windy because it kept blowing out nonstop. But we decided to go for it, and the sky started lighting up more. So this is a, a phone photo that my partner took. Um, my camera on the ground and me standing at the edge there and holding this camera, or not my camera, the candle, which kept blowing out every few seconds. So every time it blew out, my partner would run back, kind of throw the jacket around me and put the candle between us so he could try to light it with no wind coming through. And then we'd throw the jacket off, he would run back, and I would try to keep the candle alive long enough to capture a few more photos. And this whole process took maybe two hours <laughs> before it did finally result in this image. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> so this was a year and a half ago, I think. Yeah. Um, so before we get more into, uh, as I continue on into the more depth and soul side of my photos, I'll quickly also run through what I do to edit my photos. I try not to do much. As you know now, none of my images are composites. Um, everything is real. And 
what I like to do most, or I edit all of my photos in Lightroom, and I love playing with colors. So usually the first thing I'll do, this is the final image uh, that I took a couple years ago, but originally it looked like this. So I usually, for some reason, always end up underexposing my images accidentally. <laughs> but this is what it did look like, and in real life though, there was so much more blue in the ice, and I shoot everything in raw, so it does look, the originals are very flat looking. And um, So in Lightroom, I'll work to bring out the colors, and I often like to use the paintbrush tools in Lightroom to paint more blues into where I want the blues to show more, and paint in brightness to where I want brighter parts of the photo, and I'll play around with the exposure and the curves and color tones, and I just love to experiment, and editing is almost half the process for me of creating these images, and I think that partially comes from when I used to draw and be a painter. It brings me back to being in that zone of just playing around with the colors and painting colors into my work. So that's the first thing I do, is I bring the exposure and light to where I want it. I start playing with the colors, getting them to more how I want it and how I originally saw it. And then I'll start to take out all the distractions in the photos. You can see I have my black jacket in the corner of the photo, and there's ice floating in the water in the bottom corner that I find draws the eye to it when I want the eye to be more drawn to the center where I am. And then there's lots of footprints back and forth on the ice there from where I was walking around and testing where to stand. So once I take out as much of those distractions as I can, it just cleans the photo up, and that's basically how I edit. It can take anywhere between half an hour to a few hours depending on the photo. And sometimes, or most often, I do leave it overnight or even a couple of days because I like to kind of let it stew in my head. And when I come back, I either don't like how it's looking, so I'll start over, or I know which direction to take it in. So that's how I edit my work. And now, we will get a little bit more into the soul side of my work. I think where I really started getting more into depth with self-portrait photography was nine years ago. I decided to start the Red Dress series. And this series began in Iceland. This particular photo is from Scotland, though. But the Red Dress series began in Iceland, which was the first place I've ever traveled to specifically for photography. So it was a big deal to me. I was super excited. I had never been to Iceland before. I had this whole new series planned out in my head. And basically, the Red Dress series is a symbolization of my wish to live wholeheartedly. It's a reminder to myself to not be controlled by my fears and doubts, to embrace who I am, and to focus on a life lived boldly in love with gratitude and absolute wonder of the world and everything in it. So I decided to focus on this during that year in 2014, and I began this series my two friends and I were driving around in a little car for two weeks in Iceland, camping out of the car, which is very squishy, but we were obsessed with chasing the magical light and the scenery. And every time we came across a place like this, I would throw on the red dress and try to embrace and embody that feeling of wholehearted living and being in love with the world and excited to be in this world. And this cave was like a shower standing there. It was, I was soaked within seconds. So it's very handy, even though I usually shoot alone, it's nice to have friends from time to time who can tag along and help, especially when it comes to wiping the lens every two seconds between a photo, because otherwise it was covered in water. This is one of my favorite photos from Iceland called Rise Up, taken in the highlands of Thorsmork, I believe it was called. And this is at the Black Sand Beach. This photo to me felt like the epitome of freedom. This is one of my favorite glaciers that I've since revisited many times. And my red dress series, although I didn't really think of it at the time, began to continue onward from that year, nine years ago, and I'm still creating these photos to this day. I'm still continuing this series, so now, the series has taken me to Canada, this is in the Rockies, and Scotland, 
And I try to bring the red dress with me everywhere. And funny story, actually, my dresses are not pretty up close. They're all either thrift store dresses or the red dress in particular was half a thrift store dress that got too torn up and shrunk over time going through the washing machine. So my mom sewed our red bed sheet to the bottom of it to make it longer. And now it's just this hybrid of bed sheets and thrift store finds and patches and it's not pretty up close, but it looks great on camera far away and with a little bit of editing tweaking, we can make it better. <laughs> and recently, just last year, I took this series to Madeira, Portugal, which is a magical place. And for years, I've dreamed of visiting this forest, Fainal Forest, which is known as the Reserve of Rest and Sanctuary. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, oh, that sounds like something that I love that resonates with me. I would love to go create some art there and just be there and soak in the presence of these trees. These trees are between five and 800 years old, which blows my mind. And they're incredible, like gnarled trees that have bent with the wind and the weather over time. And it's a magical place. And it's on top of the mountains in Madeira where it's often just socked in the clouds there. And it's very, fantasy like it's just pure magic. So I created a little mini series of the red dress series there. And most recently, just a couple of months ago, I took my latest red dress image in the Rockies, close to where we live now. Uh, that's a Saskatchewan glacier in the background draining into the lake there and then down the river. And my partner and my dog and I hiked up this mountain uh, just as it was starting, the clouds were building up and it was starting to storm and there was still a little bit of smoky haze. So the combination of the storm clouds and the smoke with the sun rays just created this epic scene. And it was better than I imagined. As soon as the sun rays came out, I was like, oh my gosh, we need to shoot this now. <laughs> so, and my partner who's also a photographer wanted to be shooting at the same time. So I feel kind of bad that I made him, it was windy. So I was like, you need to stay with my tripod and hold my camera down while I run up there. <laughs> but thankfully he got a few of his own photos too while he was also holding mine. So thank you, Chris, <laughs> for helping me get this. <laughs> um, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, but, my self-portrait work isn't always something like the Red Dress series that embodies wholeheartedness and living excitedly and embracing everything. Sometimes it's more about like regular life, like the lows of life. It's, it can't just be about the highs. And that's something that I've really learned to channel through my work is to learn that you can't always create something epic. Sometimes the best form of creating is creating what you're going through, using that as a way to channel what you're going through. So expressing our souls through art. Um, let me go back one. Who here knows what it's like to fall into creative ruts? Yeah. <laughs> I am prone to falling into creative ruts frequently, and sometimes it lasts months, a year, a year and a half where I won't take any self-portraits. And I'll still create for, for work and do client shoots for other people or companies, but what really feeds my soul is being able to express what I'm feeling through self-portraits. And yeah, I'm very prone to getting overwhelmed by life and letting the anxieties take control of me and, and then forgetting how important it is to document the feeling, to not ignore how overwhelmed I can be, but to embrace it and then channel that through my work. So a couple years ago, or a few years ago now, when I went through one of my longest creative ruts, I ended up trying to figure out how to step back into that space of realizing that I could create throughout what I was going through. So I wrote down this that I'll read for you now. What is my reason to keep creating? The reason is me. My thoughts, my emotions, excitement, sadness, peace, anger, love, all of it. It's all part of the beautiful mess of life that deserves to be, to be honored. Yet here I often am, lying defeated in the creative rut, wondering why I can't summon the energy to continually create epic, mind-blowing images, when all along, 
I could be creating something just as important and powerful by gently pouring my feelings into my work. This work doesn't have to be amazing. It doesn't have to have thousands of views and likes and comments. It doesn't even have to be shown to anyone else. Art is a glimpse into our souls, plain and simple and extravagant as they are. What if we didn't treat art as a comparison game or a popularity contest or competition? Art comes from what we feel and is an expression of our deepest selves. And whether our art connects with 100,000 people or 10 people should make no difference for why we create. If the goal of an artist is to create something of meaning, even if it only means something to you, then it's already a masterpiece. Thanks. <laughs> so what does this mean to me? Whenever I'm going through a creative rut, I try to bring myself back to what I wrote a few years ago. And that's what I love about journaling, is whenever I'm going through something now, I try to journal my thoughts, and it helps me process. And then when I'm going through something like that again, I can go back and read what I wrote before, and it brings me back to that space and helps me realize that I can keep creating, and I can create something that means something to me. So here's a couple of images. The first one, Under the Waterfall, is called Surrender. And for me, it just simply means surrendering to what I'm feeling. And then the one on the right is called Go Bravely On. And all that just simply means going bravely on into the unknown and whatever we're feeling. Both of these photos were taken on Vancouver Island a couple of years ago. And this doesn't even have to be particularly self-portraiture for me. I've learned that I can also channel uh, what I'm feeling through capturing other objects or my partner. <laughs> um, this is Chris and when we were on Vancouver Island and we were walking on this beach uh, by the ocean and all the fog was coming in off the ocean and I immediately had this uh, idea in my head. I was like, Chris, take off your shirt and go <laughs> crouch over there. <laughs> So he, he ran over there and crouched down, and immediately in my head I was like, okay, this is going to be a two-part piece of Im or images, and this first piece is going to be titled Grounded, and it will help me remember when going through chaotic times, especially in the mind, to find that sense of peace and to ground yourself. And my partner, who is into yoga and tells me all the time that when he's feeling overwhelmed, he likes to walk barefoot or touch the ground and just have that feeling of being grounded and connected to the earth. So I wanted to capture that. So this is grounded. And then the second part after feeling grounded is when you can take flight. So this is called take flight. This image here is another one that actually might be my most personal meaningful image. I took this almost four years ago during a darker period of my life. And this is in a tidal pool next to the ocean, and the water is reflecting the sky at sunset just as a storm was brewing. So there were all these crazy clouds happening, and the colors were bursting. And I wanted to capture this scene, something that depicted what I was going through, um, something that could portray brokenness and kind of hiding the face, but also surrender. And you can see that in my lower hand, how it's kind of faced up and just the act of surrendering. And I've been learning over the years how to develop my poses into ways that can really portray what I'm feeling. Body language is such an important tool. And as you learn to figure out how to move your body, it can express an even deeper language than language itself can. So this image that I took, I actually Here's my phone. I wrote another poem for it. Right after I took this, um, these words just came into my head to match with the image. And sometimes I think of words first, and then I take an image after. And then sometimes I take the image first, and words just come to me after. So this is titled, Calm Before the Storm. In the air, a heaviness, yet not so heavy as the weight of emptiness. In the clouds, a foreboding, though not so ominous as the hollow unknowing. In the water, only reflections, 
The deeper she seeks, the darker the deceptions. A breath drawn in, disclosing defeat. A slower breath out, a sigh in relief. A stillness now, a silent trade. Loneliness for lonesomeness, the acceptance made. And thunder distant, a parallel song, a temporary balance, and a wish to prolong. For here within, steady it grows a quiet so fierce in the fervor she knows. Her heart here now, the beat ever slowing, the calm before the storm, a break in overflowing. So right after I took this image, which felt, this was like therapy for me, being able to process my feelings through creating and therapy, creating these images is freeing for me as well. And then it was funny because right after this happened, this happened. The skies unleashed and the rain just started pouring down and my soul suddenly felt lighter and I thought, I just want to dance in the storm. So I quickly moved the tripod up, I hopped out of the tidal pool and I ran up to this rock on the ocean side and I just danced under the rain as long as I could until lightning started coming down all around. And then I was like, I better get out of here. And is my tripod gonna attract the lightning? I don't know. So I, I ran back to the tripod and ran as fast as I could up the beach to the cabin where I was staying. <laughs> this is another, one of my personal favorite images from last year, also in Madeira in Fainal Forest. This image is called To Flow As One. And I'll read to you the description that I wrote for this one before I continue. From the moment I saw this tree, I felt drawn to join it in its sway and dance, to contemplate the energy in its bent form, to feel the harsh wind rushing through its leaves, to embrace the heavy mist and torrential raindrops pelting my skin. And as the sun attempted again and again to break through the heavy clouds, the tree groaned through its ancient branches and reached reached towards me, as if inviting me to join it for a dance. During our dance, I imagined how this tree has grown and lived, a tree that may look bent, broken, and quite small for its ancient age, yet stands strong and resilient, a tree that has been bending and dancing with the elements for possibly hundreds of years, yet only grows more beautiful despite its challenges. But the tree whispers to me, it sees not challenges, but life. It knows the elements are what shapes its character and gives it growth. It knows it only has to join with the flow. And what an honor it was to flow with it, to feel completely present and connected in that moment, flowing as one with life itself. So, <laughs> so this got me thinking more and more throughout the last year about finding creative flow and how that also feeds in with working through creative ruts and figuring out how to keep creating. And, and I began to realize how important finding creative flow is and how essential it, it, it is for our own growth and, um, and for our mental health as well. So earlier this year, I went through another one of my creative ruts <laughs> for about nine months, <laughs> but in, uh, July, I was inspired after finally starting to meet up and go to conferences in person again. And the first one that I went to in person since before COVID, uh, my partner and I went to Prince Edward Island on the east coast of Canada, where we both had photography talks to give. And my partner actually gave one that inspired me about like creating for the sake of creating and saying yes to creating. And so many times I, I keep falling into that trap of thinking, oh, I'll, I'll create later, or oh, I need to do this and that, and I'm just not feeling it. And I always forget how important it, it is to just say yes and create for the sake of creating, and that's medicine for me. So in July, after that conference, I took a solo road trip down the coast to Cape Breton Island, and I camped around in my rental car for a couple of weeks and exploring uh, the national park there. And, and I found these beautiful meadows on the ocean side, and I thought, it's been nine months since I took a self-portrait. I better just say yes and do it. I have no idea what I'm 
going to great here, but I'll challenge myself to just throw on the dress, go out for three hours during sunset and see what I can come up with. And as soon as I got out there, I forgot how blissful it is to, as soon as I start shooting and I start looking for the angles that I want and I can feel the wind just whipping through my hair and the dress and, and the cold wind after it had just stormed as well. And it just makes me feel so alive and present. And I realized that I found the creative flow again. And then I started thinking like, how can I figure out a hack to get into creative flow whenever I want to, instead of just saying, oh, I'll, I'll try to create more later and later. So I started doing some researching in the last few months. And I was trying to figure out what creative flow is. And I ended up finding out the description for, the actual description for a flow state. Flow is the mental state of being completely present and fully immersed in a task. It is perhaps the strongest contributor to creativity. When in flow, the creator and the universe become one. Outside distractions recede from consciousness and one's mind is fully open and attuned to the act of creating. So then I started realizing how important this was and realizing that flow deepens us, or it, it expands us and deepens us and calms us. And it truly is medicine for the soul. And apart from, say, eating chocolate on a couch, flow is the closest that I can come to feeling bliss. So I ended up reading a book by Johan Hari called Stolen Focus. Have any of you read it? It's, it's a very good book. I highly suggest it. And there was one chapter in it that really resonated with me, where he started talking about creative flow. And right away, I was like, yes, this is what I need to learn. And he had uh, some really wonderful advice, I thought, and kind of boiled it down to three steps that you can take to find creative flow. So I wrote those three steps down here, and I started implementing them into whenever I want to do a shoot or any kind of work where I want to embrace the creative flow state. And the steps are actually quite simple, and I found they work. So the recipe to find flow state is one, set aside other goals and distractions. Put down the phone. <laughs> Give yourself a few hours of completely uninterrupted time. The second step is to do something that means something to you, something that fascinates you. And then the third and final step is simply to meet the edge of your comfort zone. So what does that look like for me? I realized it might look something like this. And let me to de describe to you how this was my creative flow state. This image was taken a couple of years ago. And this is, I like to call this weird log thing in the lake, uh, my water horse. <laughs> and usually it's buried by the water. Uh, most of the year, often for years at a time, this lake is dammed, and this particular winter, or a few winters ago, the water was low enough that I found this tree stump thing, and I instantly had this idea in my head to create this image of me sitting on top of this water horse log thing <laughs> in the lake. But then the, the water rose again, and I knew that I also wanted to capture this with the fog and the still water, and I needed all the elements to combine. So I had to wait for all these factors to come together and for the water level to come low enough, which was only happens in like a one month window, window in the winter. So it took a few years before the water is low enough to run out to this place and just wait for the right weather to happen. So a couple years ago, everything lined up. I ran out and this is far away from cell range. So I didn't have the distractions of anyone calling me or checking Instagram or any of that. I was just out there in nature. Everything was still. It was peaceful. It was calm. It was silent, serene. And then I stepped into the next step of finding my way into flow state, the next step for the recipe, um, which is to do something that means something to you. And this image idea that was in my head for years that I had been waiting for, this image idea meant something to me. And I wanted to capture it. This tree fascinated me. And this was finally the time to do it. And then the third step to finding myself in creative flow was to meet the edge of my comfort zone, which let me tell you, 
that water is so cold, and it was zero degrees that morning, 32 Fahrenheit again, and I had to wade up to almost my neck to get to this log. And so I had to <laughs> hoist up my dress because I didn't want the dress wet. I would wade through after setting up my camera. This log, because it's under the water for 12, or I was gonna say 12 months out of the year, but 11 and a half months out of the year, it is covered in thick, slimy algae. It is almost impossible to climb. And I didn't realize that until I was there trying to climb it. <laughs> and also all the, the spikes, the branches have been worn to really sharp spikes on all the ends. And the backside of the tree is all just spikes leading down into the water. So as I finally got up and I was trying to balance without sliding off the top there, and I kept thinking, I don't want to fall backwards and impale myself on the spikes down there. <laughs> so it was a challenge. Um, I met the edge of my comfort zone. But I was trying to create this idea, this image that I had in my head for years. And then also my dog, who accompanies me <laughs> on all these shoots and can't bear to be parted from me, kept trying to swim out to me, thus ruining the perfect reflection in the lake. So I had to climb back down and bring my dog back to the shore and then wade back out, climb back up. And then he swam out again. So I had to climb back down, bring him back. I ended up tying his leash to my camera bag and hoped that he wouldn't drag that into the water. That was a bad idea looking back on it, but he did stay, thankfully. So I waited back out, and this whole process took at least two hours. And the thing was, though, I was so immersed in this idea that I wanted to create. I had no other distractions there. It was just the hands-on challenge of trying to capture this. And yeah, it was at the edge of my comfort zone. And I, honestly, it was like one of the most blissful mornings I've ever had. I was just totally present, just taking it step by step, knowing what I needed to do next and take my dog back to shore, go back out to the log. And, and in the end, after I got this and I came back and I looked at the back of my camera and I was like, yes, I finally nailed it. <laughs> and right after that, I realized how cold I was and I was like, oh, I gotta get back to the car and warm up and everything. But after that, I did, after those two hours went by, I realized that I had no idea it was two hours. It felt like five minutes. I was so lost in that state that I was completely unaware of everything else except what was right in front of me. So now I remind myself of this and I, I try to remind myself of these three steps, the recipe to finding creative flow frequently. As I come near the end of my talk, I would love to share a few of my top tips <laughs> um, for how to grow as an artist. And these are some things that I've learned over the years. And the first thing is to experiment your way to finding your niche. And like I said, the first three years before I started my 365 project, I photographed everything, like a candle, the first thing I ever uploaded to Flickr, my cat, my dogs, nature, wildlife, mountains, anything. and I. I knew I wanted to be a photographer, but I had no anxiety about like finding my niche, my style. I just did it for the love of it, and that's what I really hope everybody else can enjoy, is instead of feeling like you need to find your style, you don't need to. You just need to do what you love. Experiment, and just keep photographing whatever you want to photograph. And eventually, that might naturally lead you over the years into falling into a style that becomes yours. The second tip, which I kind of touched on before, is to create for the sake of creating. Creating is medicine for the soul. And like I said, it's that recipe for finding your creative flow state has been very helpful for me. And now, my goal for this next year coming up is to try to create at least one new image every week. Might not be another 365 project, I don't have time for that again, but to challenge myself to do at least one new image, create one new thing every week and try to find that flow state. Do the things that scare the crap out of you. For example, this. You wouldn't have caught me up here for the life of me 10 years ago, or even five years ago. <laughs> um, I would spend all my time in nature by myself because I wanted to avoid people. I was scared of people. And the first time I ever did a public talk, 
I couldn't eat for three days before. I was terrified. I thought I would actually die. <laughs> and then I got up there, and it was only a 20-minute talk, which isn't long at all. But I did it, and then I thought, wow, I didn't actually die. I did it. <laughs> and I was still terrified, but after that first time, I thought I could do it again. I don't want to, but I could. But then people kept asking me to do it again and again, and I thought, like, how do you grow without doing the things that scare you? And now that's brought me, this is the biggest stage I've been on to this day, which I'm very grateful for. And this is the first time I can say that I'm more excited than nervous that I've ever been to do a public talk. So do the things that scare the crap out of you because it leads you to some pretty amazing places like being here with all of you guys. Embrace failure. This is where the biggest growth occurs. And yeah, I've, I've failed at public talks before and I basically put my pants right before every time as well. And, <laughs> and even like with photographic failures as well, I've, so many times I've tried to take a photo that I thought would be amazing and then it, everything would fail, the weather wouldn't line up, I would not have my memory card in the camera. But it's all, in the end, I started trying to look at it as not being down on myself for failing, but being able to laugh at myself and and know that it's, what's the big deal if you failed? It's nobody gets anywhere without failing. You don't grow without failing. So don't be afraid. Just keep reaching out there and keep going for the things that you want to do. And don't be afraid of it. One of the most important tips is to find your people. And I know I've said how much I love to be alone. I'm introverted, love to be by myself in the mountains, but from early on when I started finding, making those friends online through Flickr when I first started my 365 project and then the people that I've met in person since then, they've become my community and more than that, they've become my family. And I wouldn't be on the stage today if it wasn't for those people. And when you can find these people, you can collaborate with them, you can shoot with them, you can travel with them. But most importantly, if you can find the people that support you and that you can support and not treat each other as competition, but as collaborators, it's so important to have that community and you can rise higher than you've ever risen before when you're surrounded by that love and when you can be that person for other people. So if you can't find those people, the best tip that I can be for, is for you to be that person for other people. If you want to find a community that supports you, start by being supportive to other people. Start reaching out to other people and offering your help. Start just patting somebody on the shoulder and leaving comments on their photos and be kind and just be nice. And those people, like is attracted to like, those people will come back to you and you'll find your family, your creative family. And eventually, through finding my creative family, that led me to finding my partner, Chris, who's helping me up this ice cave wall and through meeting Chris now we can travel further into the backcountry together than I used to be too afraid to do and go explore more epic places and so here I am climbing up this ice cave and that was before Chris left me up there to figure out how to get down by myself <laughs> but <laughs> but I was able to take this photo another red dress photo on top of this big snowy ice boulder thing in the entrance of this cave. Uh, this was just last year. And this, I thought, was going to be my new favorite epic photo <laughs> until I posted it and somebody mentioned that I look kind of like a tiny profile of a little red chicken and like my, <laughs> my arm looks like a beak. <laughs> and now I can't unsee it. So I just, every time I see this photo now, I, I'd never post it anymore because I just see a little chicken. <laughs> But that brings me to one of my final tips, which is don't take yourself too seriously. And I mean that. Whenever I'm out there in the backcountry, like so many people who see my photos are always like, you can't take a bad photo. You're so graceful out there. That could not be further from the truth. <laughs> I am clumsy. I trip all the time. But I enjoy being out there in nature, and I enjoy just embracing everything, and I have no idea what that pose is in, pose is in this photo. But you can see that I, I usually always still wear my comfy pants or my pajama pants underneath the dress, and, and I like to have fun out there. And, and if a magical photo comes out of that, then that's great. And if not, 
then I still had fun. And the same thing goes with trying to pursue this life as an artist or a photographer. You don't always have to take yourself so seriously. And yes, art is serious in that it is such a powerful tool in learning how to express ourselves and our souls through our art. And it's, so, it's serious in that it is medicine for our souls. But also remember that you don't have to take it seriously. You can <laughs> treat it, like oh, let yourself have fun and let yourself, when you fail, to laugh at yourself and have stories to share and, and just have fun with it. The final tip that I want to leave with you all is to be curious and stay enchanted. And I've been finding over the years that whenever I start to feel myself becoming a little more jaded or, or just not as inspired anymore, I try to get back into that childlike mind and sense of wonder where when I go out into nature, I try to see everything with new eyes and be curious and try to figure out like, how does this fog come in off the ocean? And can I climb this driftwood tree here? And, and it's so much fun when you look at everything through eyes of curiosity and when you're enchanted by everything. And I found this quote a couple of years ago, which I'll end by reading this, and it really stuck with me. It's by Gabrielle Roth. And it says, in many shamanic societies, if you came to a medicine person complaining of being disheartened, dispirited, or depressed, they would ask one of four questions. When did you stop dancing? When did you stop singing? When did you stop being enchanted by stories? When did you stop finding comfort in the sweet territory of silence? Where we have stopped dancing, singing, being enchanted by stories, or finding comfort in silence is where we have experienced the loss of soul. Dancing, singing, storytelling, and silence are the four universal healing salves. So this brings me to the end of my talk, and if you would all like to stay up to date on what I do and follow along, you can find my website at elizabethgad.com. And also as a thank you to everybody for being here, I created a discount code for fine art prints. This is one of the main sources of how I make my living, um, is by selling fine art prints. I have a few limited edition prints of each of my works, and I release some new work every year. So I created this 45% discount code valid for one week. If anybody wants to take advantage of it, then that's great. And if not, that's great too. But also, if you want to sign up to the newsletter and follow along for future adventures or opportunities and uh, editing tutorials or future workshops that I have coming up, I would love to keep you up to date. Or if you just want to send a friendly note, I'm always here and I, I love to talk. And I am so glad that you all came out here today. So thank you, seriously. <laughs>
But anyway, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to have my son here. And also B&H with all their wonderful camera stuff. Uh, all looks pretty modern to me, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm kind of old school. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is go through basically four generations, and relatively quickly, because we had a group over the other night to our house. Uh, we live in my grandfather's house, Wildcat Hill, and Zach was there, and, and Jelena who put this wonderful PowerPoint together for us. And so, I, you know, I showed him the house, I, you know, went through the whole thing, went to the dark room, went to my dark room, went to my studio, and all in about 30 minutes. And Zach goes, you have to talk for 50 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to talk really slow. <laughs> well, hopefully we can fill the time. I mean, it really doesn't give justice to, to my whole family, you know, to do four generations in, in 50 minutes. So we'll sort of go through um, what we're going to do here. And actually, as you look on, on the thing here, three of the, the five are dead. So I can pretty much tell whatever I want. So they're not going to come. Well, they might come back from the grave, but, you know. <clears throat> um, the only one I have to really watch out for is my son, Zach. Um, but anyway. So how did I know my grandfather? <laughs> He was, he was very old when I met him. Uh, in fact, last night, uh, we had a dinner with uh, friends at our house at the same table that I first met my grandfather at. So our house is sort of like a museum. It has uh, artifacts and has my grandfather's desk. Uh, but that's the first time I ever met him. I was five years old and got to sit there, all I saw was some old man shuffling around, <laughs> you know. For a five-year-old, and he was in his 70s, you know, anybody is old. Uh, and he served us uh, cottage cheese, avocado, and then in each plate, he sat there and poured green olive oil over it. And for a five-year-old, it was the most disgusting thing visually. <laughs> I had ever seen. It was like, oh my God, and I have to eat this? It's so funny because Zach and I, that's one of our favorite meals uh, nowadays. So how I really got to know my grandfather was actually working with my father. Because when he died, Edward died, the negatives were left to my dad with the rights to be able to print them, um, which dad did for many years. And at that time, um, I think the only stipulation that was in the will that he could not sell them for less than $35. And there wasn't really a great demand for Edward Weston prints at that time. I mean, photography was still sort of on the verge of, you know, is it art? You know, it's done by a mechanical process. Um, and so dad had the rights to print them. And that's how I kind of got to know my grandfather, because I assisted my dad in the darkroom, and I was able to sit there with my dad and, and see these images being printed. And this was, you know, I was in my 20s. So that was, and we never really talked about Edward Weston, and never really, you know, was he a famous artist or whatever. There was no real sort of this famous person. So... That was my introduction to my grandfather. And it's funny, when my, when my dad died, there were people came to me and said, you know, I want you to lecture about Edward. And I said, no, I won't. I said, what is more important to me is, is not, I mean, he's an incredible photographer, but is at that time, there are three generations of photographers. And that story was the important part in my life. And so, um, I decided that, you know, I wasn't going to do what my father did. And so we're going to run through a couple prints here of uh, my grandfather. Um, this one you're seeing up here is Margaret Mather. This is done in the 
in the 20s. And this is very sort of similar of that period. Uh, Edward, the pictorial sort of soft focus. Uh, this is Margaret Mather, uh, his lover, also a great photographer. Um, and I kind of like this, this series of, of work that they did because it was, it was very theatrical. And you can see this is called Prelude uh, to a Sad Spring. And they, they titled them that way. They were kind of romantic stuff, you know. Um, and then, you know, he went on to Mexico. And it's funny, everyone considered that his jump to Mexico was when he really changed his vision, really started to sharpen his focus, got away from the pictorial period. And there are, there are images of nudes that he did with Margaret before he went to Mexico that were really sharp, focused, beautiful nudes. Um, so I think it was a transition period when he went to Mexico. Um, of course, down there he met Diego Rivera, Orozco, um, Charlot. It was during the revolution. So there was a lot of turmoil. And he, he went down there with his, his lover at that time, Tina Madote, who was also a photographer, but also Edward's assistant. Um, and he started to do really kind of, um, even though he was still retouching, he was, a, he was an absolute wonderful retoucher. Uh, when he was in Hollywood, um, he was known for his retouching ability. So he could take, uh, and he made his living off of doing portraits. He, he did, you know, James Cagney, he did a bunch of Hollywood stars. And so he would retouch their negatives. And they were shot, of course, on four by five. And so he'd actually go in there, and he could remove all the lines of your face. And I have that retouching desk in our darkroom at Wildcat. And when we have students over there, I tell them, this is the first Photoshop. <laughs> you just did it by hand, you know. Um, but he was a master at that. But he, he was also a absolute recorder of reality. He was a real stickler. And if you know the history of the F-64 group, it was all about creating images with the camera that just represented the camera, you know, what it saw. Um, and this is a, a good example of something he didn't like. Some friends had loaned him some high-speed film. So back then, the speeds of film were in the 20s. So this is probably ASA 100, which nowadays is not a fast film. But for him, it was. And this is the only session he ever used that film with, with this dancer. And it's, it's a beautiful series of her legs and her dancing. And, and he never used that film again. But you can see what disturbed him, being a realist, and being someone that wanted to things to look real, that is not looking real. So if you were standing there and you saw him photographing this, when he printed it, it didn't, it didn't look what you saw. So it, it distracted the visual co components of the image. And that disturbed him. He never used that film again. I look at it <coughs> and I think, ah, oh, that's way cool. You know, the access lighting, the fast film, the, the, sh the, the blackness around the feet, that to me is, would be something to go for, you know, to, to, to experiment with. But he never used that film again because it, it, it changed reality. If I get the right way. So where do, <laughs> where do you get influence from? Where do you think Edward came up with doing that incredible series of work that he did, uh, starting off with the shells, going to the peppers, going to all the, the vegetable matter that he photographed, which is a huge body of his work, right? Where do you get that influence? He was down in LA, this is the one ass was done in 1927, visiting his, his friend, an artist, Henrietta Shore. And she was actually painting these shells in her studio. And so he saw that, you know, and, and there again, we're all influenced by things. 
And that started his, his journey on, and she was painting a, sim, a single shell like that. That started his journey on some of his most famous images. And, you know, it went from there to, this is 14 ass, and I was, I was looking at the slideshow the other day, and thank to Jelena for putting it together, because I could never do it. Um, this is 14 ass. So he did a 1S, a 2S, a 3S, a 4S, a 5S. He actually really worked on the concept of making those shapes work for him. And of course, it all led up to eventually the famous one, Pepper 30. So that's the 30th pepper he did. <clears throat> there again, what I love about it is, is the fact that he wasn't satisfied with this one pepper. He really explored and expanded the, the, the sort of challenge of finding the perfect pepper. Um, this is another pepper he did. <coughs> and you can see the difference. Why did, why, did, why did Pepper 30 become famous? You know, why not this pepper? What is this, 14? or why not 35? That's all up to, to us as, as people that consume art, which is greatest images. Uh, he did eventually did 37 peppers in, in this series. And then he, he was done with it. Um, what I love about that is, is taking an idea and pushing it to the limit, not just taking one photograph of one thing, but it's, it's exploring that whole range of possibilities. Uh, of course, it's, it, <coughs> excuse me, his love of, of many places to photograph, but one was, of course, Point Lobos. And this is, back in the old days, this is the North Shore of Point Lobos, where you could, you know, there were no trails or anything, you could go anywhere. And, um, the interesting story about this one is that my dad and, and Edward were out photographing. And my dad had set up the camera, set the try 8 by 10 and Edward was over photographing something else. And he, he asked Edward, he said, Dad, can you come over and look at this? I see something here, but it's not quite right. And Dad had it as a horizontal. So Edward went under the dark cloth and sat there for a few seconds and turned the horizontal to a vertical, asked for a, a film holder, put it in, and took this photograph. And I thought, Dad, you know, it should be 50-50, you and your father. Because he didn't move the camera, he didn't touch anything. All he did was change it for, into a vertical. And you can see what it did. It brought in, of course, the tree was always Dad's sort of focus, but also brought in the rock down below and really cemented the vision. Uh, Point Lobos, of course, was his favorite place to photograph, uh, not far from our house. And um, so he, Edward never drove. He never wanted to drive, and so he always had people driving him. Um, <clears throat> you know, either his, his sons or his lovers. Because um, he always, what he loved to do was when you're driving, and it's funny, I was driving in with Gina today, and I was the passenger and was driving by Point Lobos. And she had always talked about this tree that had fallen over. Of course, I'm driving, you know. But today I wasn't driving, and I saw the tree. You know, this huge friggin' tree that had fallen down. And that's why Everett didn't like to drive, because you lose so much of your visual because you're concentrated on the road. At least most of us, or us old people now, concentrate on the road. Um, you know, but so, yeah, he, 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 he liked that. But during, during the war years, Point Lobos was closed. 
um, they had it closed down. So what he did is he, he spent a lot of time working at our house uh, doing sort of satirical things. All his sons were in military service. Uh, this is uh, civilian defense, which I always kind of loved. It was kind of fun. Uh, and so he, he photographed around the property. And it, it's really interesting because a lot of the people on the East Coast who was following my grandfather started seeing work like this, which is great sense of humor, you know, and they thought something's happened to Edward Weston. You know, he's out in California, maybe he's taking too many drugs or whatever, but this is not an Edward Weston. You know, Edward Weston's are peppers and shells and, you know, and it just shows his, his variation. And when I look at my grandfather's work, I see it as a, as a, not a pepper 30. I see it as a whole commitment to his art in his creation of, of, of his vision. Um, this is another one he did. Uh, this is actually at our house, uh, and that's Karis. <coughs> it's called Spring. And um, this is actually the only photograph that's allowed to be printed. I own it. You want me to spill that on the computer? <laughs> Um, like, I, like I was saying, it, you know, all the negatives went to my dad, but uh, eventually dad sold the collection. They all went to the Center of Creative Photography in Tucson, <clears throat> except for this negative, which dad gave me. Um, so it's the only one that's allowed to be printed. Uh, all the negatives at the center are um, they're there for visual inspection. I think they digitized a bunch of them, and students are allowed to use those digital ones, um, in, but they then have to destroy the, the images. Um, this is so classic of my grandfather, and it's there again, if you were standing next to him, when you looked at this, when you saw the finished print, it wouldn't be any different. It would have that same look to it. There's no changing of, of, of contrast, there's no, it's exactly what it's supposed to look like. And he was an absolute master, in my mind, of composition, how the photograph is put together, um, which is to me the building box of, of making a good photograph. There again, this is MGM Studios, um, just sort of a fun, thing that he was allowed to go down there. And, and it, it's, a, it's a place that I would have just gone nuts in because they had just huge sets everywhere. They had, they had Roman you know, stuff, they had moats, they had all this incredible stuff. But um, he, did, he did quite a bit of work there. Um, this is a really good example. This is one of his famous nudes. And when Karis, who is the model, was alive, she would come down. It was always great to have her at the house because she lived there with Edward. Um, and she talked about this photograph. And she said, you know, the thing that bugged me was the hairpins in the hair. And I thought, I hadn't even looked at that before. You know, but that's classic model, you know, analyzing everything that's, that's in the thing. <clears throat> and what Edward didn't like was the shadow. And you can see why, after I was telling you, he was such a stickler for reality, making things look real. And what the shadow does is shrink the body and lengthen it and actually abstracts it. And that was his, his comment about this. And I remember when we print it uh, with my dad, you hold back the shadow as much as you possibly can. So it's not as prominent. But that's sort of classic of, of my grandfather. He was an absolute purist in looking at things and photographing just as, just as, they, as they were and not changing them. 
My Uncle Brett was different. They love that hair. You wish we could have, I wish I had that hair. <coughs> I worked uh, with Brett for 15 years up until he died. Um, and he was probably the most dedicated artist I ever met. He was, every single day, he did something in photography. I don't care if he was out photographing, if he wasn't photographing, he was printing, he was developing, and there wasn't any moment that he wasn't involved in the pho photographic process. And it's interesting how, how houses sort of reveal the personality. You know, my grandfather's house is 30 by 20. The, the table is, is minimal. His desk, you know, all that is still there. And we live in that house. My uncle, when I was first dating Gina, I took her out to meet my uncle because I was working with him. And so we went out there. We'd, all, we'd go out at, he called it snake bite time, which is the time when the snakes were coming up and you need refreshment of some sort, mainly alcoholic, you know. And he'd say, you know, the snakes are coming, you know, you got to have your drinks. And he always sort of struggled with, with he wasn't an alcoholic at all, but he would always go to the doctor and the doctor would say, hey, Brett, you have to quit drinking bourbon. And he goes, okay. So I'd go out there to work with him. Snake bite time. He said, and he had this wonderful voice. He called me Bub. Bub, um, I'm stop drinking the hard booze. And um, doctor said I had to. And it had this wonderful soft tone to it. And he says, I'm drinking sherry now. <laughs> and he had this, <clears throat> excuse me, huge friggin' tumbler, you know, <laughs> filled with the cheapest sherry, you know, gallo sherry, and that was his drink for the night, you know, was this, this cheap stuff. And then I remember also, he smoked a pipe, and he'd say, I go out there, Bob, you know, my doctor said I have to stop smoking the pipe. Uh, okay, so he, he would go out and throw all the pipes out into the field. And I'd come back like four months later, you know, and I'd see him out there. And he's scrounging around in there. <laughs> what are you doing? So I'm looking for my pipes. <laughs> so it was just sort of constant, you know, off the wagon, but, you know, semi off the wagon. And... And he loved smoking uh, Delicados cigarettes because he had buddies that would go down to Mexico. And they'd bring back whole, whole cartons of Delicados. And just an absolutely wonderful person to, to be around. And, and uh, I, I'm very, very lucky. You know. And he loved Zach. Zach was a little kid, of course. And he said, when are you bringing your boy out? You know? <laughs> and he would... And, um, very, 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 very sensitive, loving, loving person. Um, and so going back to t bringing Gina out there, I was like, okay, snake bite time, have our cocktails. He loved women. I mean, he was enamored. I think he was married five times, but <laughs> he just couldn't get it right, I guess. But, um, Gina's gorgeous, and so he's so polite and so wonderful. We have our drinks and everything. He shows us around the house, and then we leave. And Gina goes, did he just move in? And I said, what do you mean? He says, there's nothing there. There's nothing. It's like it's, it's a barren house. And what it was is he had no knickknacks. He had nothing. The only things he had was his Eames chair, the sofa and his work up on the wall. That was it. There was no nothing. Now, he had a sculpture. But it, it, when you walked in, you go into his closet, they were like, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> six black shirts, six black pants, and a couple of sex boots. 
he had these, um, he called them sex boots, but they were sort of like cowboy boots, you know? And he would wear those. And then a, a couple leather jackets. But so minimalistic of, of clutter around the house. Um, that was his, his way. I mean, he just didn't clutter his life up. I could go on for hours on him, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to go through a couple of his photographs. <clears throat> what he really loved was abstracts. And so I'm just going to basically cover that. Uh, even though he was known for his, his famous Holland Canal, um, which is his biggest seller, and he always said, well, it was a pretty picture of a canal, you know, and, and that was like, okay. But this type of work is what he loved, it's just getting in there and, and finding the detail and finding stuff that in, interests him. Um, these are, and these are all done with 11 by 14 camera. So those are pine needles <clears throat> in the snow. And you can imagine him with the camera looking down with that extension on it to get that close. Um, eventually he, you know, stopped using large format and went down to, you know, the older he got, the smaller his cameras got. Um, but, you know, this type of stuff, <clears throat> was something that he really, really enjoyed doing. Um, and I think he got the, the best, his best um, gratitude out of it. You know, his best feeling uh, when it came to abstracts. He, like I said, he was really good at, at landscapes. But, you know, taking little nuances of, of things, uh, made him really excited. But then even with, with the larger uh, landscapes, look what he's done. He's actually abstracted the landscape, taken away all the shadows, and this is another great example. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you were standing next to him, it didn't look like that. Through, you know, exposure, uh, developing, and printing, made it look like that. So he was actually using the camera <clears throat> as a tool of expression instead of just recording, um, which I thought was pretty fascinating. And um, also, that's his photograph, and that's his carving. So he did both disciplines, um, and would usually carve something out of his photograph, you know? Um, and I, the reason why he did that um, was it got him out of the dark room, got it out of the preciousness of the no dust on your prints, the no scratches. You know, photography is a, is a precious thing. You know, everything has to be clean, everything has to be in order. It's, you know, it has boundaries, you know, chemistry. Carving, totally different. It's a, it's a dirty, dusty, physical thing. And, and you'll see later, I, I use that same aspect in my painting. And here's a guy, my dad. Um, I started photography when I was six <clears throat> in his dark room at our place down at Garapada. At, I was an extremely shy kid, and last thing I ever wanted to do is get up in front of a bunch of kid, people and speak, <laughs> you know, but my dad loved it. He absolutely loved it. He was trained in the theater. Um, he, he, he worked at the Forest Theater. He directed plays there. I was actually in one of his plays. Um, you know, talk about doing things that frighten you most, you know. I did not want to be in the play. And I played the same part in Winterset, which was the name of the play, that he played when he was a young man. <clears throat> and, you know, it's like, you do the things that frighten you most. I got to do this, you know. And then I thought, well, you know, I don't want to skydive. 
there's no way I would skydive. And they said, my brother who's done it goes, well, you do it with another person. And I go, that's going to make me feel better, both of us dying <laughs> together? You know, come on. <laughs> but I would sit with my dad in the dark room, six years old. He had a chair that I'd, he set me up on. And I would run, because he was doing, even though he ran a trout farm, he was doing portraiture at that time. And so we, I would sit there and, and run his four by five negatives through the uh, fixer. Um, incredible man. Um, he started out in black and white. It was funny, I was looking at the date of this. I was one years old when that was taken. And this dad would tell me the story about it, that <clears throat> he was out with his friend Rick Maston, who was a, a poet and, and troubadour. And dad said he saw this tree. And he goes, my god, if I could only find a, a nude to go in the tree. And Rick said, I'll do it. <laughs> and he took off his clothes, climbed up the tree. And dad took the photograph. But <clears throat> he, he, he had this problem with being compared to his father. And so what he did, Edward was shipped out a lot of color film toward the end of his life. And Edward actually did color work. Um, and it's interesting to see it because a lot of times he would go back and photograph the same things he did in black and white in color. And there, there's, there's work out there of Edward's work in black and white and same in color. But he was stricken with Parkinson's at that time and this is sort of a period where he couldn't photograph. And so all this color film was laying around and the Kodak had sent out. And so my dad, trying to distance himself from this great photographer, his father, uh, picked up color and started shooting color. So he was one of the earliest color photographers, uh, a real pioneer in, in color photography. Um, and it, it fit my dad's personality. If you ever met him, it was like he was exuberant, he was lively, he was loved being in front of the crowd. Uh, so I think it fit his personality. Uh, this photograph he took <clears throat> when he was taking us to school. Our school is off to the left there. This is Palo Colorado Canyon is right there. And I remember, you know, it's funny things you remember. Dri he was driving all three of us kids at that time to school. And this, you know, I saw this little kid, these huge waves coming in. And he goes, oh, my God, I got to go back. So he drops us off at school and goes back and takes this photograph. Um, and it's interesting. This is another one of his photographs, and I was actually there with him. This is, I'm sure you, if you're local, you'll recognize where it is. It's Stivy Fish Ranch. And I actually have a photograph of him taking this photograph. Um, but, yeah, color really suited his personality. Um, he did a lot of traveling. Um, and what he ended up doing, which is really kind of interesting, is as much as he tried to get himself away from his father's footsteps, he ended up creating a lecture called The Man, Not the Myth, which was all about his father. So it's sort of a dichotomy there because as much as he pushed him, tried to push himself away, he ended up spending most of his life um, lecturing on his father. You do not do this. <laughs> <laughs> and what it did, I mean, he was a great photographer, but what it did is it separated him from his art to a certain extent and sort of limited him. But it gave him a stage. I mean, he's gone all over the world lecturing on his father. And if you think about it, that's a really satisfying thing that his father gave him because dad ended up on stage.
goddamn on time. Oh, it's almost. Oh, yeah, eating up the time. <laughs> Who's this old guy? <laughs> Speed it up a bit? Okay, here, here's Kim Weston. His first photographs were black and white. And he did photographs in Point Lobos, he did Weston things. <laughs> here, you know, they told me to go slow, and now I have to speed it up. So, anyway, being a Weston, starting out, I did Weston stuff, trees, rocks, and I loved it. It was, it was fun, it was it's what I enjoyed. Um, going out with my dad, going out with Michael Brett, going to Point Lobos. <clears throat> and I did that from six years old up into my 20s. And then I had this idea that this wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. You know, there was something missing from the work. And so I started to gravitate into the studio and do nothing but figure work. So everything in the photographs now was my control. I, I made the set, I painted it, and it gave me an opportunity to work 24-7. And photography is limited to the, the light spectrum or whatever. Um, and I wanted to be able to create stuff all day long. And so I spent most of the days building the sets, painting the sets. <clears throat> and in the very beginning, I used nothing but friends. So I, it was more like building a set and placing the, the model in the set. You know, this is Gina, built this big set. Um, Edward Hopper, there again, my influences come from painters. This is uh, directly off one of his paintings. Um, and so that's how I evolved for 30 years in, in the studio. And also when I was photographing, Gina was my model. Um, these calla lilies I planted, and it took me two years to grow them. So it wasn't, I was more concerned about the process of getting there than the actual fina, final print. So the final print was an idea of the process. So it took two years to grow those plants, and when they were ready, I made the photograph. It's another one. And as I said, painters were important to me. Degas, I loved, I loved his vision. I, it's, it's actually a very photographic vision if you, if you know his work. Um, and it's also not nudes, you know, so it was like, okay. Because people have a hard time collecting nudes. Uh, and I always tried to, to, to make the difference that you're not collecting a nude, you're collecting an artist. You're collecting an Edward Weston, you're collecting a Kim Weston or a Zach Weston. Um, after the studio, I came out, Gina stopped modeling. Um, I had to find professional models, and that took a long time. I didn't photograph for two years. I was a little whiny baby. You know, I, didn't, I, I want my model back, you know. And finally, through workshops that we do, and I was meeting different uh, women models and struck up relationships with them <clears throat> and ended up photographing them. I still, they're still like family, you know? They're not just happenstance uh, people that I photograph. And then we do a lot of workshops. Uh, this is with our friend George Holtz in, in New York. And so during the workshops, I have some time to photograph. And all these butterfly wings were up in his, um, his barn. And they were all over the place. And so I thought, wow, this is so cool. So I went and tried to pick them up and, and carry them down because I was going to shoot them. And a little bit of breeze. And they just went flying everywhere. <laughs> it's like, what? And I had to go down to the house, get a bag, because they were so light, and made this photograph. But a lot of times, I work in sets and series and, and themes. 
Um, this is one we did in our workshop in, in Wyoming. Um, so there's, I'm very story driven. Um, so there would be a set of photographs and this is sort of the final one of that set. And um, Andrew Wyeth's Christina story is, is a vision I have in my head whenever I photograph. So, and then we do uh, European workshops. Uh, this is in Germany. Um, this is uh, in the Dali Museum in Spain. And there again, I shoot film, so I'm trapped by light. And this really pissed me off because the, the Dali Museum was dark, super dark. And all my buddies there in the workshop, they, they were all digital, so they could shoot anywhere because the capture of light was much faster. Uh, but I'm stuck to a window. Uh, and that, you know. It's not limiting to me because I can, I can get away with it. This I did two weeks ago. See, I'm not going to have time to do this. Um, as Brett... As Brett did carving, um, I do painting on my photographs uh, because it's, it's a total different thing from, um, from photography. It's all paint driven. Um, so these are just a series. I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. Uh, silver gelatin prints that I've painted. It's a physical action, so like carving is. Um, and what intrigues me the most about it is when do you stop putting paint on? You know, photography is done when you've taken the picture. And the next person, probably the most important one, is, is my son here, Zach. And I'm just going to say one little accolade about him. Um, he didn't start until he was later. Oh, there he is. Um, I think he was like 22, he came to me and he goes, Dad, I want a camera. And I said, great. And, I said, and he had always been around cameras, you know, at our place, at workshops, everything. You know, the, the nude models running around. And I said, yeah, son, I'm going to start you out in film. You can go to digital later, but I want you to have a film base because it, it sets up everything that comes later. And so I showed him, I gave him an RB67, showed him how to load it, and showed him how to use a meter, and sent him off. And he comes back and goes, hey, I got these rolls of film, Dad. And he says, well, okay, I'll show you how to develop them. And, you know, it's a simple process. And the thing is, we look at the first roll that he has, and there's freaking winners on it. I mean, there's like, how do you do that? You're not down for the struggle. I mean, I, I worked my ass off for years trying to get one decent damn print. And there, uh, one decent damn negative, let alone a print. And he's got great stuff. You know. So here he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. um, yeah, I was uh, really thankful as a kid. Uh, I was never forced into photography at all by my parents. I think it was really helpful that I sort of came to it naturally, you know, going to galleries and openings throughout my life. People always questioned if I was, you know, gonna do photography, if I'd taken it up. And I think maybe that sort of pushed me away from it for a while. And uh, when I was 22 in college, I picked it up. I actually wanted a Mother's Day gift for my mom, so I asked my dad to teach me how to how to use the film camera, and ever since then I was hooked. And, you know, I've been around photography my whole life, so even though I picked it up at a later age, I was, you know, surrounded by it my whole life, you know. Parents, all my parents' friends are artists, you know, they would be coming over, showing work, and, you know, just been in that life for that long. So I think once I was able to pick up the camera, I was, you know, a little farther ahead than if I had just picked it up as a child. So, um, yeah, I photograph a lot of various things. Um, these ones are just like my first 
you know, intro into the studio, you know, sort of dealing with the, the human form. You know, I grew up watching my dad photograph in his studio and also being a model for him as a child. So I initially wanted to work in the studio and try to figure out that process for myself. Um, yeah, and just learning how to use the camera in those, you know, first couple years. Um, the last couple years, we have been collaborating on the print of the month, which is something my dad has been doing since 2001, where you can sign up to be a print of the month member and you get a discounted print every month. And it's been really fun the last three years being able to collaborate with him on it. So he does a print one month, I do a print the other month. This photograph is from our current series, which is a Balta series. Uh, we went over it pretty quickly, but um, you know, my dad's painted stuff. He uh, is heavily influenced by painters. Most of his work comes from that influence. So it was fun to be able to, you know, have like a project in mind. You know, I never took photography in high school or college or anything, so I never had any like assignments to sort of take part in. So it's really, you know, a super fun time to have this connection. It's also, you know, my dad is my inspiration. So being able to work with him and we have a very fun, competitive uh, behavior between us. You know, who has the better photograph and, and all that stuff. So it's, 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 just, it's just a really, you know, <laughs> fun experience to be, you know, working with him on that. And um, yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of my figure work, you can, there's influence of, you know, from his work. You know, as a child, I remember getting up early and sitting in front of the heater in the dark room when he would print. So, you know, the chemistry sort of soaked in over the years, I think. Um, but I really love abstracts. Uh, my, you know, my great uncle Brett, um, very influenced by his photography, his abstracts, that really rich black and white texture and, um, you know, really pulling out the interesting things and the everyday objects and making somebody really look at, you know, look at the photograph for a, you know, a long period of time instead of just sort of glancing at it and going on to the next thing and really, you know, thinking about it and like stirring up some emotions. Um, it's pretty funny in the previous, you know, in my dad's section, he had that photograph of uh, a tide pool in the 80s and it's, I didn't, I never saw that photograph until we put this um, presentation together and it's very similar to these ones that we took at Weston Beach um, during COVID, which was a super special time to be able to go to Weston Beach uh, 2020 with just my dad and my mom when everything was shut down for the most part, nobody was there, and it was just really cool to be there and photograph, and um, we have a cool little video on YouTube about it, but um, like my dad mentioned, workshops. This is in Spain, Dolly's house. I've been fortunate enough to be able to accompany them. A lot of amazing locations uh, to photograph. And I think, you know, it's just been really fun to tag along and be able to um, help out with their workshops. And, you know, we have some exciting ones coming up next year. But, you know, I really like finding things close to home. There's so many things in this area that are just amazing. And I like to find those things and highlight them and, you know, really bring out the beauty in everyday objects. But now we'll transition to the Weston Collective. So it's a, the Weston Collective is a nonprofit started by my parents back in 2004. Uh, they saw a need to sort of reignite the love for photography in this area and schools were getting cut with funding, you know, dark rooms were getting slashed, art departments were the first to get cut. So they established a portfolio competition for high school and college students to submit a portfolio of 10 images and the students had a chance to win cash scholarships up to $1,000 as well as have their image hung in a show. And since 2004, we've awarded over $120,000 to local high school and college students. And it used to be just Monterey County, but the last, this last year, we've incorporated Santa Cruz County into it as well. 
We've also incorpor allowed digital photographs into it as well. It used to be just film, but um, you know, realistically, dark rooms are harder and harder to come by. And at the Weston Collective, we're just trying to expand our reach and try to get as many students as we can into the competition. You know, um, we started in 2004 with three entries, I think, and this last year we had 90. And these are, you know, tangible portfolios of 10 images in a portfolio box that we have local judges, local photographers come and pick through them. So it's, it's just really inspiring. I mean, my, like my dad always says, these kids might not actually do anything with photography after this, but they can look back and look at this portfolio and you know, have a sense of accomplish, accomplishment because putting a portfolio of 10 printed mounted images is a task in itself, let alone in a public high school where you have 25 other students working together. Um, we have had the show at the Monterey Museum of Art for the past few years, which has been really, really amazing. Uh, a lot of the kids having their work hung up in a museum in a show is more rewarding than the cash scholarship that they get. You know, and, and some of them it's the first time they've ever been recognized for anything. So it's like a pretty special thing. We have an award ceremony out in the courtyard. We have all the parents and the teachers come and we read off the awards and it's just, you know, it's it's amazing to see the the students' faces light up when they hear their name being called. Um, in 2018, we established a headquarters at Martin Luther King School of the Arts. We're lucky enough to partner with them. We have a studio space that um, has all the processes for photography. It had a side room, a side storage room that my, me and my dad built into a dark room. So we have a fully functioned dark room that can be rented to the community. It's 15 bucks an hour, chemistry included. We also built a developing room and um, we serve the students at Martin Luther King School of the Arts as well as our community members. So it's just like a, for many years, you know, we never had a headquarters to put all of this stuff in. So my parents have been accepting donations of equipment for many, many years and we're still accepting donations. Um, but to be able to have a place to put it and actually, you know, a location is, has been really special. So we, we teach an after school program to fifth and sixth graders at Martin Luther King School of the Arts. And it's been a very rewarding experience to be working with them. We recently put in a digital photography lab as well. So we're working with the kids with digital first, sort of getting them hands on the camera, figuring out exposure, and tr then transitioning to the dark room. So it's, it's really cool though, because as the kids, were like begging to go in the dark room. You know, like I thought maybe they would like digital more because of that instant, you know, feedback. Uh, but they were just biting to get into the dark room. It was just like really cool to see that interest with these kids because I don't like I don't think these kids have photo albums when they were kids, if that makes any sense. Like it's a weird transition, you know, generation transition. So it's it's cool to be able to get them in the dark room and be, you know, using their hands as a with a tactile process. Um, we also offer a community darkroom course two days a week from six to nine. So we have a group of seven photographers that come in and use the darkroom and, you know, keeping film photography alive, which is amazing. And you know, we also offer workshops. We have darkroom workshops, alternative processes. You know, we even have digital printing. It's uh, the whole gamut of stuff. Um, yeah, so back to the after school program. We are working with the kids and local businesses in a project called Facing Seaside. This is our second uh, rendition of the program. We actually have an exhibition this upcoming Thursday at our studio, if anybody is still in town for it. Uh, we had local businesses come up to the studio and the students took portraits of the business owners. And so we'll be featuring those prints as well as some of uh, mine and some of our education intern, Nadia Gutierrez. So if you guys are around, you should come up and check it out. 
Um, yeah, we've support for the collective over the years has been amazing. We do an annual fundraising dinner, New, New Bohemian Nights, where we have guests come to our house, have dinner, you know, and just sort of are in that creative atmosphere at Edwards House. And um, yeah, it's been amazing. You know, we have tons of sponsors. We've we got a lot of recent amazing grants from the Chapman Foundation, the California Arts Council, and yeah, it's been it's been amazing. So it's I'm glad to have taken my parents' dream and built upon it. And yeah, more to come on that. You want to talk about the book? Um, just really quickly, um, this is our new book. I've never had a book before. It's going to be about 350 pages. That's <coughs> Mike. It's here. <laughs> it hasn't gone away. <laughs> Um, and actually, if you want to hear the whole story about the stories I just briefly went on, you're going to have to buy the book. Uh, um, because, yeah, I go into detail about it's four generations of, of photographers. So, um, yeah. Real brief. Um, we also run fine art photography workshops at our home in Carmel Highlands and all over the world. We do group workshops, we do private workshops, we do fine art nudes, we do landscapes, we do platinum workshops. You can be very creative, you know, we do all sorts of cool stuff. I mean, we do two workshops a year, at least at our home, at Edward Wesson's house in the Highlands. And um, yeah, so it's a great place, just full of creativity. And it's amazing to be able to create and to continue that tradition at his at his uh, you know residence, I think he would be, you know, proud that we're doing that. Um, you know, we also do destination workshops all over the world, like we talked about. You know, Spain, Germany, Wyoming, New York, you know, Palm Springs. Um, yeah, we do it all. Let's see, and yeah, next year. 2023, we're excited to announce that we're going to Europe. So we're doing like a two-part workshop. First week, we're gonna be in a, a state in Lisbon outside of Port, in Portugal. And then we're gonna be in a Tuscany in Villa. Uh, a, a villa in Tuscany. Yeah. So yeah, thank you guys thank for you. being here and yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, this concludes the programming for today. Uh, the Westons will be outside at the Weston Collective table uh, answering any questions you may have. We also have three open bars. And welcome to now the cocktail reception part of, of Optic. At 6 o'clock, we will be doing on the Explorer stage a trivia sponsored by SanDisk. And at 6.30, we'll be announcing the winners of the Optic Challenge Day 1 which was pretty easy for the winners because there weren't so many entries today on day one. So tomorrow, I expect you guys to get lots of shots on the whale watching, the sunrise shoot, and also shooting at our macro tables. Let's hear it once again for the Westons. Okay, thanks everyone, have a drink on us. <laughs> Introducing the new Paybu credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your Paybu credit card. So you want to save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The B&H Paybu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over 6 or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new Paybu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either Paybu Savings or Special Financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in-store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved Paybu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new Paybu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today.